The Serpent Without Eyes William Ospina Colombian writer, novelist, and critic born in the Hervio municipality of the Tolima department. The Serpent Without Eyes Our heads asleep, thousands of years ago. The open mouths, next to the rock. Gerardo Rivera They were born to feed the birds of another world. No one traveled that far to find their own grave. Looking for the gold of the alchemists, they found the kingdoms of the sun on their way. From emerald grottoes they saw ritual beetles fly, iguanas stopped in the trees beat their tails like whips, green swamps of silt suddenly opened rows of tusks. They had to find new words to name the sea, the river, and the desert, because another marine whale showed them their whales, another dirty snake from disasters carried them through endless days of rain, and other sandbanks dried them until they were finally gone. More than skeletons with eyes, praying in Latin to stony skies. Looking for their fabled fears, they only knew how to find in the jungle the beasts that they carried in their entrails. They recognized their own harshness in the jaguars, their hunger in the sweet breath of the guyos, their envy in the bewildered rivalry of the birds. And the Babylonian towers of the termites, the armies of green-flagged herds that devour a tree in hours, the bestial goddesses who suckle their young among the roots of the mangrove were like inventions of their fever. They did not know that the most powerful weapons that their god had given them were not obedient horses or strong and bloodthirsty dogs or cannons that spit thunder, but their own sneezes spreading the flu and their sick hugs that woke up sores to naked bodies. Long before their arrival in the villages, the pneumonia they brought had devastated entire provinces and the black pox was turning the bodies of the Indians into living rot. That is why their arrival was viewed with terror before their intentions were known before the evil of the souls confirmed the pestilence of the bodies. They came seeking life from starving villages, humiliated by war and plague, but they laid the eggs of hell in the pagan flowers of paradise. They believed they were looking for the future, but they brought their souls full of witches and goblins, they searched these seas for their fat old mermaids, beneath the ash-colored yarumos, rich hills of satires, they looked for grim goblins and deadly amazons, and in everything they saw the slimy old demon who had sickened their lives in their stone villages, who curled his tail around the steeples, who scratched the walls at night with claws of clay, who rode at midnight in the womb of virgins and infesting with disgusting farts the churches saturated with incense. They thought bad and saw bad and smelled worse, they lost a world to the world and gained a world to their king and their god, but among them very few had been made to work. Behind the arrogant and disgraceful leaders, who lined themselves with gold, came a reckless and brutal troop that lost body and soul in these seas. On the crest of the wave were the viceroys and the governors, the officials and the encomenderos, but underneath it was stirring a wave of discontent and resentment that they would never be the owners of the great treasures, tougher and bolder men even than their chiefs, authorized to do anything by the blindness of the clergy, by the arbitrariness of the officers, and by the negligence of the crown. Those who macerated the natives meat like mud to feed dogs and dreams, those who received the arrows of the Indians and the contempt of the rich alike, the kiss of the jaws of the alligator and the caress of the cold of the dungeons, the harsh music of incessant commands and the trail of worms on ulcerated skin. Without ever understanding these kingdoms, they came to engender in their clay a perplexed humanity that cannot believe in God but needs it that cannot believe in the law but cannot live without invoking it, that cannot love the world in which it was born because its inheritance was desecrated and slandered, because the treasure was saturated with curses. I invoke you, blood that the jungle drank, so that sometime in time we can tame these demons, the arrogant language of the victors, the law proclaimed to mask prey, the strange religion that feels hatred and dread for the land, and that power studded with symbols, the mirror that does not reflect us. Who will tell us if we will one day make this superb language of proconsuls, these ironic scales, this impalpable god from another world and this secret source of strength look a bit like us? One behind closed jungles. Behind the closed jungles there was a kingdom of water. The captain's dog sniffed him first, he barked with delight among the lichen-filled trees, followed his master to the last ridge, and then ran around him down the slope his solid gold necklace gleaming in the sun. It was a strong wing with golden fur, the muzzle was black, it had dark spots around the eyes. 
The blonde Blasta Atienza and Sebastian Moyano and Pizarro the Swineherd were visible behind because they still wore their feathered morions, while the other soldiers in rags and hundreds of naked Indians advanced more slowly, carrying mules with bundles and the long banners of the Emperor and of Santa Maria la Antigua already raised on their antlers. They had fought a battle two days ago for the lands of Cayapes, sleep had not closed their eyes since then, and they were burdened in their steel breastplates from the heat and humidity. After gazing down on the glittering plain, three groups set out to find a way to the water and now they were coming. It was true what the Indian had told them, behind the closed jungles another sea was hidden. Balboa was told in the mountains that an ant can hide, that a poisonous frog can crouch in large leaves, that a stream can hide itself running between the stained stones, but it was unheard of that an entire ocean had remained hidden forever, flood water impounded in a pitcher feeding on lightning and storms. An Indian with the face of a black moon told him that that sea had sprouted from a giant pumpkin, another, which had fallen in jets from the leaves of the sky, and the wounded warriors of Cayapes saw in the stars the eyes of dark crabs. It was like a miracle over the black forests to see the swirling gannets in the luminous sky. Blass would always remember those hours, when the sea was not visible but its scent was already felt in the wind. And the stride descent, and the incredible beach run because he was the second to enter the foamy water. He saw Balboa singing the Te Deum Laud Amos, shouting his proclamation and his prayers, nailing the flag over and over again to the bed of sand and foam, and gazing, still unable to believe it, at the grey sea, the limitless sea, the wild sea that stretched out before them and that no man of their land had ever seen. Then he saw the soldiers who showed the sea as a prayer and incantation the banner with the two angels, the virgin, and the child the rose and the goldfinch. He saw how they cracked the foam with their right hands, raised pyramids of stones on the beach, and struck the trunks of the trees with Latin phrases. He was an avid blonde boy, with large grey eyes and predatory hands, born twenty-three years ago in the Villa de Atienza, and had arrived in the Indies in one of Ojeda's four caravels. In his navigation from the port of Cadiz he did not cease to be surprised for a single day, because he had spent his childhood in dusty villages and the excess water filled his lungs with joyous fear. Living the solitude of the unknown was already an overwhelming experience, but there were also the whines, gloomy lamentations that raged at night, the sleepwalking cry of some sailor in the hollow of the holds, the slow horizon that rises and falls without respite. And the dizziness of the first days, the smell of vomit on the gunwale, the moods of the soldiers sleeping in a heap on the belly of the ship a vague fear that is almost the certainty that we will never return. Bodies also get used to the unforeseen, and Blasta Atienza never wondered if he liked adventure or not, because after the vertigo and the storm, the wisps raining on the creaking masts, the phosphorescence of the spears in the night of big stars, the red bow of the fish that splinter the water and the nightmarish hair of the sargasso that make you think that the ship is sailing on vegetal plains. Arriving at the port had been like entering a tavern full of fighting and screaming, and the news of an unknown sea filled the entire space of his mind. With the news of the sea barely discovered, the crown was encouraged to finally charter an expedition of conquest, bishops in Spain preached that a world full of riches was waiting in the Indies and that the royal treasury would pay the expenses of the trip, and noblemen and peasants came from all over the peninsula, as well as artisans of various trades. After hastily selling lands and estates, inheritances, rents, 2,200 men embarked on 50 ships laden also with surly horses and gentle cows, with offensive dogs to the ear and pigs bred for the knife, with shrill geese and sleepwalking chickens. Many young men of warrior stock came, such as the noisy Miguel Diaz de Auxiliary, the memorable Bernal Diaz del Castillo, the last alive of those who saw the Emperor Moctezuma and the page of the court Gonzalo Fernandez de Oviedo, who saw everything and he named everything, adventurers who would grow old later in the New World. And they all sailed under the command of a huge man, Pedro Arias de Avila, a head taller than the tallest of his men, who knew that it would be very difficult to find a coffin of his size on the roads and always travelled with his own coffin. Of luxury, in which every night he slept to get used to death. This Pedrarius knew well his mission in the Indies, to charge Balboa with interest for all the good and bad things that were said about him at court, 
those rumors that week after week altered the spirit of the Catholic King Ferdinand of Aragon. Twenty years had not passed since Columbus's adventure, and the ships that defied vertigo had barely touched the shores of Tierra Firme, but scandalous stories of wars were already being told among the Spaniards themselves, of looting on the islands, stories of abandoned men. In impious gulfs, of jungle lianas that had become Christian gallows, and of the destitute ship of Nacusa abandoned by his own subordinates to the inclemency of the water. But it was one thing to bring stories to Spain and another thing to experience the confusing episodes of the conquest. Sometimes the subordinates, like Balboa, were more responsible than the bosses, nameless pawns were revealed more skillful and courageous than the princes, mere stowaways became the true discoverers, they showed to be just and faultless captains where the bosses were only capable of greed and hatred. And Pedrarius gained a reputation for being cruel and infamous with merits, because in a single afternoon he had the heads of Balboa and three of his men cut off. When, seeing that night was coming, the crowd asked him to forgive the fifth condemned man, he himself took the axe and made night fall on Fernando Arguello. A legend says that five burning heads illuminate him in hell. Spain was a horseman ruling an unknown creature without knowing if it was a colt or a bird a golden fish emerging from the sea or an octopus with countless tentacles. It would have been necessary to have angels on the ships to know from a distance everything that the adventurers did, that of the crown was not divine justice and it was easy for the powers, attending to rumors, to reward treachery and punish loyalty. Others would doubt it later, but Blas never forgot that he had been the second to enter the South Sea. She told her daughter, and it was she who told me in the joyous days of the jungle, before the bloody morning. He told me that after Balboa was arrested by the perfidy of his friend Pizarro and condemned by the greed of his friend Espinosa and beheaded by the axe of his father-in-law Pedrarius, after those mediocre and brutal men joined forces to drive him out of the way. Blasta Atenza continued to be convinced that his destiny awaited him in that new sea, and he lived a long time on the isthmus, preparing his time. Balboa had conquered with arms or convinced with arguments Indians of twenty kingdoms. He had stubborn and negotiated with small and great kings of the jungle, Kerta, Panca, Chape, Bonaniema, Cucura, Tecra, Pocorosa, Comagra, Chuirica, Otoque, Pacra, Puchirabuca, Tubanama, Tamau, Tenoca, and Tamaca and Juanaga and Carica and Corita, among the most mentioned, chieftains with gold diadems and wicker diadems chiefs who had sprouted from the sea or who had been born from speckled eggs within dark nests, princes and magicians whose lives were told in vibrantly colored fabrics. Powers of the Chipcha language that they commanded legions of potters and hunters, in jungles of beetles and nameless colored dragonflies, in lands haunted by enormous lizards. Those learned Indians who had reached firm agreements with Balboa later did not bear the brutalities of Pedrarius, the eminent executioner, they fought their newly disembarked army as they had never fought the scarce troops of Santa Maria la Antigua del Darien, and they persisted in their effort to kill that huge dead man with darts or prayers. Blas never knew if it was true that Balboa's dog died of hunger in Acla on his master's grave, with the gold necklace still around his neck because none of those traitors had dared to take it off him. They had turned the tawny dog wild and made him devour many Indians but he was so fierce and efficient that Balboa paid him a monthly salary like one more of his troops, and one day he insolently put that gold collar on him that without he certainly only lost after death. Because just as this conquest changed the destiny and condition of many soldiers, he saw dogs better treated than the Indians and more illustrious than other dogs, than other men. The salty voice say with your black moon face that the sea sprouted from a giant pumpkin. Say with your lips of jagua of seeds at night, that this grey sea was impounded in the leaves, that this sea fell in jets from the large leaves of the sky. Say with wound lips that those lights above are the eyes of the black crabs. Like the grey mother who never keeps quiet, she says again that only what is said is valid forever, what can be heard over and over and over again, without fatigue, like that salty voice of the returning wave. 2. They left the city on the Darien beach of dead logs and populated Panama. They left the city on the beach of dead logs of the Darien and populated Panama, on coastlines as radiant as those of the Gulf of San Miguel, but more muddy and calm. Blast dedicated several years there to business and small navigations, 
and to console himself for the hardships of the present by remembering the triumphs of the future. Because a man would not bear the inclemency of the Indies if it were not for the future he imagines, for the stubborn certainty that somewhere a treasure awaits him that will be his alone, that has been destined for him by the gods of fortune. Since the beginning of the world. Sometimes he thought of his peaceful village, of his Roman ancestors who invented codes and aqueducts, oratory and bureaucracy. He saw himself repeating the exploits of those tribunes and lectors in a different world, but time passed and the adventure seemed to have stalled in the closed jungles and on the seashore that on the first day seemed bright with promise. Finally Blas became, not a friend, because he was a man of solitary temperament, but an ally of Pizarro and Almagro. He lived through the noisy preparations for the trip to the country of the Incas, the growing news of that kingdom in the south that Balboa had already foreseen, the alliances of the chiefs, the trips to explore unknown coastlines, the loans of ducats and ships, the first attempts and the first monstrous islands, but he was also fortunate to be on deck off the coast of Peru on the big day when they sighted the fortress of Tums in the mist, sure evidence of the foreseen kingdom of the mountains. Blas was already thirty years old and was of the lineage of the discoverers. He was looking for gold, yes, but he was able to see the firmness of the constructions, the plumes of feathers, the rich fabrics, the low flight of the condors, the smoothness of the stones in the Inca temples, the large and oblique eyes of the girls of the royal family. And apparently he was better made for love than for war, because the day they entered the king's refuge in the mountains with Hernando de Soto, while the other soldiers ran with suspicious eyes through the long lines of archers and Inca spearmen he stared from his horse at the ring of women that wrapped like a flower the strange king who was forbidden to look. And among all of them they say that he saw only one. I do not know how they were found, but I am happy to know that in the midst of so many scenes of blood and horror that abounded in those days, there was also, more hidden from the eyes of the world, a painting that was not of rape or infamy but the secret conquest of that girl by this soldier who loved her just by seeing her, and who understood in their embrace that her long delay on the isthmus had not been a wait for lands and crimes but for the love that the stars had kept for her. People of the viceregal household affirmed that Inessa's mother had been a Chimu princess, from the solemn clay citadel of Shanchen, who gazes with thirsty eyes at the sea, and that Blas had found her when he was traveling the parched coastlines during the days in that Atahualpa was a prisoner and long lines of his subjects, each ant with a gold stone, went up to the mountains of Cajamarca to bring the rescue. But Ines herself assured me that her mother was actually one of the Inca's sisters, who took refuge in the citadel after the massacre. The truth is that months later, the very night that Atahualpa was killed, when they strangled him by tightening a steel band tied to a trunk around his neck, the daughter of Blasta Atenza's love affairs with the imperial sister was born nearby. And unlike Pizarro, who only thought about power and politics, and like Almagro, who knew how to bring the son of his love to his side, Blas loved that girl, in whom the waters of two rivers met. So different, as he would have loved a daughter born there in his old dusty village in Spain. Ines was powerful since she was little, and she was reflected in the eyes of that man who had discovered a sea in order to beget her. That is why they said in Shanchen that the night Atahualpa died a new race was born, and on those mountains stained with blood and hatred, where cities were desecrated and quipus were undone and stories were erased, love also rekindled bonfires, even more valuable because the sun had died. Pizarro's wars against the Inca generals gave great wealth to the first captains. Men who came from hunger and bad weather, from stony villages and miserable cradles, suddenly found themselves masters of entire provinces, abundant in wealth and servants. The Marquis Pizarro benefited Blas, like my father, with mines and encomiendas, but he was distrustful and spiteful, and he never forgot that Blas de Atenza was one of the eleven Spaniards who opposed the execution of Atahualpa. Blas accompanied him in the delivery of parcels in San Miguel de Pura. There, in the shadow of the cross and watered with blood, the provinces of Catechaos and Cairo with their thousands of Indians corresponded to Gonzalo Farfan de los Godos, that of Pochos to Andres Duran and Juan de Cotto, that of Jayanxa, with its stone tombs, to Francisco Lobo, that of Tangarera, traversed by flames, to Francisco Lucina, that of the Copais Valley, 
with its calm green waters, to Francisco Quiroz and Quintanilla, those of Motub and Huang Cabamba, with colorful towns and vertiginous corn terraces, to Diego Palomino, the Penis de Mescala to Diego de Fonseca, the abysses of Paber to Juan Trujillo, the dark forests of Ayabaca to Bartolome Aguilar, the capes from Punta Aguja to Miguel Ruiz, the lame man, the Sierra de Amotape with its rainbow superimposed on Juan Barrientos, the lands that surround the fortress of Cocola to Pedro Gutierrez de los Rios, and the black groves of Colonec to Baltasar Carvajal. Blas was named first mayor of Pura among them, but he continued on his way along the coast and was the founder of Trujillo, near Juan Chaco, next to the sea that he himself had discovered. With Martin de Estet, also arrived with Pedro Rios and the first conqueror who brought his wife to the trip, with Gomez de Alvarado, who still had Tenochtitlan's flower boats and dark steppe temples of human blood fixed on his pupil, with Vicente de Bajar and Juan de Osimo, high trustee of the Tukum Valley, who later bequeathed lands and legions of Indians to his son Melcher, with Francisco Luis de Alcantara, Francisco Pizarro's mother's brother, with Anton de Peromato, Miguel de la Cima and Miguel Perez de Villafranca, with Andres Vero and Diego Verdejo and Anton Cuadrado and Melcher Verdugo, he tried to give the newly founded city the style or at least the flavor of his Castilian village, solid walls, large temples, exquisite balconies, flower-filled railings, and was concerned about the repetitions of his destiny, because luck would have him touch a region similar to that of his hometown, where the most scarce was water. You had to find the water in the mountains and make it descend to the coast. For this, he recalled once again the engineering of his Roman ancestors and the delight felt by the Moors of their land tracing channels in the courtyards of the palaces, and built the first aqueduct of Trujillo, which made water lotuses bloom in the vicinity of the desert. But he also learned from the Chimus, who hundreds of years ago dug large rectangular ponds under the cover of their mud walls covered with fish, ponds where deep waters flow and where viringos, the dark sacred dogs, quench their fever at noon. This is how Blasta Atenza made the water of Trujillo flow, and while he awakened the gods of water he saw his mestizo daughter grow up, each day more beautiful, with large oblique Indian eyes, with black hair full of stars, with white princess teeth. From the mountains, with the pearl-gray pupils of a Castilian woman, with the red lips of a gypsy, with the cinnamon skin that no one would have rejected as Andalusian, but with the large arched cheekbones of the daughters of the sun. What happened to Atahualpa's sister has always been an enigma for me. They all said that the mother of Agnes, the princess, died with her empire, but no one could tell me, in the dispersion that followed the great looting, if it was one of the diseases that arrived with the invaders, or the mourning for the death of the sun, or some bad influence from the indignant moon which led the Koya to meet the mothers in the lunar valleys. The truth is that the beautiful Indian left this daughter of her youth in the hands of Blas, and the old Incomindero became so infatuated with the girl that he put her to live like a queen on his coastal estates, as if trying to correct in her the atrocities that the Spanish did to the Incas. For Ines the Indian nurses worked, for Ines the weavers wove, for Ines the flames brought the pitchers with cow's milk and the bundles of corn and wheat, and before Ines the ranks of Indians subject to the parcels bowed. They saw in her the power of the new masters who now subdued the mountain range but also the dignity and image of the powers that had collapsed with the thunder of Cajamarca. And Blas knew how to exploit that double condition of his daughter, no one like her seemed engendered to reign over the coastlines. Such was the overwhelming evidence of that fate that, when the girl was thirteen years old, old Blas fell ill, apparently as a result of a trip through the moors, he searched in vain for air, his lungs filled with water, and of nothing the riches did not serve neither the blisters and bleeding of the surgeons of the city of the kings of Lima, nor the whistle with bells of the old Indians, nor the ceremonial cry of the servants, because the considerable Blasta Atenza left his daughter an orphan, just entering adolescence, and become the richest young woman in the region and the most powerful. A few years were enough to make her the most beautiful and the one most coveted by the Spanish lords who divided up the kingdom, and there was no one who did not want for their children or for themselves the beauty of Ines de Atenza, adorned with the rich inheritance that the girl had received from her father. 
Song of Atahualpa's sister the sun came to greet the Iron Men but Thunder was already crouching. He came as always, bright, full of gifts, to spread the light among the children, but the blue poison was already at the bottom of the plate. Where have you gone, my father's son, what darkness surrounds you, what giant serpent whose tail lashes us all with darkness? I who drank the milk of the dark breasts with you, and then poured milk from my nipples on your lips, and I hugged you next to the steam of the pond that exhales a perfume of flowers, I saw the trembling of strangeness in your eyelids, when they told you that shining beasts climbed the mountain range, and to calm you I caressed your ankles where the gold ribbons are knotted. Look at me now locked in darkness even though there seems to be light in things, look at me already lost because I don't have your hands on my shoulders, look at me already kissing one of your executioners with love. When the dream tells me where your bones are scattered, my father, my brother, my son, the high sun of my days, fire in my nights, I will leave everything, I will leave my warrior's bed, and I will come down to you, to see our kingdom again as it was in the golden time, when the slow vacuna, above the clouds, chewed the night, when the large kipus of the old women made stories of our childhood sprout, when the sky so sweet and so sweet of stars had not fallen into the well. 3. The house was a palace with large stone walls. The house was a palace with great stone walls, with white arches and wide staircases. And it had been filled with things brought from Spain, because Blas attended with the same diligence the family duties as the call of war, that discord between Spanish captains that had replaced the discord between Huascar and Atahualpa, the children of Huayna Capac, junior of Tupac Inca Yupanqui and ninth grandson of the great Pashacutec. Inessa's childhood had as a backdrop the wars of her blood, the indignant advances of the Almagristas, the sinuous ambushes of the Pizaristas, the regrouping of the Incas from the mountains under the condor wings of Manco Inca Yupanqui, the siege of the Cuzico by a crowd of Incas, armed with songs and prayers but also arrows with spurs of fire, the remote roar of the incursions of Valdivia towards the south, the howl of pain of the Indian peoples under the gallop of Bilal Khazar towards the canyons of the river. North. News of joy and news of anguish passed incessantly under the arches of the great house of Trujillo, the murder of Almagro, the uprising of his son the Mestizo, the death of Pizarro, who had twelve faithful men at his side and his entire life. At the last moment by rare symmetry he was knocked down by twelve enemies. After the fleeting power of Vaca de Castro came the brief summer of the men of Avila under the command of Viceroy Blasco Núñez de Vila who at the end of April 1544 advanced from Tums and Pura, taking possession of the kingdom with a luxurious procession, and he stayed under the great arches of the Atienza house, pleased with the beautiful eleven-year-old girl, and dressed as a queen, who was his hostess. I am moved that Lorenzo de Cepeda y Ahumada, the youngest of that cortege, who had met my friend Pedro de Urshua, a sixteen-year-old boy, in Valladolid, months ago, who had seen with him the blurred stone bulls of the Sierra de Gritas and rode with him to Seville, and that he would see him again shortly after in the city of the kings of Lima, he also met that girl in his mansion in Trujillo, without even anticipating that these two creatures, who through theirs imperceptibly united destiny, they would end up fused in a single fever of adventure and death. The viceroy came to enforce the new laws of the Indies, and nothing could please him more than to be cared for by a little mestizo princess in whom the Christian blood of Iberia was forever allied with the pagan blood of the children of the sun. But two years later, under the same white arches through which the viceroy came out, the news of his death entered, and since between the ages of eleven and thirteen there is an abyss in memory, what the girl knew was that the rebel Gonzalo Pizarro had the bearded head of that old man who had smiled at her in her distant childhood had been horribly torn from her shoulders. It was that same year that Blas, the Encomendero, died, and Ines did not have to make any effort to start commanding, because that is what the dead man had raised her for. Like her distant cousin, little Francisca, daughter of the Marquis Francisco Pizarro himself and Nusta Quisp Sisa, and like the less fortunate children of Cuxirime Aclo, Ines also had harpsichord and European dance teachers in her early years. But while Spanish soldiers served in that mansion, Osorna, the stout one, Cuadrado, the masonry master, Verdejo, El Herrero, Y Verdugo, 
El Comerciante, Hombres Fields al Viejo Señor que Servieron con Fidelidad Tambien a su Hija, S.E. Desia que en Ciertas Cuartos Habia Mujeres Indias Tijendo Grandes Mantas para Ines, Viejas que Eran Sus Consejeras, que la Aureliban en las Nachas, que la Penaban con Pains de Plata, que se sumption a sus caprichos and there were even those who affirmed that old. Pagan ceremonies were celebrated in those rooms under the protection of gold and shadows. But it is that envy also began to surround the Atenza house, large, with high barred balconies and stone patios, which the great lords of the kingdom entered in the days of Blas, and in the early days of his daughter only friends childhood and old companions of his father. She grew up without rain and also fortune set her free, so that the women of the other encomenderos did not usually frequent her. In her father's lifetime they despised her as a little foundling who had been collected for charity, when she was orphaned they did not pity her, but dreamed that she would disappear among the dark mass of the defeated, but when they realized that she had legally inherited lands and encomiendas, large houses and mines, Indians and furniture and China, they watched her for her strangeness, they envied her for her beauty, they feared her for her power and for her life on the border between the distant Spanish world and the mountains of the mountain range, so that in the center of Trujillo that disturbing flower of thistles grew among the newly brought roses, fiery and dangerous, that few saw but that everyone thought about and that for many was a living temptation. Ines did not seem to notice the haze of rumors that grew with her. He had some romances that were not clandestine or famous but no man could be proud of having reached the rosebush of that secret girl. And when the young woman turned eighteen, the city of Trujillo awoke to the surprise that Ines de Atenza had engaged in marriage to a rich and young encomendero, one of the newcomers to the Indies, Pedro de Arcos. The entire new Trujillo society attended the wedding and then the party at Ines's own home. There the women of the encomenderos, including Estet's steep wife, Florencia Eulalia Josefina de Mora and Escobar Alvarado, followed by her seven maids, took the opportunity to snoop and see how much truth there could be in the rumors of the messy and dark world of the daughter of Atenza. But everything in that house was in plain sight and everything was especially rich and bright, furniture and vases, large wooden and leather trunks, abundant pantries, curtains, closets full of suits, and the spacious kitchens and beyond the rooms of the children servants, and horse stables and sheep pens. Nothing seemed to confirm an excessive belonging of Agnes to the world of the Indians, and many ladies even felt that Agnes' house was better endowed, and was cleaner and finer than theirs. There were, for example, a good number of basins, ewers, and silver jugs, and an ingenious water supply system that had been Blass's invention at the time when he built the city's aqueduct. The most Indian thing that was in Ines was her passion for baths with scented herbs, the loving care with which her companions bathed her for a long time in chambers with steaming waters, and dried and perfumed her next to the stone patio under the blinding Sunday of the coastlines, and the care with which they dressed her, which made Ines seem less like the daughter of an encomendero than a princess of the court of King Felipe or Atahualpa himself. It is already known that nowhere in the empire did women learn to dress more luxuriously than in Peru, and the beautiful Ines not only surpassed the proud women of Trujillo in splendor, but came to rival the most ornate of Lima, the iridescent peacocks of the viceregal court. The wedding served for Ines to become an accepted part of Trujillo society, and the party almost served to dispel many rumors. But since most of them were not born of evidence but of passions, misgivings, and persistent envies, they soon surfaced again. Pedro de Arcos passionately loved his mestiza, and displayed it with pride, so that everything began to be attributed to some kind of Indian spell, to a drink or spell of those to which the Indians are fond, and as Ines became visible she was also looking excessively showy to the people of the town. How much Dona Florencia Eulalia Josefina and her maids would have wanted to question the priest who was hearing her confession in detail, but Ines did not leave them much room for rumors. If she left the house it was only to go to church, accompanied by her maids, and she lived in her mansion most of the time. When Pedro de Arcos came to answer for his affairs in Lima, Ines did not even go to the door. One would say that she was the most faithful wife, the most beautiful woman and the most discreet young woman in the city, 
and as much as the shutters were opened and the subject was formulated and the eyes peered greedily, no one could find any serious reason to talk about it. She. Then the matter that of the viceroy's nephew occurred. The game two fingers that touch at the end are the sacred peak of the Coraquenk, and the three extended ones are its plume. Three fingers together are the head of the alpaca, and the two outstretched are its ears. Now the two hands facing each other, two Coraquenks facing each other. If I bring them to your face, my hands are your mask. The girl has the face of two birds, the girl has Coraquenk feathers. And if I lower two fingers, two alpacas look at each other over their eyes. 4. When in 1557, the court of Don Andres Hurtado de Mendoza. When in 1557, the court of Don Andres Hurtado de Mendoza y Bovadilla, Marquis of Canet, touched Peruvian land, the notables who were waiting for him at the port saw a drunken, young, and haughty man get off the galleon. They all ran to offer their salute and reverence, and the hand kisser had been going for a long time, when the true Marquis, a heavy and venerable knight, appeared on the bridge of the ship. The young man who usurped the honours was his nephew Francisco de Mendoza, entrusted to the viceroy by a widowed sister. It is not that I intend to occupy a place by force in this story, but it is necessary to say that I was then secretary and clerk of the viceroy. The problem was that, as soon as the galleon that brought us from Spain had descended into the marshes of Castillo de Oro, ready to attend its possession in the city of the kings of Lima, an unexpected haul held me back on the isthmus, when the viceregal court he was already embarking on the waters of the South Sea. To add insult to injury, the surgeon ordered me to remain immobile for several weeks before starting my work, and this delayed me in the name of God, but thanks to that delay I was able to befriend the new chief of the royal troop, who had the task of pacifying the rebellious Maroons, entrenched in palenques in the torrid jungles of the coast. I was beginning to get acquainted again with the crazy rhythm of the Indies. Although I had been born in Hispaniola thirty-five years ago, and although I was part of the expedition that, embarked on a brig in 1542, discovered the immense river of the Amazon, I derived more than ten years later, entangled in the wars of the Emperor, for the wheels of Flanders and the fence of cutlasses in the Mediterranean. Later, more relaxed, I had been a clerk in Valladolid for years, trying to forget my past, oblivious to the affairs on this side of the world that change with diabolical haste. But fate is a skillful elf at upsetting all things. Suddenly returned to these lands, thanks to the fact that the new viceroy highly valued my experience and believed me useful in helping him to familiarize himself with his new dominions, I began my mission in the Indies, lacking his possession. And in my place was the ostentatious nephew, Francisco de Mendoza, added to the procession at the last moment in the port of Cadiz, and who was to become the main disappointment of the viceregal family. He was noted from the beginning for his inclination to get drunk and star in loud scandals, for his abuses of the Indians, and for his tendency to rival everyone, making himself pay excessive honours as a member of the viceroy's court. He had already come from Spain, reprimanded for besieging women with an owner, and a jealous dagger had marked his chest in a duel of honour. The Marquis quickly gave him a position in the Trujillo administration, but there was no shortage of people who said that the Viceroy knew the nephew very well and tried to keep him as far away as possible. It was inevitable that, as soon as he arrived, the boy would put his greedy eyes on the most beautiful woman in Trujillo, whom he saw one day crossing to the church with her maids, and leaving like an apparition from the sedan chair to enter in the gloom of the temple. And, of course, that twenty-five-year-old woman of strange beauty, both wild and luxurious, powerful and discreet, was none other than Ines, the orphan of Atienza, the mestizo princess of Pedro de Arcos. Francisco de Mendoza began to woo her in an insistent and impudent way, he shouted clumsiness as he passed in the middle of the day, he sent her suggestive letters with the servants, he sang in a bad voice on his balcony at night without even wondering if the husband would be in the house. Some people who were waiting for the opportunity to speak of Agnes and accuse her of something, found their opportunity. No one has been able to prove that she corresponded to the official's requirements, but even she, who was haughty and bossy, had to keep her composure and assume the courtesy that corresponds to the claims of a viceroy's nephew, 
and Pedro de Arcos himself knowing only what rumors were spreading, at first he let things pass, hoping that his nephew's capricious fever would pass without any more noise. But the facts became notorious, because Mendoza was easily intoxicated, so Pedro de Arcos warned him one day in private not to annoy them, a second time he rebuked him in the middle of the street, and when the provocation was presented again, he challenged Francisco de Mendoza to a duel of honor. Solemn sponsors came and went, Ines de Atienza shut herself up in dismay, the old encomenderos were tense, the neighbors spread new rumors, and the duel was fulfilled, with such bad luck that Pedro de Arcos was badly wounded by Mendoza and that same night he changed the covetable bed of Agnes for a cold grave in the mountains. If the duel was with the sword or musket I never managed to find out, because by the days when I came to have confidence with her I did not dare to mention that murky and painful story to her. The Viceroy was not unaware that his relative had developed a reputation for quarreling in the barracks and taverns, but he never expected that the first act of the Viceregal family in the Indies would be a crime. Everywhere it was reported that the Viceroy's nephew had killed a man for a matter of skirts, and that the dead man was the encomendero Pedro de Arcos, wealthy in mines and haciendas. Rumors flew saying that the reason for the duel was his mestizo woman, an envied orphan of one of the discoverers of the South Sea and a mysterious granddaughter of the Inca kings, and they returned telling that the girl had the secret of the women who formed the ring of Atahualpa, who was lighter skinned than her royal grandmothers, who ruled a luxurious mansion, who spoke Spanish with a naive song that made her look younger than she was, and that, in short, her life was haughty and proud. Mystery of the Mountains Where He Was Born The nephew was immediately brought before the viceroy, who proposed sent to Spain without scandal, but a group of indignant encomenderos had already gathered, determined not to allow the new authority of the kingdom to come to undermine the rights recently confirmed by the orders of La Gosca. The latter, trying to impose a minimum order in a turbulent region, had among so many things prohibited honor duels. The men of the Indies, who since the time of Gonzalo Pizarro had been convinced that they had to be respected by the crown, demanded justice, and the viceroy understood that he had to please them. This is how the beautiful Ines de Atienza, who had lost her father twelve years ago and had been married just seven years ago, was left alone again, now a widow, with her heart twice in mourning and, why not decide, with her property also duplicated by this new inheritance. The weavers of blankets the forest woven of greens comes, and the flock woven of feathers passes, and the sun woven of blessings rises, and the river woven of fish and songs goes down, because nothing is alone. The warm bodies woven of blood come, the gentle night woven of caresses comes, and the mornings woven of dreams open, and the song woven of praise rises, because no one is alone. 5. The first thing the Viceroy did when passing through the Panamanian jungle. The first thing the Viceroy did when passing through the Panamanian jungle was to load a galleon with 1,250 gold ingots and 48,357 silver bars, accumulated in the Indies during three conflicting administrations since the departure of Pedro La Gasca, and send it with blessings on the bitter waves as a contribution to the wars of Felipe II. La Gosca had left the Viceroyalty asleep and healed after confused discords, but it takes longer for the water to calm down than to receive the disturbing blow of new wines and more stagnant moons. The country always incubate rebellions, and those who have been dreaming of enjoying the delights of Jaja learns that in these Indies each night brings its wakefulness. The heads of Gonzalo Pizarro and Francisco de Carvajal, parched in a plaza in Lima, were already showing the passerby the fate of the insurgents, and yet in the following years there were at least ten rebellions. Francisco Hernández Girón led the largest of them, and his head ended up keeping company with the skulls of the old rebels. The Marquis of Canet was lucky to find at once who would pacify the isthmus disturbed by the Maroons, but already almost certain of the malignant success of that enterprise, he embarked before us, eager to assume power over an unstable domain that he had had in twenty years more than ten rulers, the inventor of the kingdom and assassin of the Inca, Francisco Pizarro, the one-eyed and offended Diego de Almagro, to whom the crown never granted clear rights over his conquest, the absent-minded. An ephemeral Vaca de Castro, the old man from Avila, the white-bearded viceroy Blasco Núñez de Vila, 
fragile and solemn among his troop of wild boys, the viceroy killer Gonzalo Pizarro, proud and resentful, who lost his kingdom, and his head, at the hands of that inscrutable clergyman with hair and legs and iron will, Pedro La Gosca, and from there the confused viceroys Andres de Chianxa, Antonio de Mendoza, short and ailing, and the Indian enslaver and governor of Chile Melchor Bravo de Saravia. The Marquis now brought the mandate to increase the subjection of the Incas, consolidate the power of the crown, weld with new iron the loyalty of the encomenderos, redouble some tributes, multiply the production of the mines, plant new cities, quell uprisings, give I worked on the spears and pikes of the newcomers, and put a stop to the swarm thrown by the ships almost uncontrollably. Let the weight of the empire be felt from the canyons of the north, in the kingdom of Pasta, where villages sleep under the snore of volcanoes, and over the lands of Quito, where the breath of the sea dries the slopes to the west and the breath from the river the east drenches the jungles, and throughout the mountain range where the abysses are staggered into cultivation terraces, where there are rows of hurried feet that measure the kingdom carrying orders and news, and where there are sacred dogs that emerge from the depths. The wind that published the Inca's orders now carried a flight of bells, the abysses were already obedient to the whip, the unruly feet belonged to the stocks and human hearts belonged to law or fire. The yoke of the true god had to be felt from the snows of Cotopaxi to the last foams of Araco. In the cabinets of Spain the Indies are made of paper and fable, but it is another thing to weigh the crown of diamonds and the crown of thorns on ten thousand parched mountains and long coastlines widened by seabirds. The Marquis learned how arduous it is to govern a mountain range whose sight alone is fatigued, red lands that seem dead even when we notice grey lands beyond that seem even more dead, if it were not because others, calcined to white, have copper in their entrails, striae of precious crystals, sinuous galleries of silver. It was beginning to impose itself on these mountains, accustomed only to the word that flows from the lips, the Spain of stamps and titles, of meticulous memorials and account books, codes, reports, minutes and records, variegated maps, volumes and piles and precise chronicles, the strenuous realm of writing and claws, and now everything is subsections and paragraphs, glosses and scolia, paragraphs and edicts, decrees and sentences, the traces of the extreme Roman formalism, aggravated, I know. Why I say it, of petty cositeria and mean poison, to impose the watermarks of the letter on tattooed stones of other laws, the opinion of judges and clergy on the cornfield solar and the mouth of stars. In order to escape a little from that withered air that the archives exude, the viceroy wanted to have the illusion of a true brush with mud and stones, and he believed he saw in me that possible contact. I had to ensure that his experience in the Indies was not limited to that sea of papers, filling with real substance, faces and details, the lyrics of the chronicles. But what makes so many notaries and judges shut themselves up in their paper Indies is that, as soon as they arrive, the words begin to change their meaning. The flames are no longer tongues of fire but beasts bordering the abyss between the pushing wind, the tigers are not the striped Bengal cats but the jaguars studded with signs, cities are not Romans of palaces and cathedrals next to rivers that sing in Latin, but masses of rock carved into the backs of precipices, plates of flint in the mist where we lack air. The Marquis had just put his feet on the ground of the dead Incas and was beginning to take office when he received the news of his nephew's duel in Trujillo and the death of his offended rival, and he understood that the encomenderos were going to react. With fury before the crown for the arbitrariness of the new viceregal family. The eve of glory was going to change into days of fury. Of course he was glad that the dead man had not been the nephew, not because of him, but because of the eternal anguished Lavinia Hurtado de Mendoza who breathed in the illusion that her son would prosper in the Indies in the shadow of the Viceroy. Then he was enraged at the nephew, and he punched the desk shooing profanity. He couldn't miss the damn Wednesday of the week. What need did he have to bring in that conceited man who was pretending to be Viceroy from the ship's bridge, with his eternal glassy gaze of an alcoholic? The Angola do Sinorito. Behind every whore he was already in Seville and he had already been stabbed as a whore in some tavern. That one did not know about honor or respect, for him the world was a raft of oil. And he cursed the hour when he listened to his sister, 
and he cursed the children and grandchildren of the devil, that ridiculous peacock reduced to an idiot and a criminal. Who knows who would be the scum for which the viceregal family was now sinking into shame? And what would they say in court? That the viceroy, whose first duty was to set an example of restraint and decency in these latter lands, where everything was insurrection and crime, where everything was barbarism, had brought a parasite more poisonous than river snakes, more pierced than arrows, more boastful than drunken monkeys. Let it rot in the stocks, let the jungle eat it, let the river alligators devour it, let it be left alone. He was not going to tolerate in any way that the name of the Hurtado de Mendoza and the blessed blood of the grandparents were put in the public pillory, that an idiot entangled the government that was just beginning. But he said all that to vent. He knew that his first duty was to protect his nephew from lynching, and to open a process with the appearance of legality that would save him from a gallows in the Indies. He had him arrested and taken to Lima, there he gave him with harsh language his palace as a prison, and soon he managed to ship him to Seville, where he was absolved with all severity. He immediately took pains to appease the wrath of the encomenderos by studying their requests, giving them new advantages over the Indians, making them feel his paternal proximity. That they no consented part of the court, to be sure that no further abuses against them would be allowed. And above all he was concerned to know who was the mestizo woman whose nephew had left a widow in that irresponsible set, to procure the bombs that could be applied from the cabinets of power. Thus the fame of the late Blasta Atenza, discoverer and founder, a man faithful to the crown and to the deposed and assassinated Blasco Núñez de Vila, reached his ears, his prestige as a mining engineer and constructor of aqueducts, and his adoration for that daughter of mixed blood, adoration that other veterans shared. And so he also received the rumors of envy, a whole cloud of advice and slander, about that Indian woman who bewitched men, that rich mestizo who entangled them in her threads, that libertine who drove them crazy in her bed. The good Marquis spent his sleepless nights weighing the reports of one side and the other to know what attitude to assume in the face of that unknown and disturbing woman, who was the first victim of the viceregal house. Contrary to what the envious languages believed, he understood that the widow had to be made amends, because not apologizing to her would attract ill will among the old encomenderos and resentment among the Indians, who perhaps saw her as a kind of sign of the alliance, the image of his own lost greatness. The golden orphan had just become a hacienda-adorned black widow, the burial of her husband, surrounded by the consternation of the city, in which the Marquis did not dare to make himself present, exalted her into a kind of suffering queen and Andres Hurtado de Mendoza y Bovadilla, second Marquis of Canet, friend who was Emperor Carlos V and quiet adviser to his son Felipe, scion of a house older than the two crowns, a student of laws and chronicles, and a descendant of saints. Prelates, he found himself suddenly in his early days in the Indies wondering how to present an apology to a beautiful, mourning girl who was also a descendant of ancient Spanish lineages but above all heir to the thick mystery of the Indian lords of the mountain. The girl weaves the green threads are corn in the furrows. The yellow threads are the golden stones. The red threads are the fish of the sky. The white threads are the beautiful waterfalls. Interlock your fingers, blow into the warm nest of your hands, tell the wind of herbs what you dreamed of. Cross the threads, the rivers. Weave the blanket. Grandfather comes from the mountains with a golden rod. Those big wings in the sky tell us to close our eyes. But the girl sings to lengthen the day. The girl has eyes that light up at night. 6. In another place I have already told how we went in 1541 to look for cinnamon. In another place I have already told how we went in 1541 to look for cinnamon how we built a boat in the rivers of the mountain range, how a river that did not stop growing took us long months among impenetrable jungles. That trip is reputed to have been heroic, but all we did was not let ourselves die, and the truth is that we undertook that adventure because we knew nothing about the jungle and the river. Only that ignorance allowed us to survive, we let ourselves be carried away like a leaf that falls in a stream, and we managed to make the jungle hardly notice our presence that its tangled hair of ghosts did not turn against us. My second trip to the jungle was very different, 
and to understand it I must speak again about the man who conceived that conquest. In 1548, in the plateaus of the new kingdom of Granada, the adolescent governor Pedro de Urshua asked his uncle, Miguel Diaz de Armendariz, a strict judge of four governorats, to go and find the gold of the Muiscas. Dear branded Indians in the savanna cornfields revealed to him where Tuscasusa hid the countless pieces of his treasure, when the horseshoes of Jimenez de Quesada's horses were stained with blood. Cortes had brought Moctezuma's treasure to Spain, Pizarro had sent ships that nearly capsized with gold, loaded with Atahualpa's ransom, but Mexico and Peru were not lands of strident gold but of discreet silver. The new kingdom of Granada sinks its golden roots deeper into the earth than the others. The Zipa of Bogota, who bathed in gold dust to speak with the sun in the high lagoons while his people threw tunjos into the water, engendered the legend of the golden man who has consumed entire expeditions. Through the canyons of the Caucar River Jorge Robledo saw armies of thousands of men where each warrior went like a king, crowned with a resplendent helmet, and hearing all this, Urshua also dreamed of placing a mountain of gold at the feet of Carlos V. He asked his uncle for permission to search for the treasure, but the cunning and devious uncle replied that his kingdom was weak and eaten up by enemies, for ten years an indignant Indian woman named La Gaetana had raised thousands of Indian warriors against Spain. And the boy had to prove his talent fighting the panches of Timana. The young and still naive Urshua rode with his troops by the stone and water temple of Tekendama to the river plains inhabited by catfish men and snake men, from where the blue mountains can be seen to the west, and then went south, where carvers hidden before time hammered a forest of stone demons. Through the burning plains, on canoes undermined in giant saba trees, under skies populated with beasts, he did his bloody work, and when he returned he informed his uncle that the panches were already punished, and asked him for permission to go and look for the treasure of the Zipa. The ceremonious Armendariz celebrated the victory, which affirmed Santa Fe's power over the southern kingdoms and over the Valley of Sorrows, but instead of giving him the promised authorization, he replied that, first things first, the Chitareros had to be pacified. And the party almost served to dispel many rumors. But since most of them were not born of evidence but of passions, misgivings, and persistent envies, they soon surfaced again. Pedro de Arcos passionately loved his mestiza, and displayed it with pride so that everything began to be attributed to some kind of Indian spell, to a drink or spell of those to which the Indians are fond, and as Ines became visible she was also looking excessively showy to the people of the town. How much Dona Florentia Eulalia Josefina and her maids would have wanted to question the priest who was hearing her confession in detail, but Ines did not leave them much room for rumors. If she left the house it was only to go to church, accompanied by her maids, and she lived in her mansion most of the time. When Pedro de Arcos came to answer for his affairs in Lima, Ines did not even go to the door. One would say that she was the most faithful wife, the most beautiful woman and the most discreet young woman in the city, and as much as the shutters were opened and the subject was formulated and the eyes peered greedily, no one could find any serious reason to talk about it. She. Then the matter that of the viceroy's nephew occurred. The game two fingers that touch at the end are the sacred peak of the Coraquenc, and the three extended ones are its plume. Three fingers together are the head of the alpaca, and the two outstretched are its ears. Now the two hands facing each other, two Coraquencs facing each other. If I bring them to your face, my hands are your mask. The girl has the face of two birds, the girl has Coraquenc feathers. And if I lower two fingers, two alpacas look at each other over their eyes. 4. When in 1557, the court of Don Andres Hurtado de Mendoza. When in 1557, the court of Don Andres Hurtado de Mendoza y Bovadilla, Marquis of Canet, touched Peruvian land, the notables who were waiting for him at the port saw a drunken, young, and haughty man get off the galleon. They all ran to offer their salute and reverence, and the hand kisser had been going for a long time when the true Marquis, a heavy and venerable knight, appeared on the bridge of the ship. The young man who usurped the honors was his nephew Francisco de Mendoza, entrusted to the viceroy by a widowed sister. It is not that I intend to occupy a place by force in this story, 
but it is necessary to say that I was then secretary and clerk of the Viceroy. The problem was that, as soon as the galleon that brought us from Spain had descended into the marshes of Castillo de Oro, ready to attend its possession in the city of the Kings of Lima, an unexpected haul held me back on the isthmus, when the viceregal court he was already embarking on the waters of the South Sea. To add insult to injury, the surgeon ordered me to remain immobile for several weeks before starting my work, and this delayed me in the name of God, but thanks to that delay I was able to befriend the new chief of the royal troop, who had the task of pacifying the rebellious Maroons, entrenched in palenques in the torrid jungles of the coast. I was beginning to get acquainted again with the crazy rhythm of the Indies. Although I had been born in Hispaniola thirty-five years ago, and although I was part of the expedition that, embarked on a brig in 1542, discovered the immense river of the Amazon, I derived more than ten years later, entangled in the wars of the Emperor, for the wheels of Flanders and the fence of cutlasses in the Mediterranean. Later, more relaxed, I had been a clerk in Valladolid for years, trying to forget my past, oblivious to the affairs on this side of the world that change with diabolical haste. But fate is a skillful elf at upsetting all things. Suddenly returned to these lands, thanks to the fact that the new viceroy highly valued my experience and believed me useful in helping him to familiarize himself with his new dominions, I began my mission in the Indies, lacking his possession. And in my place was the ostentatious nephew, Francisco de Mendoza, added to the procession at the last moment in the port of Cadiz, and who was to become the main disappointment of the viceregal family. He was noted from the beginning for his inclination to get drunk and star in loud scandals, for his abuses of the Indians, and for his tendency to rival everyone, making himself pay excessive honors as a member of the Viceroy's court. He had already come from Spain, reprimanded for besieging women with an owner, and a jealous dagger had marked his chest in a duel of honor. The Marquis quickly gave him a position in the Trujillo administration, but there was no shortage of people who said that the Viceroy knew the nephew very well and tried to keep him as far away as possible. It was inevitable that, as soon as he arrived, the boy would put his greedy eyes on the most beautiful woman in Trujillo, whom he saw one day crossing to the church with her maids, and leaving like an apparition from the sedan chair to enter in the gloom of the temple. And, of course, that twenty-five-year-old woman of strange beauty, both wild and luxurious, powerful and discreet, was none other than Ines, the orphan of Atienza, the mestizo princess of Pedro de Arcos. Francisco de Mendoza began to woo her in an insistent and impudent way, he shouted clumsiness as he passed in the middle of the day, he sent her suggestive letters with the servants, he sang in a bad voice on his balcony at night without even wondering if the husband would be in the house. Some people who were waiting for the opportunity to speak of Agnes and accuse her of something, found their opportunity. No one has been able to prove that she corresponded to the officials' requirements, but even she, who was haughty and bossy, had to keep her composure and assume the courtesy that corresponds to the claims of a viceroy's nephew, and Pedro de Arcos himself knowing only what rumors were spreading, at first he let things pass hoping that his nephew's capricious fever would pass without any more noise. But the facts became notorious, because Mendoza was easily intoxicated, so Pedro de Arcos warned him one day in private not to annoy them, a second time he rebuked him in the middle of the street, and when the provocation was presented again, he challenged Francisco de Mendoza to a duel of honor. Solemn sponsors came and went, Ines de Atienza shut herself up in dismay, the old encomenderos were tense, the neighbors spread new rumors, and the duel was fulfilled, with such bad luck that Pedro de Arcos was badly wounded by Mendoza and that same night he changed the covetable bed of Agnes for a cold grave in the mountains. If the duel was with the sword or musket I never managed to find out, because by the days when I came to have confidence with her I did not dare to mention that murky and painful story to her. The Viceroy was not unaware that his relative had developed a reputation for quarreling in the barracks and taverns, but he never expected that the first act of the Viceregal family in the Indies would be a crime. Everywhere it was reported that the Viceroy's nephew had killed a man for a matter of skirts, and that the dead man was the encomendero Pedro de Arcos, wealthy in mines and haciendas. Rumors flew saying that the reason for the duel was his mestizo woman, 
an envied orphan of one of the discoverers of the South Sea and a mysterious granddaughter of the Inca kings, and they returned telling that the girl had the secret of the women who formed the ring of Atahualpa, who was lighter skinned than her royal grandmothers, who ruled a luxurious mansion, who spoke Spanish with a naive song that made her look younger than she was, and that, in short, her life was haughty and proud. Mystery of the Mountains Where He Was Born The nephew was immediately brought before the viceroy, who proposed sent to Spain without scandal, but a group of indignant encomenderos had already gathered, determined not to allow the new authority of the kingdom to come to undermine the rights recently confirmed by the orders of La Gasca. The latter, trying to impose a minimum order in a turbulent region, had among so many things prohibited honor duels. The men of the Indies, who since the time of Gonzalo Pizarro had been convinced that they had to be respected by the crown, demanded justice and the viceroy understood that he had to please them. This is how the beautiful Ines de Atienza, who had lost her father twelve years ago and had been married just seven years ago, was left alone again, now a widow, with her heart twice in mourning and, why not decide, with her property also duplicated by this new inheritance. The Weavers of Blankets The Forest News has been received for weeks that his. The uprising has spread to the Chicamoca Gorges, reaching the banks of the Shugamuxi and the Magdalena River, which the Indians call Yuma. There is no graver threat to our kingdom today, he added, affecting more dismay than he actually felt. The obedient Urshua traveled to the mountains of Northeast, he crossed ghostly moors where the hundreds of Indians whom he had taken by force, naked settlers of the plain that did not resist the ice of the height, were black and cold. And there he waged an eager and soulless war, because although patience is industrious, urgency is always the sister of cruelty. After hearing with his eyes the silent thunder of Catatumbo, the lightning that never goes out, he returned haunted and cruel and told his uncle, the Chicamoca region is pacified, and I have founded the city of Pamplona in the mountains, to remember our lands of origin, in the hills of Navarra. Now let me go in search of El Dorado. Miguel Diaz de Armendariz was happy with that news, but he did not want to give up his nephews so soon, who was his main instrument to subdue the kingdoms. You have shown yourself to be bold and courageous, he told her. The power we wield is greater than before, and the gold you have brought speaks well of the wealth of that region and the energy of your triumphs, but now I lovingly command you to travel to the country of the Musos, in the middle region of the Magdalena. It was a land of mountains of rock, between grey deposits of salt and mines of emeralds, which the Musos had made impregnable. After a hard war, which was sealed with betrayals, Pedro de Urshua returned tense and gloomy, and said to Armendariz, I have defeated the Musos, and I have founded Tudela, the city of emeralds, on the flanks of the mountain, which will keep your memory and mine. Now give me authorization to go in search of the country of gold. Do not doubt that you will go in search of him. Answered the fat and ceremonious uncle. But I must make one more plea to you because I cannot waste your warrior talent without finally asserting our command over the territory. For the last time you will travel to war, to the snowy mountain ranges that rise by the sea, and you will defeat the Tehrana's rebels. And the resigned and already dark Pedro de Urshua. He returned through the waters of Yuma towards the north, under the millinery gaze of the iguanas with great crests, entered as governor in Santa Marta, under the white mountains, shocked the mountains led troops of blood by the sea that devours unwary swimmers, and advanced in iron and terror against the mighty Tehranas, from the warm jungles of broad beans and sabales to the steppes of stone cities, and pierced the mists where the gold prospectors hid from the Indians, and compelled the Kajas and the Ikas to take refuge in invisibility and mist. And there the Battle of Paso de Origua took place, where Urshua, with twelve soldiers, resisted the sieges of three thousand Indians. Then that man came back hardened, bloody and feverish, to finally demand his uncle's license to go in search of the treasure that haunted him. But when he arrived in Santafe, they informed him that Governor Armendariz had been dismissed, that the Judge Montana, a quiet and vigilant man, had opened a process for salacious behavior, and that there was an arrest warrant against him for his cruelty to the Indians. 
the world had collapsed. Urshua fled like an outlaw, followed at a gallop by his friend Juan de Castellanos, who heard Handeca syllables even at the blow of the horseshoes, and for several months they took refuge in the Pamplona Moors, where the young warrior had friends. But news reached there that Luis Lanchero's troops were coming after him, whom the boy had humiliated years ago, so they rode down the mountain to La Terra, or Cuatro Brazos, which some already called the Bermeja Barranca, and embarked heading to the thick jungles of Santa Marta. It was on that hazardous journey down a river of Caymans, looking suspiciously upstream, where the persecutor's boats were supposed to appear, when the young lawyer told Urshua that one afternoon, in the Pearl Islands of Cumana, he had seen a boat arrive made of jungle logs and cocked with oil of river cetaceans, a ship of one-eyed men, and that its captain, Francisco de Orellana, revealed to him that, exploring the confined waters of the Inca rivers, his brig had been dragged for eight months by a monstrous river that did not stop growing. And he had traveled amid showers of arrows, under an immense jungle populated by Amazons, fierce and naked women. And the persecuted Urshua, who had won in. Four wars were in vain but he had lost a dream, he made the decision before the tiger ravines of Tamalamec to repeat the steps of Orellana, conquer the Amazon River, become governor of those immense jungles, and then travel by roads of which only he he had news, to finally rescue the gold from the Zipas. In Santa Marta he separated from his friend Castellanos, who had decided to stay and become a clergyman and write an endless poem, and he embarked alone, bound for Peru, still not knowing how to undertake that conquest. You hear with your whole body. You never know if what you think. Don told you the tiger in the evening. If the thoughts that fill the tomorrow they come from the branches or from the bottom of the water. If the noon resolutions are dictated. The fiery sun or the memory of the blackest night. You don't know if the sudden calm of sunset, which brings again old faces and words. Pours from the wing that brushes the branches of the lightning that bursts, far, on the jungle, or the moon that makes its home between red clouds. You hear with your whole body, you touch everything with dazzled eyes. You feel the fear in your back that sweat, in the legs that hurt, on the fingers wounded by the thorns of the water. 7 and was newcomer to Panama, persecuted and without troops. And he had just arrived in Panama, pursued and without troops, when Urshua was unlucky enough to find us. To me, who opened the doors of the viceregal court, to the Marquis of Canet, who discovered that this Navarresa boy was of the blood of famous captains of his land, and to the Palenques of rebel maroons that it was his destiny to reduce whom he persecuted, poisoned and slaughtered with harshness, just to gain appreciation of the viceregal powers. That man, whom I in the early days, he considered himself a vagabond, managed to become very soon the head of the viceroy's personal guard, and when the account of his adventures reached us we knew that, despite his youth and his refined manners, we were facing an implacable man who had fought four wars savages against the Indians of Tierra Firme. Sooner or later what we are shows. It's. Being astray could not long conceal the powerful chief of troops, who had been governor twice before he was twenty-five years old and who left his name written in blood over vast provinces, everything that I could not have foreseen in our first meeting on the docks. I still had to discover that in Urshua. Any conquest was just a prelude to the next, any triumph was only a stepping stone that allowed him to see further and his ambition kept growing as the landscape widened. Like a man climbing a mountain, things ever smaller in the distance filled his horizon, and he needed to move faster to reach them. The arrival of the viceregal court to the continent promised to be just a sequence of tedious offices, bureaucratic procedures, things that by dint of repeating themselves produce the illusion that the world is the same forever and that the power of the office and the seal will never be annoyed. The arrival of Urshua changed everything was. Curious as a hound, I don't know how he found out that I was a veteran of Orellana's trip and he wanted me to tell him about the adventures of the expedition we undertook looking for the country of Cinnamon, 
if it was true that this trip turned into a carnage, if our final escape had been an accident or a betrayal, and how we lived the greatest discovery of Spain in the Indies, the discovery of the largest river in the world and the jungle that surrounds it. At first I was suspicious. I did not understand the cause of his interest in those days that left us full of enemies. I do not recall having offended Gonzalo Pizarro's men who were abandoned by the Coca River in any way, but I did not stop being seen as a traitor by the survivors who returned through the cruel mountains to Quito and Lima. I had been trying to forget that trip for many years, when one of those days, in the name of God, a stab in the belly revealed that the world was not forgetting it. Someone in the shadows wanted to collect from me the supposed debts of Orellana, and Pedro de Urshua saved me in that trance that could be fatal. By one of those coincidences that end up being definitive in all existence, his help in a moment of danger made me not only his friend but also his faithful companion until the day the stars betrayed him. Life, here, does not stop agitating. The moss. Fortresses are cracked, roads are erased under the grass, landslides destroy camps, villages awaken with a start at midnight, when streams are transformed into stormy rivers, forests are closed at the slightest carelessness and every firm enclave is humiliated by the elements. We seek firmness in men and beliefs when the reality around us is fickle and weak but men also participate in the urgency of the rivers and the cunning of the alligators, the agility of the deer and the precision of the jaguar that calculate the distance and force on the branch. It would seem that the spell of some men of inflexible will lies in that they seem to embody more powerful laws, forces that subdue and drag others, so that nature itself is willing to submit to their force. Walking with Urshua I felt at times that he was with someone to whom nature submitted. But in the long run everything is illusion, a man is nothing when the rivers grow, when a sky of stones is suspended over the villages, when the heaped cloud prepares its rays. The only human forces that resist this confrontation are those unleashed by madness, which does not set limits, and which does not consist in the loss of intelligence but in its insolent and sacrilegious magnification. But Urshua did not belong to the lineage of the insane but just a line of the stubborn. His was above all stubbornness and ambition, and he would soon find forces capable of opposing his dreams. These voyages of conquest have had moments of fortune but also long stretches of demonic madness. It was already an extreme purpose to conquer the kingdom of stone and lacquer of the Aztecs, in the lake surrounded by bloody altars, it was already a delirium to subdue the abyss of the Inca temples, and there were men whose will was more made of iron than their breastplates fierce and fiery troops who defied the impossible. But the story that I am trying to tell is perhaps more foolish and sadder, because the greatest madness of this age in the world was conceived early by Pedro de Urshua, the inordinate ambition to conquer the Amazon jungle and dominate the water serpent than the goes through. Orellana's adventure was very different. When we started our journey we were ignorant of the existence of the jungle and the river, it was all an accident, our feat consisted only of surviving, and a voyage of discovery is not experienced the same as a voyage of conquest. On the other hand, Urshua already knew that the jungle and the river existed, I had warned him of their magnitude and dangers, and I had repeated that they were not simply a river and a jungle, that these regions were a vast and stormy world, inhabited by secret gods, governed by laws that we cannot decipher. Perhaps what has forced me to write this story is the fact that so far I am the only human who has lived these two trips. Anyone wondering why a man who in his youth was dragged to walk the water serpent has been able to return to his hell twenty years later, already at the gates of old age. We do not own our destiny, a life that has not found its answers is subject to temptations and challenges. I rejected for years the memory of my first trip but now I know that all vehement rejection is secretly a bond, and Urshua, who was a conqueror in every way, managed to turn my rejection into attraction, my revulsion into curiosity, took my tired life and brought it back to the age of questions. Against all warning, he persisted in believing that this vast world could be conquered, that it was possible for a man to saddle the serpent, to ride the abyss. Now I know that countries are his men. Only that old Spain capable of taking risks through unknown seas, that courage that lifted the mist that covered the worlds, could dream in the midst of the delirium that the storm also had in its hands. 
Some who had suffered limitless frustrations subdued, it is true, very powerful and extensive kingdoms, but this boy who had been born in the cradle of princes, this son of the frontiers who had been born in the shadow of Pyrene and Heracles, finally believed that his hands reached for the sky, and he woke up to the lightning. Story In the Song of the Bird Luck In the Cloud the Story of the Possible In the Coca Leaf the Milk of the Earth In the Light the Domain of the Passions In the Reed the Music of the Abyss In the Stone the Souls of the Dead In the Knot the Secret of Alliances In the Dream the Fabric of the Ponds In the Silent Tree the Memories of the Water Old Age in the Mist On the Moon the Garden of Those Who Are they were. In the wind the flower of storms. In the condor that flies the friendship of. The kingdoms. On the red cob the laughter of the sun. In the blood the disorder of the. Stars. 8. In the leisure of the jungle. Panamanian. In the leisure of the Panamanian jungle, after that war against the Maroons that I later learned to see as an evil deed. Listening to the promises of the horizon under the leaden sky of the South Sea, Urshua asked me to tell him what he did not know. Of our expedition. He wanted to repeat Orellana's trip, he thought he could seize everything that our captains could not keep. He had spoken to other veterans, but he was always on the lookout for revelations, for significant new details, and perhaps that is why he devoted himself to me with a love-related intensity. With the impatience to know everything, I reviewed. Again every detail as if he were running through his own memory, he corrected me minute data that he remembered better, and very soon I understood that he was not interested in my thoughts but only in my memories. That is why there are many things that he failed to appreciate, elementary truths that he never took into account. The proposed expedition, I repeat, was the fruit of his will, it was governed by his desire to conquer, while ours had been an accident. What we were looking for we never found, what we found no white man had imagined, and that is what allowed us to survive. If ours had been a voyage of conquest, we would have had to fight, establish villages, make lasting deals with the natives, things that would have delayed our step, that would have created ties, obstacles to that free flow that allowed us to go out to the other side, battered and wounded, consumed and full of visions, but luckily alive. So while Urshua knew many, Circumstances of our navigation, he was deceived as to the causes of the discovery. His information came from the stories that Orellana, Fray Gaspar de Carvajal and the other travelers made in Cubagua and Margarita just off the boat, and in those stories, without agreeing, we told the journey through the jungle and the river in great detail, to better silence what happened in the first months of the trip. The events were colorful, the episodes tremendous. No one could suspect that we were keeping something silent, that we were tormented by a secret. The day finally came when he told me, with his usual enthusiasm and as if it were a prize, that he had a place for me on his expedition to conquer the Amazons, I was sure that my presence would be very useful to him. A single trip down the river, I replied, is enough to poison a life. Mine already had enough with the anguish of that time. Nobody knows how long it took me to stop feeling captive in a spider's web. The jungle is still attached to the skin even though one is already far away, the force of the river is still present when we have been its toy for so many months, it is as if the time that flows was just a memory of the river, as if the rushing hours were still its banks. There is no way to avoid, even in the placid days, the fear that a deadly arrow is going to pierce the halls, that a jaguar is going to roar in the branches of a temple, that a huge serpent is curling up in the evening clouds. You were able to face all that to thee. Twenty years, without knowing him, he replied, you can't be intimidated at forty by a trip you've already made. You forget, I said, that we were not looking for the jungle or the river. We found them without looking for them, we did not even take the initiative to cross them, the river prevailed. But it was all an accident you would have to be crazy to launch yourself knowingly to that navigation. Besides, I added, nobody repeats a trip, so. We were the same men and we embarked on the same brig, everything would be different. In such a jungle and in such a river each trip will awaken a different madness. And this shows that, 
without knowing it, I sensed everything, but it is that the true meaning of the words we speak is only revealed to us very late, when reality confirms them. I entertained him for a whole day with my account of the journey fifteen years ago in search of the land of cinnamon. He listened attentively, any piece of information could be invaluable, and although he was anxious to interrupt me to seek clarification, he allowed the story to flow, for fear that the pauses could spoil my memory. I had never fully narrated that experience because I was reluctant to remember the minutiae of a miserable trip, but that man listening to me modified those old facts, I understood that narrating them gave me a certain power over them, made me a privileged witness of the events, and the A story that I had avoided for years became interesting to my eyes, it gave me a kind of relief to rescue her. How clever was Urshua! I was fascinated by a memory that a short time before had caused me rejection. Got me to see less and less. I discussed the possibility of reliving that trip, and I don't know when I felt ready to face, almost anxiously, the nightmare of my youth. And so we returned to the city of the Kings of Lima. Fifteen years ago, when we were going to look for the cinnamon, power had a name, Francisco Pizarro. It had been difficult for me to reach his palace and ask in a timid voice for my father's inheritance. I only managed to get enlisted in the expedition in the hope of receiving some benefit should the aroma forests appear. Pizarro seemed then as firm as the mountains. Now of the disgraceful man who three polishers before owned the world, there was nothing left but a bundle of bones under the stones. I had believed in his promise to recover my father's inheritance, and I was leaving my faith along the way. While the power lasts, the powerful suffer the illusion of being invincible and immortal, and they manage to spread that fantasy, but in these new lands time grinds everything faster. Now I was returning to Peru as a member of the viceregal court, and I was a close friend of the new captain of the troops, while of Pizarro, the mythological conqueror, not even the ghost remained in the world, he was less than mist in the fog of the mountains. Prophecy of the Arrival of the Invaders Without putting pressure on it, it has broken into My hands the arrow Without anyone pushing him he has slipped and That pitcher has fallen My palm is broken before Thorn wounds her It deforms on my lips and turns A friendly word is an insult Dark saliva comes out of the sun The wines in the Stone niches The condor takes flight and runs into the lower branches. Children suddenly have faces of seniors. 9. We reached the port. Misty of El Cayao. We reached the misty port of El Cayao, the same day we rode to the city of the Kings of Lima, and at dusk we stopped the horses in front of the great house of the Marquis of Canet. After Panama, to fill a whole day from moon to moon with my account of Orellana's trip, after two weeks on the deck of the Pishikamac, Watching the rainy coasts pass by, the islands where the first explorers lived their hell, the long cliffs of white birds and the dark backs of whales or sea snakes, Urshua and I had formed a good friendship. He knew almost everything about me, I already had memories of Navarre Hills, Donostia Taverns, lustful women on the shores of the Cantabrian Sea. Having known Peru at different times, now we arrived together and who goes alone than who feels accompanied does not see the same world. The viceroy who had already made Urshua his chief of troops intended to use his arm to quell rebellions, to submit to his sword a world always ripe for insurgency, but Urshua came drunk with dreams. Remembering Santafe's postponements and the terrible outcome of those delays, he was determined to prevent his uncle's story from repeating itself that the viceroy began to use him as a spearhead to conjure uprisings and appease regions where there were fires of indigenous rebellion guarded in the embers, settlers brooding grudges, crazy adventurers brewing conflicts. Already in Panama the captain had formulated his expectations if he could beat the Maroons, it was time to clearly present his project to the viceroy. The shadowy warrior of 31 years, a survivor of so many battles, endlessly reborn from its ashes, wanted to immediately undertake the conquest of the largest river in the world and the jungle of mysteries that surrounds it. For him, the country of the Amazons was a ring of fortresses arranged in the jungle to isolate and protect the foreseen city. 
legends, rumors, and chronicles were woven into his mind, tales of travelers that bordered on delirium and fantasy. Attentive to every story, only things that confirmed his obsession convinced him, he dismissed as fables what was discouraging and ignored warnings and recommendations. Because he had convinced me of being accompanied, he... He felt more secure than before, he felt capable of convincing almost anyone. And if the Peru we were arriving in was very different from the one I had suffered in another time, I know that Urshua had changed more. From the dreaming and indecisive boy, drifting through the kingdoms, had risen an influential warrior, esteemed at court and full of eloquence. I almost regretted having expressed him in Panama so many severe opinions on the conquest, because finally he was everything that I condemned about the conquerors. But I confess that under its influence the excesses and crimes seemed understandable, malignancy was filled with mitigating circumstances in light of the circumstances. And it is that being his friend led one, at least led me, to minimize his mistakes and his responsibilities, because if he was arbitrary and brutal when he was possessed by the permissive passion of war, in ordinary treatment he was kind and loyal, and at his side one felt under a protective shield. He wasted wit, grace, and mischief. From Who left his women in Santafe, an Indian. Kumanagata called Zibali, who prayed to him. Body before the battles, and a Spanish lady that he sometimes dreamed of bringing to Peru and who had a daughter of his in the Bogota savanna, only dealt with women who did not compromise his affections, who did not occupy his heart beyond the moment. And they left him all the time to rave campaigns and treasures. The thirst for power was the only passion that filled him, that filled him with arguments, and the Marquis de Canet was docile like all of us to his dreams of blood and his ghosts of gold. Like Gonzalo Pizarro twenty years ago, Urshua kept accounts the entire day, costs of horses and soldiers, food, tents, pigs, and the main weapons, dogs, crossbows, arquebuses, and gunpowder. It had to include the expedition ships in the initial cost, and it had far fewer resources than Pizarro's company. He began to go through parcels, knowing to the lords and bringing them the greeting of the viceroy. In principle, he did not intend to request anything from them, but rather to form an idea of who would be candidates to finance his project. There was a long series of visits and lunches, horseback riding through the mountains, meetings with landowners and Indians, and Urshua did not miss an opportunity to relieve his admirable exploits of the new kingdom of Granada. In those stories he was a hero at seventeen, a founder of cities at twenty, a triumphant warrior at twenty-two, a tireless rider through tremendous mountains, among tigers, alligators, and hostile populations, in all the splendor of his youth, and knew how to dramatize the vicissitudes of the search for his lost treasure, the wars against the Panch and against the Muso, the Emerald Wars, the story that Castellanos had told him of the young lungs of the Indians exploded in the extraction of pearls in Cubegua, the story of its two great foundations in the new kingdom of Granada the fearsome stories of the stone beasts and the lightning that does not cease, and especially the chronicle of its war against the Tirana, with the discovery of the mysterious stone cities of the Sierra Nevada de Santa Marta, to close the cycle with the defeat of Bayano, king of the Maroons, in the fiery jungles of Panama, among the metallic flight of the giant beetles. But the account of those past lives was just the mouthful of the adventures that they expected. Urshua was building his legend in the minds of others, and many were willing to finance the adventure of a man so shrewd and brave, so ingenious, and reckless, who was determined to face the greatest obstacle he had encountered in the Indies. To lands that, being the most cruel that could be imagined, were undoubtedly suspicious of the greatest treasures. It still seemed possible that what was missing was much greater than what had been found, Undoubtedly an enduring glory awaited him under the skies of the New World, but also something to show off and narrate in the old stone fortress site of his elders in Ariscan, in the hills of Navarra, and perhaps in nearby palaces, where relatives of his they used to host the greatest lord under heaven. Many were convinced, and after the first visits, some promised important resources for that expedition that was led by a Garrido and princely captain and was guaranteed and trusted by the viceroy himself. 
It had not been long since our arrival when Urshua began to feel in a position to begin the collection of resources and the recruitment of the men who would accompany him. He began to inquire about the regions from where it would be convenient to leave, and I myself suggested that it would not be necessary to go to Quito, as we had done with Pizarro, with tremendous waste of energy and men, because such a large river is born everywhere, the tributaries are innumerable, and from the eastern slopes of the Peruvian mountains we would undoubtedly find waters capable of taking us into the deep jungle. But there, during those same days when the city opened before our eyes beyond the grey ravines, the Marquis of Canet faced the first difficult situation of his government. The need to prevent a new revolt of Encomenderos was forcing him to present himself as a humble and contrite ruler in the eyes of a mestizo widow, of whom all of Peru spoke with a passionate mixture of admiration and envy. In the jungle inside. He lay down on the clay ground and. The lights of the sky lowered her. That they were fireflies, the witches said. But she was trembling. What were the eyes of foxes in the jungle of? Inside. Which were holes in the wall of the. Dream house. That were ink stains on the skin. Naked of the firmament. It lay on the water and the water did not. Devoured. He lit bonfires on the roads of the saw. He threw embers into the abyss full of fog. It always passes by leaving a trail of shining stones. It always leaves its shadow on the pupils. 10. After thinking a lot about how to correct the offense of nephew. After thinking a lot about how to correct the offense of the nephew, who compromised his entire family, the Marquis of Canet made the decision to send Pedro de Urshua, his trusted man and the most colorful warrior in the kingdom, to visit the widow of Pedro de Arcos, pay his respects and the testimony of deep indignation of the viceregal house for the crime of his relative, telling him that the criminal would be prosecuted with all severity under the imperial laws, and asking him one day to agree to be visited by the Marquis himself. We still wrote imperial laws. Although now a king ruled us and not a emperor, although the empire of a few decades struggled to undo into kingdoms, Urshua could not refuse to comply with that embassy, but for the first time in his life he was forced to take on the role of humble apology presenter, and that did not fit his character. He did not attach great importance to the mission nor did he think much about the lady he was to visit, he could represent her as a poor suffering lady locked in her world people from whom one knows how to ignore after completing the visit. He asked me to accompany him to Trujillo, well. He was going to take advantage of the circumstances to visit the encomenderos of the region and share with them his campaign project. Along the fiery coastline we rode for more than ten days, resting on estates assigned by the viceroy, followed by a large troop. Finally, escorted by that same troop but without my presence, Urshua arrived at the great stone house of the Atenza and requested to be received by the lady on behalf of the viceroy. After making him wait a long time, it seems that the widow appeared under a veil of mourning, listened to his greeting, hardly even looked at him while he recited his message with the greatest respect. He began to feel especially mortified by that mission, because he detested the role of humble, apologetic emissary and also because the haughty and spiteful woman treated him as an insignificant subordinate. That same night the captain confided to me his dislike for that woman he had just met, and the next day he confessed that his anger at having gone to that house hardly allowed him to sleep. Wanting to get even, he wrote to him for the Marine mail a letter to the viceroy telling him, not false things, but exaggerated truths, among them that the widow received his apologies reluctantly, that she was more of an Indian than a Spanish, and that she did not seem to him to be a trustworthy person. To his disappointment, the Marquis in his response found the woman's attitude perfectly explainable, taking into account that she was sunk in mourning, that she had just lost her husband, and that she was the only person to whom the newly inaugurated viceregal government he had offended in a serious way. Ines had assumed her role as offended queen, so she barely deigned to thank the viceroy with a hard face, but that hostile face was etched on my friend in an offensive way. He thought of her often. It was first said that it was his tragic fate as a widow that affected him in this way. 
but he did not forget his face, hardened by offense, and even confessed to me that there was something disturbing about it, more hateful in its stone firmness than the rumors of the city said. It bothered him that an unknown woman aroused this kind of persistent dislike, and, contrary to his chivalric ways, he wanted to curse her. Fortunately, he had other things to think about, and he took advantage of his visit to the coast to get to know the region, to learn about many things that had happened in previous times, to find out who he had to talk to to further his interests. Together we visited the citadel of Chan Chan, and I remember that we were both impressed, on a day with blinding sun and long winds, the enormity of that fired clay city, the immense squares with walls decorated with marine sinuses, the harshness of the shadows on a ground that seemed to be buzzing with stories, the slight vertigo of being lost through a maze of suffocating galleries, many of which were still full of natives who tried to continue carrying their merchandise there and celebrating rituals, although we all knew that that was not the world of the Incas but a previous world, which the Incas themselves looked down on. The dignity of the cities was in the high and polished stone walls, in the tombs of the mountain range. These mud citadels, monumental as they were, seemed like vestiges of a previous world, a bit barbarous. Chan Chan was too close to the sea, the gods of the Incas were of another substance, condors from the frozen heights, pumas from the mountain cities, snakes from the hidden jungle. The kings descended from Pashakutek did not trade with the sea, nor with the seagulls that flap in the distance, nor with the fish that populate the abysses. Perhaps that is why it was so easy that that abandoned and fragile side was the door of perdition. Before returning to Lima, Urshua was already moving like a bird from encomienda to encomienda, trying to convince the lords to join the project with ducats, horses and soldiers. It had served him well to hear me talk about my travels through Europe, he was spending his grammar painting for those rustic gold-plated the nobles of Seville, the merchants of Spain, the bankers of Augsburg and Genoa, and even the cardinals of Rome. With an investment in time they would increase the flows of all. And it was fortunate that the funders could be so close, because the tycoons and remote bankers, even if they wanted to, did not have within reach of their ships the rivers that cross the jungle or the cities of Amazons that populate the world of the Great Serpent. Urshua began to speak and immediately believed. His own story. Perhaps only he could have written or dictated this story, and he certainly would have done it with much more eloquence than I can put into it, because sometimes I just badly imitate his use of words. He was fed up with his childhood stories, his devilish taverns, his dialogues with his beloved uncle, and having frequented so many illustrious men. As a good seducer, he did not use words to think but only to convince, and he always had time for anyone who could sponsor his warrior adventures. We returned to Lima and Urshua finally surrendered his. Inform the Viceroy of the thankless mission you had entrusted to him. The Marquis declared himself satisfied that he had overcome the problem in the best way, and Urshua redoubled the pressure to prevent new missions from entangling his plans. It was the year 1558, and Urshua was going to undertake. Immediately preparing your adventure. Disappeared from court. Days later we learned that he was dealing with all sorts of people in the idle alleys of the kingdom. He visited taverns and presidios, stately mansions, and dark dens. He got mixed up in fights, got into strange complicity with strangers, soon became the center of the cliques and the soul of the quarrels, although always in the role of chief of men, protector, and leader. I always wondered if he was such a friend to people as it seemed, because it was not easy for great friendships to arise in such a casual way and dissolve into the next nothing like knots of wind. But at that time he did not seem to need me or my memories, and I assumed my tasks in the viceroy's office without delving too deeply into the pains and delights of memory. The Huaca del Sol. The sea of the opaque color of the days. The sea that advances salty licking. Cliffs. The land's covered in a white that. It's not daylight. But the long spot of the birds. Marine. The stony beach where each. Pebble. Talk about former lovers. Abandoned and behind the city of mud walls. Of walls with painted fish that jump. 
and deep down the great ponds. Where the sacred fur dogs. Naked. Dogs with feverish fur a sea. Submerge at noon. When the water is still. And emerge slowly, first the tips. Black of his ears. And then the muzzle. Before the blowing wind blows. Cities and people. And seeps its insidious sand into the. Sunken overlapping temples. That had colored walls. And they were filled with new walls. And strokes. Because here we draw for the. Guests of the land and the. Darkness. Because here we draw for the. Dead. Eleven. We weren't wearing much. Time in Lima. We hadn't been in Lima for long when. The news reached the viceregal court less. Expected, the crown had appointed a new. Viceroy. Don Andres Hurtado de Mendoza and. Bovadilla, Marquis of Canet, was suffering the worst offense that an official could hope for. Be replaced in the most important position in the new world without warning. Worse still, to put it with all his words, to be removed without having had time to settle his funds or collect his profits. I was present when the news came, which was not even an official message but a well-founded rumor, and I witnessed his embarrassment. The poor Marquis did not understand what was happening, he met with his closest officials and his family and they analyzed the case, wondering who in court was scheming against him. The list of possible candidates was not small although they also examined the possibility that the crime of the nephew had precipitated the catastrophe. Such high decisions are unappealable and fall like rays of serene sky on the heads of the subordinates, so that the Marquis did not know who to turn to to find out the facts, to whom to appeal to conjure them. We did not even know how long His Majesty's determination took, the new worst viceroy was already on his way. I copied several letters in a tone that alarmed me and the Marquis did what must be done with the pages that spring from pure anger, revised, corrected, and destroyed, because although his indignation and arrogance were great, the court habits had taught him to be prudent and shrewd. Every day he wondered if the impostor, if the usurper, if the damned court liquor who was to replace him had already shipped. Sometimes I would find him on the balcony looking at the severe and dark mountains of the Inca with an incomprehensible melancholy for those who did not know that the Viceroy sighed less for the appearance of the mountains than for the veins of silver that were hidden under them, for the wealth saved that it would no longer be his and that an ambitious Ganapan would inherit. Then the rumor began to move that the Marquis de Canet, jealous subject of his Hispanic Majesty, right hand of the king in these latter lands, faithful cub of the crown, was suffering from the disease that had poisoned Gonzalo Pizarro, that he planned to rebel against the determinations of Felipe II. What's more, the rumors not only said that Don Andres wanted to declare himself king of these empires, and prevent the landing of his replacement, but he was preparing Pedro de Urshua as a great general of the troops to guarantee his power over the territory, and to resist even an army that sent the crown or that it was improvised by some new bishop with royal seals. In those days, Urshua reappeared in the viceregal house. Between him and the Marquis there were secrets, messages, and counsels, because the captain had contracted important debts, and the sudden dismissal of the viceroy was about to ruin his dream, so often failed, to conquer his own government, his will to make his fortune in the country of the Amazons, the decision to finally root their foot towards the golden heart of the eastern jungles. Urshua hated betrayal, having so many. Defects, being capable of so many mistakes, only that crime seemed impossible in him. He could be cruel, he could be ruthless and brutal, but he was loyalty embodied, and when he gave someone his trust he did so in an absolute way. The brave are frank, they do not lie or be suspicious, and they are also overconfident. Instead, when it became clear that he had been deceived, his confidence turned into unrelenting fury. But for the first time it seemed to me that Urshua was beside himself. It was as if I was secretly holding a pulse with his destiny, as if warning that an invisible hand was about to bend his hand. A man like him, made not to give up, needs tangible adversaries in front. He always gained strength and decisiveness when measured against other men, but he was incapable of fighting with nature and seemed a castaway in the hands of doom. 
In those days I noticed that when he was in trouble because of invisible or unappealable powers, by fateful decision of the stars or occult powers, he seemed to need more than ever flesh and blood containers, and he got into trouble with everyone. He did not even realize it, he did it in an impulsive way, and it is possible that he left silent enemies, offended beings who would no longer forget that Pedro de Urshua had humiliated them, and who, on the other hand, he forgot with an ease that resembled too much to innocence. Perhaps it was from those imperceptible faces that the rumor began to emerge that Urshua and the Viceroy were preparing a new rebellion, and that very soon there would again be great discords and great sacrileges under heaven. Then the least expected happened. Time had stretched to the limit, even when there seemed to be nothing but extreme solutions, black acts of insubordination and war. The Viceroy decided to send his final message to the Crown, a message that he was preparing to dictate to me but one that I could guess from the silences and tension of the previous days, from Urshua's entrances and exits from the government house, a message that it was surely going to cause deep commotions, when a message from the King's own hand arrived first from a ship that had just anchored in the harbour. And this message brought the news that Don Diego de Acevedo, the new Viceroy, whom they Marquis of Canet had to hand over his kingdom and his throne, his mountains and his ambitions, his hopes and his troops, he had had the strange occurrence of suffering a sudden pain in his chest still mounted on his luxurious pony with velvet drapes, and of collapsing from his luxurious horse on the banks of the Guadalquivir, and of seeing from the stony ground the agony of the sky over the olive groves, and of dying like any mortal on the road to Seville, when he was going to embark for Lima to receive the power over a third of the world, so that Don Andres Hurtado de Mendoza unexpectedly returned to be, indefinitely, Viceroy of Peru. There was no longer any need for rebellion or betrayal. The message that had been gestated in the Viceroy's soul died sweetly in his chest without coming to his lips. Fate had saved him at the last minute. Death, which had been his fearsome adversary in the days when we had been sailing through the ocean, when he seized the young Toribio Alderete on the high seas, had now become his silent ally. Salvation had come where it was least expected, and the noble and wise monarch Don Felipe II was once again an invaluable benefactor in his soul. The slightest thing had never crossed his mind. Shadow of doubt about the generosity and greatness of King Philip. God knew well who he had on the throne of the greatest empire in the world. The land over which melancholy clouds hung was now a glittering mountain range, filled with vigorous men with tasks to accomplish. And the beautiful and princely Pedro de Urshua, who had been his main ally in the dark times, would now be the beneficiary of his protection. All these things I heard from a corner of the room where the Viceroy continued to preach the gospel of fidelity, the homily from the magnanimous throne. Suddenly he burned with indignation remembering the evil rumors that had tried to make him a traitor and an ungrateful one. And I listened to the torrent of his joy, trying to understand why he felt that all this was not happening to the Marquis but to me. The death of an unknown official, in a very remote city, on the other side of a vast sea, was going to change the course of my life forever. It would have been more serious to know that that fact. So happy for Urshua he was writing at the same time the text of his luck, and that luck that was insinuated with all the gleams of happiness was not happy. But, alas, fate, fortunately, is merciful and knows how to mask itself. I did not know whether to rejoice or worry about the obvious fact that the immediate consequence of that abrupt turn of luck would be Pedro de Urshua's definitive expedition to the lost country of the Amazons. The deepest reality was another. Immense. Powerful, invisible, the serpent was closing its ring on our lives. Drum stories. Someone hits hard on the moon. Month of stones. Someone strikes joyfully in the morning sun. Old turtles. Someone calls to dance on the back. Of clay from the mount. Do you understand that story that beats? In the light? Talk about beautiful girls like him corn. Talk about wise old women with the herb. Talk about the stories of the old, who they smell like grass and woods. Thick. You feel them in the belly, like blows. Wild. You feel them in your chest, like battles. 
and as constructions. You feel them on your skin like a rain. Fresh. And hearing that drum you are the moon that resonates in the night. You are the sun that is hidden. Deep into the night. You are the red back where they dance from. Evening. Twelve. Urshua had been about to be rebellious. Urshua had been on the verge of being a rebel, but not because of treason but, how to say, because of an excess of loyalty. He was a true soldier, as the war texts describe him and as chiefs and kings have always dreamed of him. Being so brave, so risky, and so cruel, he was completely subject to authority, to an idea of the world, according to which everyone in command must obey. He had no vocation to be a tyrant in his blood, and even in his hinted and aborted rebellion he remained faithful to the man to whom he owed his power. Nor in the new kingdom of Granada had he ever resisted the will of his boss, who was his uncle and his judge, and that was precisely the cause of his failure. But at last he would not have to be so subject to the lines of command, for the first time he would rule an expedition of his alone. I stopped seeing him for many weeks. Before me. He searched with any pretext to ask for details of my trip or to entrust me with concerns and difficulties, but now there were a thousand tasks on his hands, the company was under-resourced and promised to cost more than originally estimated. The search for the country of cinnamon was paid for with the spoils of a city of gold, nobody lived the anxiety of valuing each invested coin. Now no one had such riches, there was no doubt that times had changed. If legions of Indians began to extract silver from the great mines of the south, no conqueror was collecting gold from the towns by the handful. There was no wealth without work. Could have. Encomiendas of more than 3,000 Indians for a single Spaniard, but there were many more men of conquest who never achieved the favor of the crown and who barely resisted waiting for a somersault of luck. One day, Urshua returned to look for me at the palace. Vice Regal to tell me a curious fact. Traveling through the interior of the kingdom, he had made contact with two Brazilian Indians who survived the river crossing. I already knew that a year ago a whole town of navigating Indians had arrived in Peru, by the rivers of the east, which run beyond the green rocks. They claimed to have traveled ten years upstream from the province of Omegua, going up the adverse currents in canoes, in the midst of great hardships, to come to look for the mountains. For me, the revelation of that trip was amazing. According to the Indians, more than 10,000 natives had left their world in the impenetrable jungle in canoes, they had sailed year after year through narrowing rivers, towards the blurred mountains of the west, and only a few hundred reached the first villages in the high part of the mountain range. Those who had questioned them through interpreters could not understand the reason for the trip, the Indians answered vaguely and did not even give a good idea of where they came from. I always feel that there are many things about you. A trip that you haven't told me yet, Urshua told me one rainy afternoon, while we were riding, exploring the eastern regions of Peru. I remember that the sky opened up in lightning bolts, and while we were escaping next to some huge rocks I resumed the memories, added details, I recounted moments that without a doubt I had already told him, and I felt that it was not in me to prevent him from advancing in his company that rather I was infected by that persuasive magic that his face and his words had. We talk about thunderstorms that we had seen on our trips, and Urshua remembered the story of the lightning strike that fell on the men who were waiting for Judge Armendariz, at Cape de la Vila, one afternoon almost fifteen years ago, when the still sky struck a ray on one of the boats anchored in the bay. Another lightning bolt had set a palm tree on fire when they were traveling down the Magdalena River, and finally he remembered the mysterious and continuous lightning without thunder in the jungles of Catatumbo, which made him feel at the gates of hell. The most powerful thunder that I had heard was not in the sky and Urshua would never hear it, it was the crash of the river against a white wall, when instead of being thrown into the abyss we were surrounded by the foam of the sea. In all my memories it seems to me that I am telling stories to my friend. The words are never the same but the same purpose always governs me, less to tell the facts than to rescue them, to give them an order in the story just to try to understand them. When the rain stopped I was in the middle of some story, but Urshua asked me to save the story for a moment when I could pay full attention to it, 
and he took me to know the ranches that had been planted under the great trees on the shore of the river. River. In that camp, he told me, were the Brazilian Indians who had come from the jungle. I don't know if the Indians or Urshua's attitude impressed me more. I knew that he had fought four wars against Indian peoples, that he had been tried for his cruelties, that he had left the trail of an executioner in the provinces. And there he was conversing with them as if he were speaking with kings or princes, striving to understand their misshapen and jungle Spanish, interested in their native language. Like other times before, he reminded me of Orellana. My old captain had that strange interest in Indian languages and spent whole afternoons learning words, finding equivalences. The meeting was brief, but Urshua assured me that he would take them on the expedition, and I was glad to hear it. Many questions I wanted to ask those lonely travelers who were my secret brothers, they had lived, in reverse, the path that I suffered in the fevers of my adolescence. And the truth is that I could not wait until the beginning of the trip. One day I returned to the region on my own, accompanied by an interpreter, and I went along the shores to the hamlet where we had seen them. What I knew I did not tell Urshua, and it was perhaps the only secret I had from him. It was a truth to myself and one of the most revealing I have ever received. When I had the two Brazilian Indians before me, I asked my interpreter to tell them that I had passed through their land on a boat many years ago. The way they reacted was strange. One approached, looked at my face, touched my beard, touched my hair that fell to my shoulders. Then, as if measuring his words, he said something to my interpreter, raising his arms. He wants to know what the canoe you were in was like. Tell him it was a big ship, with sails of colors, and that another one was also with sails, and that they were followed by canoes. He wants to know where they got the ship in which they came down from the mountains. Tell him we built it ourselves on the river bank. That we were coming overland from the mountains but the jungle was closed and, since we could not go back, we made the boat. The Indian looked at me with wide eyes. He spoke to the other with animation, explained some things to him, and they seemed to be talking about something that greatly disturbed them. He says that they, hidden from the shore. They saw the two boats go down. That after. Lose them they waited days and days, to see if others would pass. That they spoke with other people in the jungle, and that there were many different explanations for what they had seen. I asked why the passage of some travelers attracted so much attention, and only later did I notice my clumsiness. Sailing ships were familiar shapes to me since childhood, but those children of the jungle had never seen an object like that. After digging into the memory of each one, and in their songs, which are the memory of generations, and in their dreams, which are the memory of trees and birds, they did not find anything that resembled that. It was the strangest thing that had ever passed by the edges of the jungle, and everyone began to wonder what was there, up there, at the roots of the rivers, on the imperturbable face of the mountains. It was a lightning flash for me to understand that our step, fifteen years ago, had disturbed the hitherto invariable life of those settlers. All the inhabitants of the shore had seen our boats pass downstream. Some went out to receive and honor the travelers, doubtless believing them to be magical or sacred, others sent them away with clouds of arrows. But others made spells and prayers, the evidence that a house or temple descended by the rivers of the mountain range had an effect similar to that of the news that there was an immense country of cane growers down there. And just as we put together a delirious expedition, those ten thousand men left their homes to search the mountains, at the source where the rivers are born, the nest of the demons or the gods, the factory of the proud brigantines, the furnaces, or the storms where we came from. The Indians were battered by life, their primitive copper color fainted by an unhealthy pallor, faces that revealed great suffering, eyes of having seen terrible things. And yet there was in them the evidence that they were fulfilling an inescapable mission. I felt reverence. In the priests of our church I have never had such a clear sensation of witnessing a sacred destiny. These were the natives of the jungles who years ago had seen some boats pass by, and after seeing them disappear downstream, they turned their eyes to the west and wondered where those floating objects, full of unknown beings, came from that were coming down the river. 
These were the men who, after many months brooding over the meaning of that apparition, could not bear the uncertainty and sleeplessness, and gathered boats to embark on an adventure in turn. They were the ones who climbed the mighty back of the serpent until they saw the mountains appear. One of the very few survivors of the crowd that set out in canoes and canoes, searching for the secret that lay on the peaks. Higher adventurers than us, not them. Greed had moved but only the need to clarify an enigma. Suddenly I felt responsible for them being here, so far from their jungles and their gods. I was the secret that caused thousands of them to have died exhausted in a struggle with the waters that descend through the boxed paths. They were also victims of Pizarro, Orellana, and their men, among whom I counted myself. For anyone who has witnessed it from the outside that was just a casual little dialogue, but for me it was definitive for many reasons. The loneliness that that trip had left me, having lived for months at the mercy of the river, its inexorable and growing bed, its turtle eggs, its indecipherable cries, its pink dolphins, its aquatic snakes, its showers of arrows, its warrior women. Its mysterious smoke, everything made me feel closer to these clay men than to my Spaniards. We were river veterans and we were. Marked by him, we had listened to his story and we had obeyed his will. For that alone we were alive, the life we had was a concession to the great river, on one of whose remote tributaries we now found ourselves. I promised myself that the time would come to share those feelings with them, although relentless time does not allow the past to be invoked without the future imposing its laws and whims. Nor does the river, which has existed forever, know how to remain the same in its being, but rather constantly rehearses its transformations. Maybe that's why I didn't even try to tell Urshua. I felt that I would not understand what touched me about that story. For him, the Brazilian Indians were indications of what he imagined of the jungle. Those drums that we had heard from side to side of the river, in the dark, were the evidence of immense populations, of the cities that were hidden behind. That crowd of ten thousand Indians in canoes spoke of enormous and industrious kingdoms, and their desire to know what was hidden in the mountains was not for him a proof of curiosity and amazement but a sign of the need of these peoples to protect your treasures. There the preparations for the trip began again. The mountain. The tall vacunas are carrying their bundle of gold to the mountain. The mountain is so hard and so high that no one will ever be able to touch it. The old woman passes by with her silver knife. The old woman passes with her knife. Emerald. Sometimes the gentlemen leave a bag full of seashells right at the foot of the road where they go. The tired vacunas. All of that was invented many years ago. Lives, when you were a child. And every time you look up, it's not him. Baby what are you seeing? But the memory of what you saw. When you still hadn't seen the. Pain. When you still hadn't seen the fury. When the words were blue and the. Skin was made of water and the heart was. As good as trees. Thirteen. Omega is a word that. I knew. Omegua is a word that I knew from our trip with Orellana, but where the Brazilian Indians said Omegua, Urshua understood El Dorado. He began to mention these two words together, and very soon the viceroy, who could offer him no more resources, finally made him a solemn appointment. Designated by Royal Charter Governor of Omegua and El Dorado, before those provinces appeared, Urshua received enough powers to recruit men, discover lands, populate cities, appoint officers, collect tributes and rewards on his own account, appropriate all that his conquests gave him, reserving fifths of the king, and license to continue discovering and populating, populating and discovering the immense kingdoms of the river, founding his lineage, preparing for his descendants, without a doubt, a marquisate like those who had already. Granted in the Indies more than once the magnificence of the kings of Spain. At the beginning of 1559 the day was solemnly published, and Urshua took up his work with more energy than ever. We traveled along the eastern slopes of the mountain range to decide the region where the soldiers would be concentrated, the place from where we would undertake the journey. There were months to go, but one of the first decisions was the order of the ships, 
and Urshua spent many days investigating the rivers that we would find, calculating the style and dimensions of the ships due to the demands of navigation. There began his search for carpenters and caulking, officers and ship owners. Soon he had assembled 25 officers and 12 black carpenters, and with them began the acquisition of lumber, tools and nails. Also to seriously stockpile supplies and weapons. He spoke tirelessly with Spanish veterans and Indians, and when he believed he was sure of the route, he chose the province of Modilones, where the Brazilian Indians arrived, as the right place to start the expedition. On the banks of the Modilones River there was already a hamlet called Santa Cruz de Capo Coria, populated long ago by Captain Pedro Ramiro. On that bank the governor installed the workshops for the assembly of the brigs and flats in which the men, horses, provisions and weapons of the trip would be distributed. He left experts and officers working under the guidance of Master Juan Corzo, whom he appointed Master Master, and to ensure the fidelity of that enclave, he considered it appropriate to appoint Pedro Ramiro himself, Lieutenant General of the expedition, who was already a major justice of Santa Cruz. He then returned to Peru, and undertook his final campaign through the estates of the Encomenderos, to collect the money for the company. He had in his hand the list of those who had received him with enthusiasm, who had delighted in his stories and had hosted him in their stone houses. Now he was not going to tell them gallant stories or decorate the Hacienda festivals but to reap the fruits of his previous campaign. Then the Encomenderos began to alleging difficulties to contribute everything that Urshua expected. Before, their eyes lit up at the description of that planned trip, the ships, the horses, the hundreds of soldiers, the thousands of Indians. Now the soldiers began to seem too many, the horses excessive, the ships expensive. They remained convinced of the need for the company but were quick to demand that it not be too ambitious, too ostentatious. Every expedition of conquest required sacrifices, they themselves were veterans of many campaigns. With how much difficulty they had had to fight their way through horrible mountain ranges, through poisonous forests, through treacherous seas. Urshua calmly explained that he was scheduling the journey with the utmost austerity, ships were indispensable, soldiers had to be well fed and well armed, horses would face difficult lands. He would not bring as many dogs as to the country of the Chitareros, less than the 2,000 that Pizarro had when he went out to look for the cinnamon, but you had to bring dogs. And came the bills for the pigs, the wheat, the grains, the tools. Without a doubt, the least expensive would be the Indians, but without Indians, no campaign was impossible, because they were Bequinos in the mountain passes and knowledgeable about plants and animals, and also because they knew the languages and would help in contact with the native peoples, since it was necessary not to wear oneself down in endless battles. After three months of visits and trips, what Urshua gathered was far less than he had anticipated, but enough to pay for the first jobs. The governor knew that he could not compete with that previous expedition that had had all imaginable resources. He returned humble to the shadow of the viceroy, and he promised to give him double what they had agreed to. But the viceroy's priority now was to improve his relations with the crown. The production of the mines and all the profitable wealth had to be converted into shipments that satisfied the kings for whole months, convinced that they had efficient officials in the Indies, vigilant defenders of the royal house. And something had to save the viceroy for himself. Himself, thinking about his own future, already instructed that nothing is safe in the world, because when one is not present in the councils of Seville and Valladolid it is easy to lose the esteem of their protectors. Experience had just taught him a bitter truth, that even though he was a viceroy and a half-court relative, it was easy to become a ghost in the Indies. So, while Urshua's resources, they grew a little, they were far from what their expedition required. Life had become hard for the travelers since not only riches but promises began to run out. We were already a quarter of a century after the arrival of the first conquerors in Peru, and things had changed a lot. The men of the beginning seized lavish chambers of the dead, fortresses laminated with gold, rotten mummies who were stripped of even the last girl, but now the wealth was not in sight, 
there were no temples with relics or jeweled Indians from whom to strip necklaces, bracelets, and pectorals. Much wealth remained, but it had to be plucked with sweat and iron from the depths of the earth, from the silver ribs of the mountain. Years ago, when the emperor proclaimed the new laws to protect Indians from extermination, curses were heard throughout the mountainous area, because the time had begun when the only lasting wealth was to have Indians who bend over cultivating fertile terraces and pulling metals out of the ungrateful and parched land, in a world of crags and cliffs, of snowdrifts that the Incas looked upon with veneration and the conquerors with a mixture of greed and fear. We wouldn't have gone out looking for the cinnamon if they will still be left dead in their golden chairs with plumes of feathers and faded ceremonial robes, if the luminous walls, the temples with silver moons, the trees with golden voices were still in sight. And if the Encomenderos were enthusiastic about the mirage of this new expedition, it is because they could no longer have so many Indians at will to work in the mines. Received the viceregal license to go in search of the Golden City, and fulfill the task of recognizing and conquering for their majesties the kingdom of the Amazons, the work of recruiting soldiers was long among the vagabonds that filled the cities of Peru, which were many and evil, and that they had been the main sustenance of the rebel armies that La Gasca defeated. Urshua believed that the viceroy was supporting only his expedition, but he began to see with strangeness that at the same time sent troops in various directions, as if the threat of losing the viceroyalty had convinced him of the need to extend his dominions, leaving no stone unturned, no rock unclimbed, or the tip of the star of the wines unexplored in the crazy and urgent task of covering the territory and obtaining new wealth to distribute, to increase the income of the viceroyalty, to increase the tribute that the fleet of great galleons that every so often came out of the sea. Followed by a courtship of warships, and pursued, alas, by a pack of hostile frigates. I remember how I had investigated the situation in the Indies from the time they were pacified by La Gasca. And I was a witness that, since his appointment, he wrote a long letter to King Felipe, to tell him that the main problem in Peru was the number of idle men that accumulated in the cities. There were 8,000 men of conquest, and of them only 1,000 had property titles. The others had been staying in the Indies despite the fact that there were no longer large expeditions, no population campaigns, no positions in the bureaucracy, or jobs in the encomiendas, where there was only work, of course without pay, for Indians and slaves. He understood that this expedition that Urshua adorned with gallant gestures was a resource. Savior to get rid of adventurers. Noxious that disturbed the kingdom. If they have so much energy for evil, I heard him say one day, let them face the river and the jungle, there they will find where to squander their rebellious spirit. The viceroy was only concerned about the men of Spain that converged on the new lands as a sowing of wines, he had no time to wonder what world this was that now gave him its gold and its greatness, what mysteries lay among the scorched stones of the kingdom. And it is true that night falls before we have deciphered the lines of our hand. Kipus. The white rope is the village. The colored strings the families. The color of your family is red. From the first knot hangs the story of your dad. Your story hangs from the fourth knot. The color of your rope is green. The first rope is your years. If it's only one inch, you've died. Before turning ten in. The alpaca cycle. If you have seven you have lived all your time. The second string is your functions. From the green knot the story of your. I work in the field. Your role in the rights of the blue knot. From the red knot your inventions. The white rope of the red knot. We'll talk about songs. In the first section of work, in the. Second of memories, in the. Third of your love, in the fourth. Of suffering. None of this is true, it's just one. Figure as possible. Knots and ropes and an order are enough. Defined to represent all. Things. The fog patterns, the nuances of the. Thinking, progress. Of the poison in the blood, the songs of. The crescent moon. 14. The successive rebellions of. Gonzalo Pizarro and. 
Francisco Hernández Girón The successive rebellions of Gonzalo Pizarro and Francisco Hernández Girón had drawn many men, caused many deaths and left a bitter memory in the crown. From the court they were already beginning to see the Indies as a source of conflicts rather than as a source of wealth. For this reason, one of the objectives of the Marquis was to set up expeditions to different ends of the Viceroyalty, seeking to find new riches and dominate territories, but above all, as I have said, to free Lima and Cusico from dangerous men. Thus the expedition of 1557 to the eastern regions was armed, which did not have as much resonance as ours, but which founded populations that soon became prosperous and powerful. And even before the Omegua campaign, the Marquis's own son set out to occupy the Chilean government, and led a powerful army to defeat the Araucanian rebels. I would have to move for a moment to the very ship in which we came from Spain, with the Marquis and his court, to see how many things were brewing on that deck. One of the most memorable events of the trip was the death in the middle of the ocean of the young Captain Geronimo Alderete, who had been appointed governor of Chile. From the moment the boy lost his breath and died on the high seas, when the shadow of misfortunes and mourning covered our faces, the Marquis decided that his own son would assume that government of the southern lands. Among the court officials who came with the new viceroy there was one on the ship that I hardly tried because he was reserved and perhaps too proud, but that I later got to know better in the court of Lima. He had been a page since he was a boy to Prince Philip, and he had a passion for letters. His name was Alonso de Ursula, and I have heard from him again because he has just published in Madrid a poem in which he sings the Araucanian wars of which he was a part for two years. He participated in the outposts against the indomitable Indians, and not only met those characters who have become legend, Copalican and Lotero, great and courageous native chiefs who were defeated by our troops, but he also made them the heroes of his epic. If Castellanos then made the decision to sing in Hendeca syllables and in real octaves the voyages of Columbus, the campaigns of the Caribbean, Garay's advance on Jamaica, the conquest of Borinquen by Ponce de Leon, the conquest of Venezuela by the Germans, the Ortal and Sedano's trip through the mysterious waters that flow into the Gulf of Trinidad, the Sinu Wars, Robledo's campaign through the Cauca Canyon, Jimenez de Quesada's trip with his men along the river of Caymans, the dates of Lugo. Andagoyas travels through the Pizarro Sea, the advances of Bilal Khazar and Fetterman, the attacks of the French pirates and even our adventure under the command of Orellana along the Amazon River, it is because having known the poem Ursula said that all these events deserve to endure not only in the chronicles but also in the music of the language. Of the songs that Castellanos has composed. None moves me as much as the one he wrote to relate the journey of Urshua and the fate of the poor lovers in the jungle, abandoned by providence and suddenly surrounded by insubordination and madness. Perhaps later in this story I will include some of those stanzas, but I want to first tell you how the campaign was organized, and the difficulties in obtaining the resources, which were nothing, although we see it, compared to the difficulties that came later. If even King Philip himself and his insatiable court complained of scarce funds, what could the adventurers say in these confused overseas campaigns? Urshua walked through clubs and markets, already in the Panama's campaign had been trained to walk with thugs and rebels. They would not be the most docile soldiers but they were resistant, hard for work, brutal with the enemy, made in the open and with stale bread. It was said that lovers of comfort are not good adventurers nor do they know how to solve the serious problems of the fight with the world better to walk with strong devils than with delicate princes. I was amazed to hear these things said. Because the only one who looked like a prince in those crowds was himself, the only one who gave the impression of being refined and fragile. But it was his looks that were deceptive, and his ever-jovial heartthrob figure helped to conceive of the campaign as a joyous march, full of comforting cunning and satisfying rewards. I knew it well, at the time of the black rain and the gushing blood, no one was more resistant or tougher, more savage in combat or more brutal in revenge. Many days he was interviewing and hooking men. From the discords of Pizarro and Almagro until the pacification of La Gosca, the residual meat of the armies was left there, without glory and without reward. 
and since it is customary in this conquest that at the end of each war the adversaries are better rewarded than the allies, to ensure future loyalties, the example of La Gosca, who gave coins to the faithful defenders of the crown and ingots to the who rose up against her, was later followed by other rulers, among them, of course, the Marquis del Canet. Men escaping from prisons in Spain found a way to infiltrate the ships, and came to seek glory with the knife. One of the viceroy's old advisers said one day, undoubtedly exasperated by the revolts, that four classes of men were arriving in the Indies. There were sick people, there were crazy people, there were monsters and there were demons. Of course he was exaggerating, but to verify that he was not lying, it was enough to walk through the alleys and squares, convents did not always have better people than brothels, and Urshua was not looking for good manners or gallant finesse but for strength and recklessness, brutality and cold blood. I did not quite understand at what time my life had passed from the study of Oviedo in Hispaniola, from the cabinets of Cardinal Bimbo in Rome, from the dialogues with Tophristus in the Inns of the Alps and from my office as clerk in the halls of Spain, among chroniclers, lawyers and scribes, to fall again into the tumult of the desperate. I feel that fate called me blindly. Erasing the side roads, and I had to continue to the end, I could not find the way to turn around, to go back to the viceroy's house and ask him to allow me to continue with him in government offices, or to help me return to the clerks of the court. I continued to believe that Urshua needed me, that my experience would perhaps serve him well, I closed my eyes to the evidence that Urshua, still gallant and talkative, was becoming the leader of a troop of ruffians just when he first had the path free to follow the golden trail of that dream that had grown in him to mythological dimensions. We returned to the coastal towns, from Pura and Peta to the beaches of Juan Chaco, and Urshua reviewed his list of encomenderos whom he had to visit, now in a definitive way, in the Trujillo region. Ganads. The sea releases words that beat wings. White. White words that fly over. Words that undulate dark. Words that are nailed from heaven. That break the scales of the water. And emerge foamy carrying in the. Peaks. New shuddering words. Bleeding. 15. One afternoon, in Trujillo. While Urshua Road. Near the aqueduct. One afternoon in Trujillo, while Urshua was riding near the aqueduct, a luxurious procession crossed the cobbled street. From a sedan chair. Carried by slaves, someone asked to be called, and when Urshua approached, the voice of a woman hidden in the gloom said. How do you do, Captain? I appreciate your visit. From a few months ago. It was Inesta Atinza. I had not forgotten her. Because he felt a mixture of anger and relief, but above all he felt the change in attitude. Now she was not associating with the viceroy or with one of his envoys but with himself, and suddenly Urshua could not believe that such a beauty had gone unnoticed on the first day. He looked at her slanting eyes, her marked eyebrows, her dark, glossy hair, the Indian hair bordering the singularly beautiful face, with high cheekbones, where tempting red lips trembled. He saw her neck in the dark hair, the long hands sticking out of the silk sleeves, the breasts almost hidden under the twine. For the first time in his life he did not know what to answer, and she walked away waving her hand while the night stood stunned in the sun, in the corrosive wind of the coastline. That night he looked ill. All the apparent resentment of a few months ago had revealed her true condition. He did not know what to do to see her again, he wanted to console her for the death of her husband, he wanted to promise that he would protect her to swear the friendship of the Viceroy and all his troops. It was such an intense need that he now felt more concern and care for her than he had felt for the expedition in all the previous days. He would have wanted to see her right away, even if she was once again that hateful power that had despised him at the beginning and looked at him indifferently from her inscrutable Inca stone face. Eight days had not passed and Urshua was already in that woman's bed. Protected by the immunity that being an emissary of the Viceroy gave him, he was encouraged to visit her at her home. She gave the necessary orders to the servants, and gave herself up with the same anxiety, she, too, had been thinking of him long before she found him next to the aqueduct that her father, 
Blasta Atenza, built so that water lotuses would bloom on the parched coastlines. There was neither the ghost of the father nor the ghost of the dead husband. Now they loved each other. Frantically in her bedroom, in the living rooms, in the steam baths, it took an unprecedented effort to separate again. He began to visit her every day, he always found a pretext to cancel the appointments he had with the encomenderos and the commitments with his soldiers, he seemed not to think that he had to go back to Lima or Santa Cruz, where many people waited for the expedition to begin. In the case of Ines, the rumors were swift, due to the proximity of mourning, debauchery, envy, but she felt that Urshua was the relief that the viceroy had sent to her widowhood, the only possible consolation for a fiery woman and a young woman who had been suddenly stripped of her husband and abandoned in an immense house, in a country of wars where she only had a discord throbbing in her blood. They tried to meet discreetly, so that the neighborhood walls would not be overheard, but soon no one was unaware that Urshua and Ines de Atenza were breathing for each other. Ines couldn't believe that he had been to Peru when she was a child. He liked to do math. You were six years old when I was born, he said, and if you came to Peru when you were seventeen, I could have known you since I was eleven years old. They had been about to meet, because Viceroy Blasco Núñez de Vila passed by that house in Trujillo precisely when the girl was that age, and she remembered the boys who came with the old Viceroy with the white beard. But you were not among them, I would not have forgotten you. Urshua had never been able to see the Viceroy, but he had come to the Indies with some of the boys from his court. He remembered, or thought he remembered, that Lorenzo de Cepeda y Ahumada, the friend with whom he had crossed Spain to Seville, and who had seen by his side some old fuzzy stone bulls in the Sierra de Gritas, had spoken to him later in Lima of a little princess they had met with the Viceroy. Maybe she was making up that memory but she liked being in Urshua's memory for years. She counted on her fingers, so, when my father died, in 1546, you were already governor in Santafe, she told him. He frowned and reproached her, and when I founded Pamplona, La Nueva, in the land of the Chitareros, you were already marrying someone else. Your fault, she replied, for not showing up in time. You thought it was more important to fight wars in the land of emeralds than to come looking for me, even if you already knew of my existence. And they prolonged their encounters, spacing the kisses with stories from the early days. He asked her to tell him about his grandparents' kings, when the world was of the sun and the moon, of rivers where serpents reigned and of condors that walked through the sky. It was hard for him to believe that she was from the Atahualpa lineage and it was hard for me to believe it too when he told me. For me these figures belonged to the tale of a dead kingdom, whose golden fortresses my childhood had venerated, and it is always incredible to see the vestiges of a legend with your own eyes. He in turn told her about his adventures from the early taverns of San Sebastian. She liked stripping and stroking his chest full of old arrow and spear marks. The way he invented in the midst of the games of love to participate in those old wars was to look at and touch the scars of his battles. The imprint of a muso's spear caressed his thigh, on his left shoulder the mark left by a Tehrana arrow, enlarged by the tear left by the arrow a day later, when it was pulled out with a jerk. She would kiss each scar as he told her how he had obtained it, and then he would tell her about his father the Encomendero, about the aqueduct he had built about his lost mother who protected her at night, and again about his grandparents the gentlemen. Incas, from Huayna Capac to the great Pashacutec, while he moved his lips over her blouse and lowered the edge with his teeth so that the firm breasts of ingrown nipples appeared. It was enough for him to touch those rigid nipples with his lips for her to shudder as if a sudden wind had come through the window. He, who had always been urgent and unconcerned about anything other than frenzied copulations, lingered with her in hugs, groping, and retracting. She seemed not to want the advance of his hand to end over her smooth belly toward the mound of sleeping hair, she delighted in waiting for the moment when an insignificant touch would awaken in her one of those spasms that made her moan. And if I know, it is because at the beginning it was not enough for Urshua to live it but she had to go out and tell it, and I was the recipient of her confessions. It must be that I had bewitched you from day one, I said jokingly and he took it as a joke too. 
but it is not a lie that since when did she know? Made visible to his eyes, Urshua's luck began to stubbornly deviate in a new direction. He had started by not seeing her and very soon he would only have eyes for her. It was the clearest indication of how Urshua was only capable of indulging in a single obsession at a time, and of how passions were fought in his soul. Song of the Lover A few brief moments in the region more. Pretty. In the fiery shadow of his arms. In the forest of loves on his chest. Haunted. And centuries in the pitcher of the earth. Thirsty. A few hours looking at the truth in their eyes. In the abyss of their eyes where they look at you. The stars. And then the millennia. In the greedy prison of the earth. Thirsty. One night drinking with pupils. Anxious. Its sky constellated with legends and riddles. And ages after ages in the jungle of absences. In the ice of forgetfulness, in the well of debris. In the never again of the thirsty land. 16. I never saw him so happy. I never saw him so happy, so in love, I never knew him so sure. But underneath that security were the impatience and nervousness of someone who has seen the bird of fortune many times escape from their hands and does not quite believe that he has finally caught it. He already had more than a hundred men camping in the port of Santa Cruz, in Hualagas, where the boats were being built, and he was eloquent, smiling, more handsome and gallant than ever. He went through the busy streets and people parted in his path, we were certain that we were seeing the favorite of fortune, a captain who would soon be more famous than the Marquis Pizarro and Cortés, the wise conqueror of New Spain. Urshua was not a rustic like Pizarro, suckled by a sow, raised to notoriety for his brutalities, nor a warrior devastated by intrigue and strategy, but a knight full of merit, protected by thrones and dominations, privileged by the eloquence and the gift of command, financed by great lords, and finally cloaked with that enviable halo that is the love of a beautiful woman. Suddenly, he seemed to forget the expedition, the viceroy, his large debts, and even the winding jungle city that was his delirium. The beautiful Ines seemed to be enough treasure, with that face that had something of the intensity of the Moors but also the indecipherable distance of the Indian faces, with those large and deep eyes, the spontaneous smile drawn on her face, and the body full of secrets and promises, which exuded a perfume of flowers. Because fate plays with us. Never. Urshua had been in a better condition to undertake an adventure, more vigorous, more master of his will and his language, and never, however, did he begin to feel so far from the desire to travel, to start warlike campaigns, to ride chasing dreams after the mountains. When everything outside, the will of the viceroy, the trust of the encomenderos, the resources, converged for his expedition to make its way, at that precise moment something in his heart held him back and he no longer let him even gloat imagining the imminent conquest. When he already felt at the gates of the treasure. Dreamed of for years, a more immediate treasure and. Delectable had wrapped him in his nets, and if Juan de Castellanos were still by his side, perhaps the poet would have said that war and love were fighting over Urshua's heart, and that being equally powerful divinities, it was understandable that the, the result was invincible immobility. For a time he allowed himself to be happy, to walk with his mestizo as if intoxicated, to ride through the mountains with her, followed by trusted troops, because Peru was still a land in conquest, and every so often revolts, fires, assaults, they remembered that these were foreign kingdoms, where power was maintained by force and where it was not convenient to be neglected. The resources that Urshua had collected were all invested, but the rich estate of Ines allowed them to abandon themselves day after day to love and dreams. After the walks, the banquets, after the banquets, the long naps, and after the naps they went to the steam baths, from the baths to cooing afternoons, from there to the evening dinners with fire and music, to end in the long hugs that began to your sleepless nights. And I can understand that Urshua abandoned himself. So to pleasures, because never in his life, since his childhood in Navarra, had he been given to live so uninterested and so little vigilant. It was as if the soldier had died on those beds and tables, 
and only a lover and a child hungry for whispers and games remained. How long could that life be? Urshua sometimes wondered, and, knowing that life had to go on, he took advantage of the time, a few more days, he told himself, without worries. He justified himself by saying that in the meantime there was no negligence because the ships were already being built, but the ships were beginning to rot in inaction along the eastern rivers, that in Hualagas they were stockpiling the provisions, but the provisions were already being damaged in the warehouses, that the soldiers would be arriving by now, but the soldiers had been waiting for many days for that chief who never appeared, and the soldiers not only have to be paid when they are on the move, they have to be kept while they wait give them some trade, or even a hobby, so that your imagination and energy are not filled with idle smoke. Every day in the manor house of Trujillo. It seemed to repeat the previous one and foreshadow the following, they were conceived so that time would lose its urgency and its edge, so that no one would feel how the moon was filled or thinned in the sea in the distance over the beaches of Huan Chaco, and Ines herself, so mistress of her world, that she never neglected her affairs. She tried to delay the warrior and make things easier so that time would not be felt, so that the urgency would not come to spoil the hours of happiness, so that the claims of the world would not interrupt too soon his embrace. The serfs, Spaniards and Indians, who they worked around the house, they kept busy at it. To prevent the lords from feeling any pressure, and it was no longer possible to remember that the outside world existed when messengers began to arrive looking for Pedro de Urshua. The viceroy was among the first to know that the captain was neglecting his campaign. He received reports of fights and disorders in the camps where the soldiers were concentrated, and when he asked more in detail, he knew that they were in command of improvised chiefs, because Captain Urshua had not even appointed field marshals, nor flag bearers, and the structure and troop discipline were strangely relaxed. With the feeling that in Trujillo I was left over, I had returned to Lima, determined to wait for the captain to return to and give me instructions for the campaign. One day the viceroy called me to his office and asked about Urshua, not only because he knew of our friendship but because he had learned that instead of returning to Spain, as originally planned, after being accompanied on his arrival as viceroy in the Indies, I had decided to travel with Urshua to the jungle. I don't understand your change of course, he told me. In Spain you refused with abundant arguments to accompany me to Peru, and you spoke of your abomination in the jungle, now I see you determined to enter the same tangle that was hell just five years ago. I replied that now my gratitude to that man compromised my loyalty, and that accompanied was also a way to serve the crown. The viceroy then spoke of Urshua's delay in launching his campaign. I tried to protect him and told him that Urshua was preparing to leave. He is only collecting the last resources, what the trustees of Trujillo and Peta promised him, and I believe that he will not be long in coming back. I immediately sent a message to Trujillo, naively believing it to be the first. I did not know that the messengers arrived, first every week, then every five days, now every three to Inesta Atienza's house and that the messages accumulated in a way that could seem alarming to someone with less self-confidence than Pedro. Of Urshua. He kept telling himself that it was good to rest and get prepared. The journey would be hard and the roads dreadful. The happiness of now would be irretrievable for many months. But he was sure that starting the campaign depended only on his will. They'll see when I get there, he must have thought. It will be enough to give the order and we will begin a journey that the kingdoms will remember. He didn't realize it, but something was starting to waver on earth or heaven. Even his need to stay with Ines, how hard it was to let go of her, was like an indication that something in him was resisting his own adventure. Adverse things were beginning to be said in the neighborhood of the powers of Lima, the rumors. They ran with new vigor through the city of Trujillo and in Inessa's own house the apparent happiness of the days seemed like a more and more taut rope that was going to break at some point. Something had to happen, something had to break the glass of that spell. One day, Urshua finally saw the number of messages that had been piled up on the large black table, and noticed the frequency of the calls, the silence of the servants, something in the same behavior of Ines. 
Some shock in his love life, some claim on another issue, reminded him of the debts acquired, the people hired, the ships ordered months ago, everything that he had neglected in the sleeplessness of love. No matter how peaceful the garden is, late or early the snake enters. Ines herself woke up one day with the hymn of reality on her lips, and Urshua remembered that he was a conqueror, a man in need of wealth. He could not continue showing his mestizo throughout paradise his own home, because the refuge of love would end up looking like a prison. She, who did not intend to break the magic. He regretted having mentioned his duties, but Urshua felt that he was awakening from a dream. He realized that now he needed the jungle kingdom for more compelling reasons, he had to lay it at the woman's feet. The fabulous country of Omegua, the kingdom of the Amazons, the incalculable treasure of the hidden city of El Dorado did not yet exist, but they already had their queen. Manoa. The city already knows you are coming. Hey bang your hammers to shore. From the river. Feel the slave sweat falling on. Water. Hear the voice of the town crier announcing your name. The birds told him with a cry. Yellow. The antennas of the ants. A woman on its high wall stands. Look in a gold plate. Another prepares the stone knife of the that the blood. The city is patient and wait, do wave its tail in the pond. And if the rower wields his golden oar, it is because that canoe may be you. Grave. Immobile women feel shining. The eyes of the shamans. A red butterfly watches over the dream of the jaguar. The city has waited for you like the snake waits for the rabbit. Is full of eyes and ears. A strong tree will sprout from your chest. You were born to feed their birds. 17. First it was Urshua who asked to go with him. First, it was Urshua who asked her to go with him to Lima to respond to the viceroy's call and to attend to the demands of his men, and she began by refusing, saying that it was better for him to attend to her affairs and that she was also not sure if well received at court. We have to go to Lima, Urshua told him. Even for a short time, to attend to pending matters. You know that the women of the Encomenderos hate me, she said. They envy you, rather, said Urshua, but it has also been decided that you will be my wife and it is better that people, even in the viceroy's court, get used to the idea of seeing us together. In part he was right. To the viceroy, encouraged by seeing him appear, he would not be bothered by that romance that seemed to end the duel of the offended woman and close to the affections of the viceregal house. It dispelled the first cloud that had formed under his rule. Urshua went, then, with Ines to the city of the Reyes de Lima, and the viceroy took the opportunity to invite them to his home and offer a welcome dinner, which was actually a discreet banquet of redress. Everything happened in a ceremonious and peaceful way, and the tragic event that they had experienced months before was not mentioned. The dead husband was buried in the mist, and the murderous nephew was not mentioned or the punishment he had received. She only seemed to have eyes and ears for Urshua, who showed off her charms, her memory of thousands of deeds, and mentioned with renewed enthusiasm the preparations for the trip. What they did not expect and loved. Gentlemen was that Ines squandered simplicity and courtesy. They discovered that she was used to the stately life, although she tried to keep her distance, because she knew well that the first passion she used to arouse was envy. The ladies on the other hand did not appreciate it. Because his cinnamon skin, his long and abundant black hair, the wide cheekbones of the royal family, related his origin. She's an Indian woman, I heard Dona Teresa, the viceroy's wife, say one afternoon. You are wrong, replied the Marquis, she is the daughter of Blasta Atenza, who was a trustee and a trusted man of Viceroy Blasco Nunez de Vila, and has inherited a fortune from him. But his mother had no name, she replied, and the captain should find a woman who suits him better. The Indians also distrusted Ines, them. He seemed too arrogant, too remote to truly belong to his race. She was a rich woman, that is to say, free and alone, 
and that was not often in the city or in the kingdom. The early death of her father, since her mother did not know, as the rumors said, no one ever anything, and the confused death of her husband, had left her without direction and without restraint. And other people in the viceroy's own house murmured resentfully, she's a whore. Maybe everything is directed. Sometimes I think that even without the embassy of apologies that the viceroy entrusted to Urshua, they would still have found each other, it was difficult that this luxurious female did not end up in the arms of Pedro de Urshua, the best male in energy and command of the whole kingdom, whom everyone saw admired with his noble garments, his long knee-high boots to walk through the cobblestones of Lima, his linen shirts and jackets, his silver necklaces, his black alpaca ruanas and his hat of a hunter who used to wear when he did not have the conqueror's crested helmet on his head, with that natural stamp upset or enhanced by the traces of war. It was splendid to see them both, beautiful and ostentatious of their fortune, strolling through the squares of the luxurious city that grew, gazing together at the sea from the parched ravines, or, when they were apart, searching incessantly with their eyes in the midst of the crowds of the cathedral. He would have abandoned himself to delight, but just as some of us viewed his adventures with joy, many in Lima continued to see badly that relationship that had not been blessed by the church, the viceroy's wife crossed herself more and more often, to warn her husband to beware of such aberrations, the scandal formed clouds under the sky of the city, and sometimes the lovers preferred to go out, each by their own side, to meet in remote and safe places, to be able to love each other as they pleased. There was no lack of safe cliffs in front of immense landscapes, the forests with streams, the high passes of the mountains where, after leaving the vigilant guard, they could be together under the sole gaze of the snow peaks. The waiting and the delays had reached the extreme. It seemed to me that Ines had managed to overcome her love fever, that she had finally understood that it was the governor's duty to go off to adventure and war, and that she was determined to wait as long as necessary. But it did not happen that way. Although it was she who had reminded him of the duty and had awakened him to the need to finally set out, he soon realized that he was unable to bear his absence, and one afternoon, after a long intense silence, asked him to take her away. He, who had already thought about it and had discarded, he was startled by the proposal. He told her with conviction that that would be crazy. I will feel much calmer if I know that you are in Trujillo, preparing our future. Your memory will make it easier for me, and more urgent, to discover and conquer, triumph and return. But she found more and more arguments. It will be many months of travel, my presence could help you advance through the jungles, for you it will be better to rest in my arms from the tasks of command and navigation. Someone, perhaps Urshua's own cousin. Diaz de Alls, who came with him from Navarra and accompanied him day after day in the new kingdom of Granada, had told Ines de Zibali, the Indian lover that Urshua had in Santafe. Because also to his cousin like me, in the midst of his lively stories, Urshua spoke of the devotion of that beautiful Indian woman who prayed to him when she embarked on her campaigns, who put dry frogs and bundles of herbs and haunted stones in her saddlebags, who he scented his bed of wild leaves, and he knew how to love like squirrels and salamanders. Ines maybe she really wanted to accompany him and comfort him, but he was also afraid that Urshua he will find some other consolation along the way. He went to extreme lengths to convince her to stay, but it was clear that he was mostly trying to convince himself. There could be no greater temptation than to go on that arduous and ungrateful campaign, accompanied by his goddess, and put a flash of magic and a sting of pleasure in the rudeness of the outposts through the jungle and the river. She was disturbed in another way by the history of female warriors. Wouldn't Urshua find the queen of the Amazons herself on his journey? Wouldn't he perhaps end up falling in love with her in the thick of the jungle? Or, even if he did not fall in love, would he not perhaps be captured like the males of the Indian villages by those greedy women, to be her man and her stallion? He was careful to say these things, but he insisted more vehemently, and Urshua refused with increasing energy. He preferred to confess that the campaign was not as well financed as he wanted, and that under those conditions he had no way to give her the comforts she required. 
Some brutal men, accustomed to the weather and starvation, could accommodate themselves in any way in medium brigantines and in flats exposed to arrows, but a woman like her could not be clad in iron like any captain of conquest. Needed proper tense, easement. Vigilant. If her place was not the viceregal court, it had to be her home in Trujillo, where she was used to care and delicacies, roast leg of lamb with garlic and vinegar on beds of quinoa, tubers of all colors, suckers of marine fish and seafood, where he used to take his balsamic baths, his pitchers with herbal vapors, his tapestries of thick wool with drawings of the mountains, the continuous murmur of the servants in the patios, shelling ears and drying seeds, and the morning bleeding of the herds. She replied that although she was a lady, Spanish was also the daughter of natives of the mountain range, that her family had not been sitting at the harpsichord for centuries but had traveled the territory, from the salt deserts to the corn valleys that grow under fences of snow, that Urshua was more than she a stranger in those mountains and rivers, she would know how to show resistance to hardships and, if necessary, bravery in combat. And it was extended in legends of his elders that he had received from the lips of the old Indian women, how the Koyas and the Mamas had domesticated the mountains, fertilized the terraces, and had taught the peoples to weave and cultivate. Urshua was beginning to feel like the founder of a lineage that would have from the Europeans the industry and from the old Incas the wisdom. It was even said that perhaps what had made the expeditions savage, and the conquests brutal and bloody, was the absence of women who put another accent on contact with the native populations. But Ines warned in the last excuses of Urshua the crevice through which it could leak. Definitely on the expedition. After a new silence that they had made, as if to regain strength, suddenly she turned to look at him and said, I can sell my farms. With the resources that we will obtain for them, you will have what you need for the campaign. But the condition is that you take me with you. I do not ask for any other comfort than to accompany you, share your tent and eat from your plate if necessary, but with these resources you will be able to take me and my maids, and you will greatly improve the conditions of the expedition. It was the shot of grace. Urshua tried to dissuade her but her arguments sounded weaker and weaker. Now he not only had the consolation of going with her, of not abandoning her in the dangerous solitude of Trujillo, but he was suddenly finding the resources that would undoubtedly make his expedition triumphant. What he needed were no longer arguments but just pretexts. He was soon convinced that this was the better alternative. Passion made its way, but his practical sense also saw advantages in that promise. He would be in charge of selling the estates himself although not all of them, since a reserve had to be left, and he soon felt more secure than ever of the great treasure that was waiting for him. Ines would travel as a powerful partner on the expedition. You will not regret having invested in it, he said, your wealth will be multiplied with the discovery of the kingdoms of Omegua. And, back to shore, to fix their matters, and already as a starting point for the, the expedition, which would depart from the north, along the Trujillo and Shanchan route, from the morning plains of Cajamarca and through the Cocama River Canyon, explained in detail how he had convinced himself that a great city of gold was waiting for them in the jungles. Ants. Through the sky the star through the jungle. Ant. They attend the commands of light and. Hunger. They will never obey different laws. Through the jungle the star. By the sky the ant. 18. I'm going to tell you how he is. World what are we going to? Conquer. I'm going to tell you what the world is like. Conquer, he said. The first thing that caught my attention was the story of the conquerors, who told me. Cristobal on the beaches of Panama, according to which the city of gold, Cusico, was shaped like a jaguar on the mountain. Why did a city have to look like an animal? Araman, an Indian who was my friend in the New Kingdom, told me that each region has its protector, and that in the Middle Lands the jaguar rules. Everywhere I have realized that the jaguar is the god of these peoples. When a chief is really a chief, or he is covered with a tiger's skin, or has a collar of fangs, or his skin is painted with spots, and when he dances, he dances with feline movements. 
I remember some natives we met in the Valley of the Fools, when we founded the new Pamplona. They came painted red, twisting their bodies and looking with such ferocity that our soldiers laughed at first, feeling that they were all crazy, but I told them no, that it was a war dance, that we saw them as Indians but they were they looked like jaguars. And he had not finished saying this when a shower of arrows came against us from behind the human jaguars. Then one morning, I heard an Indian say that in the snowy mountains is the city of the gods above. At first I thought that this meant glaciers and frozen cliffs, but then I understood that there is a real city, another city of gold, shaped like a condor, hidden high up in the mountains. He would have gone looking for her, but there are places where only the Indians can go. One day in Santa Marta we reached the first terraces of the stone cities of the Tairanas, in the Sierra Nevada that is near the sea. They say that they are cities that hear travelers coming from afar, cities that think and feel, and if those disturbed me, I am even more amazed by these that the Incas made here, staggering terraces on the mountain walls and carving the abyss. Height does not make them dizzy or vertical paths tire them. Chewing their green jungle they can climb and climb with an immense bundle on their backs, day after day, and surely only they will be able to reach that city of the condor that they have hidden in the snowdrifts and in the fog. But going through the ruins of the cities, old, by the burned stones of Kuziko and by the banks of the rivers, I began to see the drawing of a three-step staircase that is everywhere. You have told me that you do not know its meaning. But Castellanos taught me that here all things have meaning that what seem like capricious drawings are more like maps and emblems. I remembered that Zibali, a Cumanagata that I met in Santafe, always put in my backpack a feather, a tusk, and a bell. At first I thought it was one of her childish witchcraft, which only made me laugh, but she explained that the feather would protect me in the highlands, in the moors and in the fog, the tusk in the middle lands, in the guajules and solar forests, and the rattlesnake in the lands below where the alligators and rivers are and where the heat dulls the will. It was by associating these things that I understood the meaning of the three steps, the lands below, the lands in the middle and the lands above. If there is a city of gold in the shape of a condor, between the snow, and a jaguar-shaped city of gold in the midlands, there must be a snake-shaped city of gold down in the jungles. Now I am convinced of it. It is the city of Manoa of which Castellanos spoke to me in Mompox before the immense trees full of iguanas. They say that only a white man has seen it and has been able to tell it, Juan Martin de Albujar, who knew medicine and was held hostage by the Indians, who took him there to cure their king. He escaped in a canoe at night, drifting through pipes and water channels, and he never knew how to give an account of the course he had followed. Perhaps what Castellanos was telling were inventions of travelers, because he spoke of palaces, of boats whose oars had gold handles, of gold statues of animals, as well made as the figures of the tombs, but enormous, adorning the ends of the buildings. Now I know what the Amazons protect down there. That is why they do not allow men in the region, that is why they have a kingdom only of women and abundant in wealth that no living man will have seen because everyone who is allowed to Vado may first receive all the pleasure in the world but later he will lose hands and mouth so that he never counts what he wants. Saw. So, Orellana could barely foresee what they were going. Leaving behind by the banks of the river, the mysterious kingdoms that were beyond the villages, and I feel indications of this when they mention the sounds of the drums muffled by the jungle, the gold ornaments of the Indians who are near the Amazons the replicas in clay and in wood that the river towns have of the objects they use in their hidden city. Now you know the secret, there is a golden city in the shape of a snake in the heart of the jungle, in Tupinamba, in Omegua, in the meanders of the river or next to the interior lagoons. A sister city to those found by Hernan Cortez in Mexico, equally full of riches but also frightening sacrificial altars, adorned with men's skulls, a wild and terrible world that we are going to conquer for Spain, for His Majesty King Felipe and for the Holy Church. That is why the Cardinals of Rome were so amazed with Cristobal's story, the cities of women are a legend that nobody could find, but here there is still talk of the virgins of the sun, you also know those stories of maidens kept in stone cities. I tell you about more hidden things, 
and only one. An expedition like ours can find the country of Omegua, the Golden City and the Kingdom of the Amazons. That's how Urshua must have told Ines, because that's how she told it to me in the days before she fell in love. And if I dare to think that he mentioned the Indian Zibali, without telling her very well what relationship he had had with her, it is because I know that he liked to make her jealous and make her feel the strangeness of the worlds she had travelled. And if I dare to think that she mentioned me in her story, it is because more than one Ines told me that Urshua spoke to her about me and my adventures to give strength to her affirmations. On the other hand, I am sure that he did not mention Teresa de Penalver, with whom he had liked Manoa's story in the loving shadow of the Sabas of Mompox, because I know that Teresa would have disturbed Ines. Teresa existed, she was in Santafe, and she couldn't have forgotten Urshua because she had a daughter of hers. He believed he had discovered the existence of the three cities, but it was I myself who told him about them, although only trying to counteract his obsession. You always talk to me again, I told him in Panama, as if the moon had driven you crazy, of that city of gold that you have raved about since you were a child, a golden condor in the snow, a golden jaguar in the valleys, or a golden serpent down in the jungle. From that conversation he forged his legend, he forgot that I had told him, and above all he forgot that it was nothing more than a reproach to his stubbornness and madness. Ines listened to the theme of the golden serpent that they were going to capture with the same devotion with which she had heard Urshua tell the story of the wars that filled him with scars. She had grown up as a Spanish princess and belonged like me to the Order of the Conquerors, but something in the gloom of her house initiated her into other legends of her blood, he kept something from the wild world even though he lived far from the jungle and the river. Because of her Spanish blood, because of her Inca silences, and because of her status as a rich and luxurious woman, she looked at the jungle with suspicion. He did not know what to think of those cities of naked and cruel women, who mated with prisoners and then handed them over to the knife and fire. At times he wanted to stay in the house of Trujillo, away from those disturbing worlds, but immediately he imagined Urshua in the embrace of the Queen of the Amazons, or under her knives, and he was tormented, and felt capable of taking the sword and the sword. Crossbow, expose her body to battles and participate in river wars to preserve her man, and with greater energy she wanted to go on the expedition, to be the founder and queen of the wild country. Three cities one green, one reddish, one white. A snake, a cougar, a condor. The sinuous, the cautious, the slight. One of trees, one of gold, one of ice. One that flows, one that remains, one that flies. One full of birds, one full of flames, one full of spirits. One hot, one cool one cold. A living, a sleeping, a forgotten. One who feels, one who thinks, one. What dreams? One of travelers, one of cultivators. One of wise men. One that has always been, one that now is, one that always waiting. The house of the earth, the terrace of the sun. The balcony of the moon. One of water, one of stone, one of snow. The extended one, the fixed one, the ungraspable one. 19. If something you did not guess is that. The greatest danger they would take. On their own ships. If something they did not guess is that the greatest danger would take him in their own boats. Ines quickly sold estates and slaves, keeping the people that the expedition demanded the servitude that her own care required, and she prepared that trip with the necessary neatness. Thirty years ago his blood had been stripped of the splendor of an empire, but had entered the style, more arrogant and demanding, of the caste of the new masters. I, who once could look at her with desire, who always looked at her with astonishment, could never have looked at her with love. If he compared her to Amini, he could feel the the difference between an Indian who gave everything, even her pride, simply out of loving devotion, and a woman whose love never made her lose her sense of ambition. His lavish presence on the ships was going to contrast badly with the brutal troop Urshua was hitching. 
friends in the viceregal court warned from the beginning that this mixture was more dangerous than the rum with gunpowder that the Sarmentian pirates of the Antilles prepare on their ships, and some of them wanted to move Urshua to prudence. There was in Peru an old man named Pedro de Anasco who should not be confused with another Pedro de Anasco, the cruel one, who many years before founded the town of Timana in the Yalcanese region, nor with his first cousin, who was also called Pedro de Anasco, and that he captured the chief of men Timaneco, the Gaetanus son, and burned him alive before the shocked eyes of his mother, for not having responded promptly to his call. Everyone remembers in the sources of the Yuma, which today we call the Magdalena River, how that conqueror took Timaneco prisoner, who was eighteen years old, and before the fishmen and in the sight of his mother subjected him to torment, until when the young man, who was strong and kind and destined to be king, was turned into a bloody coal. La Gaetana, a brave and powerful woman. She indignantly traveled the lands of the Yalcanes, from the lagoons where the rivers are born, through the canyon of vertical forests where the mountain range is separate, next to the abysses where the stone faces watch successive waterfalls fall, and through the valleys and hills of Saba trees and of Cha Cha Frutas, of Chakaras plants and jungles of Akaba and Cambulos, and he called out to the insurrection. Supported by Chief Pigo and Zah gathered under his. He commanded a troop of six thousand Indian warriors and launched himself against the Spanish. You have to know what the Gaetana did to. Understand how far the fury of a woman from these jungles can reach, because she advanced with thousands of naked men armed with arrows and spears and clubs, and when she was repelled by the enemies, she again traveled the lands summoning Timanes and Pyramas, Guanacas, and Pieces, and Aquis and Pijaos, and gathered more than twelve thousand warriors to avenge his son and exterminate the invaders. Although they were ritually going on their campaign, Fishmen and deer men, taper men and bird men, and behind with their feather tiaras the children of light, and walking among them with spells and basins, with seeds and bells the priests of the jaguar, with threatening necklaces of fangs, covered with yellow skins full of spots, and the nephews of the hummingbird and the grandsons of the wind, and choirs of daughters of the trout that accompanied the army singing curses and bringing the cassava and the sacrificial jugs to cook the hearts of the dead demons and stone knives carved with slabs from the headwaters of the river, who know the water of the eddies and are the only ones who can carry out the great punishments, he obtained permission from the shamans for the Indians to use metal things taken from the Spaniards, and there for the first time in the Indies a native army used against the Spaniards many swords from Spain. And the Gaetana commanded that army in fierce battles until she found the evil Pedro de Anasco in you. Everyone knows that the Kasika herself made her way through the troops and seized Captain Anasco with her hands, and when she had him alone and alive among the corpses of many Spaniards, surrounded by the multitude of Indians, she broke his eyes, he had his throat pierced under his chin, and he passed a noose that came out of his mouth and led him unbowed to his procession through all the peoples. With the sharpest knife of the river cliffs that woman worked her revenge, and Anasco the cruel, numb and bleeding, was dragged to death through all the lands that were to be the boy's kingdom, so that even the stones and the trees will remember the torment. In vain Wanda Ampudia, who had been born in Harasta La Frontera, who was in Nicaragua with Bilal Kazar and in Panama with Balboa and in Cajamarca with Pizarro and with my father and with Blasta Atenza, later came to pacify those enraged peoples, in a great battle he died with his neck pierced by an Indian spear and his men made the waters of the river a tomb. La Gaetana was not satisfied with the revenge he had achieved on Pedro de Anasco, and later gathered more than 20,000 Indians, and expelled for years the conquerors of their valleys of Sabales and the knot of mountains of the Andaquis, those who came from the jungle, those who speak the languages of the river, the Tinigua, the Kamsa, and the Kofan, those who know the secret of the Andaki vine which opens its eyes to see the night, and which discovers and frees those who are hidden in the stones. But the Pedro de Anasco of Peru was instead a quiet man, a great host and a great friend. He had a hacienda near the coast, and had lived many adventures of conquest before declaring himself satisfied and retiring, in the shadow of colonial power, to see how these kingdoms were consolidated with the advance of trade and war. His occupation was silver from the mines where many men dug for him, 
and trade with Seville and Genoa, where he sent ships from his fleet. He had contributed some amount to the expedition, but he was above all a friend of Urshua, and in that condition he tried to intervene at two different moments in the preparations for our adventure. Before departure, Urshua himself showed me a letter that this faithful Pedro de Anisco had sent him, trying to dissuade him from taking Dona Ines to the campaign. With calm loyalty and clear arguments, Anisco told him that what was going to happen did not depend on the virtuous or licentious attitude of the lady, nor on the quality of the soldiers, but on the very conditions of the expedition, and that it would not be possible to prevent bad results. Urshua felt above all. Circumstance. After all, he told me, he was not just any adventurer, but in Spain itself a gentleman of great lineage, and in Navarre the princes enforce their ladies and servants never even dare to look at them. Master Pedro de Anisco would see that those dangers did not exist for him, it is enough to know how to command to deserve and obtain obedience. Anisco in turn told himself that the governor might be right thinking of the common Spanish soldiers, who knew about savagery but also moderation, who were capable of destroying a world but still respected centuries-old codes of honor. Then he thought that maybe it would be easier to get Urshua to take only the best on his adventure, or, to be more exact, to stop taking the worst, of whom he knew well some names and some backgrounds. Peru had just gone through enough. Riots to find out what to expect regarding certain troublemakers and wrongdoers. He sent Urshua a second letter, proposing to unhook ten of the men he was carrying, they could be more, but stopping those ten would be the wisest thing to do. If he agreed to leave them at his command on some pretext, he would himself be responsible for paying them a salary for several months, and the expedition would be safe from their disorders. These waves also collided with the rock. Urshua was unshakable, already more out of stubbornness than out of confidence. He felt that if he had been inflexible in the case of Ines, now he had to make Anisco feel that he was a confident captain, not afraid to face the difficulties of the journey and the natural risks of the adventure. If he had felt confident in something, it was always from his subordinates. Only once had he feared, right in the land of the Magdalena Panches, that there was a treacherous sword among their ranks, but then everything was resolved in a satisfactory way because the sword that killed his men was in an enemy mahogany hand. From the adversary he could expect treachery and baseness, perhaps because the adversary could be expected of him, but from men subject to his command only devotion and obedience could be expected. He also rejected this letter, faced with the dangers announced, he smiled with all his teeth, and abandoned himself to the feverish tasks of the initiation of the journey. Courtship The fishmen and the men rise dear. The taper men go up and the men. Bird. They come with their feather headbands. Children of light, and they come between. They with spells and bowls. With seeds and bells they. Priests of the jaguar. With their menacing necklaces of. Fangs. They pass covered in yellow fur. Full of spots. And the nephews of the hummingbird and they. Grandchildren of the wind and the choirs of daughters of trout who follow the men singing curses and bringing the kasabi and bringing the sacrificial jars to cook the hearts of the dead demons come with stone knives carved with slabs of the headwaters of the river knives that know the water of the swirls and they are the only ones who can act great punishments 20. When he found the beautiful Ines in her mansion in Trujillo. When he found the beautiful Ines in her mansion in Trujillo, Urshua had already perpetrated cruelties, always tempered by the argument of war. He had betrayed the Musos in the middle of the peace festival, but he could tell himself that he was doing it to ensure the peace of the kingdom, he had poisoned the Maroons of Panama at the banquet of the Alliance but he tried to justify himself by trickingly arguing that the rebellious blacks kept the isthmus in distress, that many good people, industrious and respectful of God, were in danger, that order the precarious of the Indies was threatened by these sacrilegious rebellions. Each one of those outrages was softening his conscience, 
it made him permissive with himself, and one day he could believe that it was enough that others did not see things for them to lose gravity. It is true that war debases, and those who go to it out of necessity, defending their honor, may end up making a blind instrument of survival a habit, turning into a profession what could only be argued as a momentary resource. The betrayal, the poison, the trap, at the beginning are only instruments, at what moment do we become their instruments? I have to say it again, already in Panama. Urshua had been forced to resort to brutal soldiers, convicts, outlaws. Accustomed to deception and crime, they were the available people and the war forced him to use them. But what had been imposed on him in Panama, later in Peru it became customary. It was clearly said that dominating the jungle required men, more than strong, brutal, that the situation made it necessary to recruit men willing to do anything, hopefully unscrupulous, and in that troop of 800 men that Urshua was hooking up over the months, a cream of vices and fickles was thickening. They were the sinkhole of conquest. Resentful, infamous, foolish, and cruel men, who had betrayed more than one cause, who adjusted their behavior to need or appetite. A showy gallery of scoundrels stood out on the horizon of mediocrity of the soldiery, someone who observed from the outside could feel that there were only wicked and servile, seventy years of cruelty and postponement resolved in a mercenary troop with almost no thirst for glory and with no other ambition than robbery. Courteous in the bestial palaces of Tenochtitlan and Pizarro in the massacre of Cajamarca, Alvarado in the Antillean mines and Valdivia in the violent literals, Garay in the plantations of Jamaica and Ponce de Leon in the wars of Borinquen, Ortal, and Sedano in the lost ships of Trinidad, Heredia in the looting of the gold tombs and Balalcazar in the violent cliffs of Quito, Ambrosio Alfinger in the beheadings of the Yupar Valley and Jimenez de Quesada here, above, in the stoning of Guali and in the burned-out fortress of Santa. Agueda, were nevertheless subject to, to a law and subject to a minimum order. Urshua himself never took a step without prior authorization of their leaders, but this conquest, laborious in cruelty and long exercised in licenses, could not fail to engender more membranous creatures, and those same brave and obedient sons of God and servants of the Emperor were undermining the divine prestige and the royal dignity. Gonzalo Pizarro and the Demon of the Andes, on the perfidious scaffolds of Lima, had already begun the age of great rebellions. At the gates of the jungle it is finally verified that the hooks of the law are small and clumsy, that the instruments of power are unskillful. The flow of rivers is not answered with decrees and before the jaws of the great serpent, neither iron nor gunpowder are resources. Violence has been the hammer and chisel of this conquest, but a point is reached where violence can no longer do anything, every assault awakens an avalanche, every wound returns a disease, every crime begins a prodigious annihilation, the responses of the gods are not modulated with common words, and the fury of humans ends up turning against itself. I admired him so much that I never expected. See Urshua committing a robbery today, tomorrow an outrage, the day after tomorrow a crime, and when I saw those things I understood that his actions were already the revenge of the jungle, that his own campaign was beginning to sink into madness, and that other follies were they would detach from that one. At what point does an adventure begin? Become a crime? At what point does the hero becomes bandit? How does a crusade full of ideals fall into a carnage? At this point I would like to tell something that, when I found out, already going through the jungle, made me begin to look at Urshua with less sympathy. I had become friends with one of the men who were with him in the war against the Maroons in Panama, and he, who was called Juan Martin, a loyal and righteous man whom Aguirre later killed with his bare hands, told me how it had been the punishment of a group of blacks from Bayano, of those who had risen up against their masters in Veragua. Once defeated and taken prisoner, six of them were sentenced to the most cruel death that one can imagine. They were taken naked to a central post from which ropes with steel necklaces emerged, they put metal rings on their necks, they left thin rods in their hands, and they ordered them to abandon the cult they claimed to profess to their lost African gods. Since one of those men had been appointed by the other priest or bishop of that cult, not only did they not accept to regret their rebellion or denying their gods and their ceremonies, 
but they replied that they were anxious to die, and that once they were dead they would go to their homeland and bring so many people and power from there that they would take on the cruelty of their enemies. Then the executioners unleashed against them a herd of large and hungry mastiffs, trained to attack human beings, and the animals made a horrendous slaughter of the captives, who tried to defend themselves with the rods that they had in their hands, without knowing that the Christians were them. They had given knowing that this useless defense only served to further inflame the beasts. I remembered the Holocaust that Gonzalo Pizarro perpetrated with the Indians in the jungle, and I was grateful again not to have had to witness such a savage ordeal, because the Maroons could not help but defend themselves while their flesh was torn, trapped in this way by the neck while they were being eaten in life. And perhaps I am only writing this to have a place to confess that I felt an immense admiration for the courage with which those rebels were able to endure such torment without backing down or asking for forgiveness or clemency, firm in that faith of their lost land, which they celebrated in the jungle with dances and songs in an indecipherable language. A ferment of ancient rebellions, of dark inherited injustices, seemed to boil in my veins at these stories, and when Juan Martin added that the Maroons dying after the punishment were still led to hang in the forest trees, I felt that they could not be men but demons who were capable of inflicting such monstrous punishments. Martin did not tell me that it had been Urshua. Whoever ordered carried out the torture, but I knew very well that he was the leader of that campaign, and that no decision could have been made without his consent. Hell was made in my soul, because it was thanks to my intervention that Urshua was able to access the Viceroy and become the Dark Peacemaker. The blood of those Maroons came to cover me like a stain, and although those evils were not in my intentions, Urshua's behavior began to seem unjustifiable. Cruelty to poor slaves already beaten seemed to me as unnecessary as it was impious and to think that at the end of his life it was mulattoes and blacks who most generously tried to save him. Years before, I had met Father Vittoria in Madrid. I looked for him, attracted by his fame, and moved by the gratitude of knowing that another Spaniard of the time had been able to feel the same thing that I felt in the cinnamon campaign, when I saw the red herbs, the stained snouts and the dogs inflamed by the smell of blood. I already carried on my soul the blood that my father had shed but also the discomfort, the disgust of those afternoons in the jungle, when I understood that this death routine had not been made for me, and I was moved when Father Vittoria told me that his blood had frozen in his veins when he learned that the sons of Spain had been able to assassinate in an afternoon in Cajamarca that exquisite court of princes and hierarchs of an empire that all references showed him as a kingdom of civility. And of job. Because, as anyone who reads these memoirs carefully will notice, there is nothing that has marked me as much as that atrocious afternoon and that lake of blood that seemed to gaze at the stars. Even Urshua felt disgust at my account of the massacres, and that was harder for me to understand. If he had been so ferocious with the Maroons, if we already had clear news that he had been extremely cruel with the Musos and Tehranas in the New Kingdom of Granada, could he be believed in his sincerity when he rejected those facts? For me war authorizes everything. Answered. The war is for us to face and may the best man win, and in the middle of a battle I never hesitated to kill or to use every resource to survive. But I despise the one who takes advantage of the weakness of others. I would never kill someone unarmed, that can only be the executioner's task, I prefer to give my sword to the adversary even though I must fight with an ash cane, rather than feel that I did not win him loyally. But in any war with Indians, I told him, they are at a disadvantage. Perhaps because of their resources, but they are many more than us, he replied. And I have always fought to defeat them, not to annihilate them. No one will accuse me of having fired cannons at defenseless Indians, or of having taken advantage of their rituals and ceremonies to take them treacherously. And he added in an unsettling tone, nothing I despise as much as betrayal. But I have heard of the way in which Urshua defeated the Musos in the lands of Boyaca. It is said that after having made the alliance, having complimented them with gifts and hugs to speak of peace, he attracted the chiefs to some close neighbors, and that there all the principals were slaughtered. At first I could not believe it, because I remembered those words of the captain. Now I know that war makes deceptive. Men, who makes things acceptable to them. Claim to never tolerate, 
and that this long conquest is lived as a state of permanent stalking, where any carelessness must be taken advantage of, where any trick is a providential instrument, where no one can stop to think if their action is fair and if their violence is legitimate, because those minutes of hesitation can mean death. The Fountain Water with Fire Secret River Message that goes away over the kingdoms Blue sap from the trees of heaven Hidden jungle drum Climbing plant Dream ant Pitcher of the lonely night Liquor of those who fly in the shadow Sea full of words son of the blind Mother of the blinking stars Jewel of the brave Blood Blood 21 the five wars that had freed they never altered their prudence. The five wars he had never fought. They altered his prudence, but what the war could not do now, love was trying. There was a month left to start the journey when the rumor spread through the camp that Urshua would take Dona Ines de Atenza with him. The fact could be foreseen, given the attention he paid to her, but anyone in their right mind would have ruled it out. To the unknown risks of the trip it was convenient to add the well-known marksmanship of the Indians, the accidents of the river and the inclement weather, but also a reason that was obvious to anyone, except perhaps a madman in love, the danger of putting a woman beautiful in the middle of an expedition of brutal men. They all wondered if he forced her to accompany him or if she did not want to leave him alone. It would have been strange for him to convince her. To invest in the expedition, more amazing. It turned out that the initiative was hers. Men are always ready to give their blood and gold for promises, to invest massive amounts in illusions and empires of smoke, but women know how to be more cautious in spending. Ines was a notable administrator of her estates, and before marriage she had increased her own inheritance. At the time of selling the properties, Urshua asked him how the loot from the sacking of Kuziko had been distributed and Ines replied that the part that had corresponded to Blasta Atenza was identical to that received by his partner Geronimo Aliaga, 333 marks of good silver and 8,888 gold pesos. What a revelation for me, if that was what Pizarro's men had received, that was the fortune that my father could not achieve before a sinkhole in a Peruvian mine fell on him. So I came to find out how much was the part of my inheritance that the Pizarros spent on their trip. 333 marks of good silver and 8,888 pesos of gold, this is what I invested without knowing it in the Orellana expedition, I repeated to myself, as if feeling that this altered my past and the meaning of my trip. Furthermore, the strange symmetry of those figures made them more unreal, they cascaded through my nightmares, voices from the jungle shouted at me that on that trip down the river I had not only lost my mother and my youth, but also my future and I woke up only to see that my life was still imprisoned in the bars of that phantom gold. Blasta Atenza was one of the few men. Loyalists who were benefited when La Casca pacified the kingdom, but received gold, silver, and death almost at the same time, so arbitrary is fate. Death, which worked incessantly against me, always worked for Ines, the water in Blasta Atenza's lungs gave her a large estate with the orphan, and a larger estate brought her the harquebus or the dagger that left her a widow when Pedro de Arcos, a man not very sweet but loving with her and considerably wealthy, went to sleep like an Inca in the pots of the earth. Everything seemed to have been done for her. The mountain udders nourished her, the gifts of the kingdom filled her, the Indians served her, the whites envied her, and then Urshua loved her to exhaustion, the jungles looked at her in amazement and the armies coveted her. But life is like a river tumbling in. The night. I, who never saw the face of wealth, I still hear the song of the blackbird in the mornings, I still hear the summer wind sounding in the groves of the Magdalena Valley, next to the dry mountains that the vipers guard, and instead the in love Urshua and Ines, spoiled by all powers, have long whispered under the roots and there are no Latin letters on their graves. All those things had an end, and the end was this story. It was necessary for me to leave Hispaniola and go into the jungle with Pizarro, it was necessary that the first feat of the nephew of the Marquis del Canet was to kill the husband, leaving Dona Ines in the prime of her age, more beautiful than rolling waters, more desirable than trustworthy cinnamon, 
and in possession of a double fortune, it was necessary for Urshua to appear, and for the two to no longer be able to detach themselves, because the story demanded it. And I am the one who loves the story it tells but at the same time regrets that it happened and regrets having to tell it. In truth, there is no memorable story that has not cost a lot of human pain, but it is also true that pain is constant rain in this world, and it does not always leave stories worth telling. Urshua, tireless hunter of elusive treasures, did not realize that fate had placed in his hands a true treasure, the earthly garden with the goddess in its center, among the palm trees. He saw all that bliss as just a moment on his way to the promised city, and she spent hours and kisses convincing him to invest his estates in the expedition, and forcing him to promise to take her. After five wars, Urshua felt invincible. He had seen so closely Haradia's campaigns through the country of the Golden Tombs and of Bilal Khazar in the Lily Valley, where ancient craftsmen made perfect hives of bees and grash hoppers out of fine gold, he had seen the mistakes of Gonzalo Pizarro and the follies of Hernandez Giron, he knew so well the providences of La Gasca and the filigree of his own uncle, he knew so much about the art of defeating naked peoples with swords and dogs, cannons and spears, poisons and treachery, that he ended up thinking that his destiny was that of Caesar. A kingdom awaited him, and he too would carry an exotic queen on his galleys, and the jungle would bow its plumage before the happy boats of his campaign. While selling his estates, he tried. Tell him again in every tone that he could not carry her, the expedition was a man's affair, the dangers of the road demanded strength, endurance and brutality. Swamps and snakes awaited them, voracious webs of ants, rivers with carnivorous fish, spiked soils, trees whose touch poisons, unhealthy rains, poisonous darts, plant caverns full of spells, birds that announce death, waters from which the hand leaves without meat, dangerous nights like scorpions. But the more he talked to her about the risks more she convinced herself that she could not be left alone. He was softening the tone of his warnings, and the madness grew with the days. He already saw himself crossing the jungle with his queen, followed by a troop that would adore them. The regions would fall before the magic of those lovers, and it is true that to myself, more than once, before the jungle arrived with its powerful surprises, they seemed to me like kings of fable, like Oberon and Titania in the forests of Brittany, like Caesar and Cleopatra in the Latin waters of Suetonius. The truth was hiding, Urshua and Ines did not. They would travel through wild groves but through ruthless jungles, they were not going to descend porphyry channels on boats like lutes but hungry rivers in warped ships, at the head of a crew that had already plundered empires and desecrated a world. Where the rays sleep. Plains of ants that transmit. Posts. Vegetable colors that are hungry. Rivers with teeth, soils that emit. Barbs. Fever darts, caves full of. Spells. Blind birds that tell death. Days that have spots like. Jaguars. Still ponds where they. Ray. Waters from which the hand comes out without flesh. Nights like scorpions. That stick their sting at dawn. 22. Now I can count one. Saddest story, the. Story of a boy. Now I can tell a sadder story the story of a boy who traveled to the Indies following his cousin, convinced by him from his native land that fortune and glory awaited them beyond the sea. He had believed his young relative since when he concocted stories with his childhood dreams and transformed his witticisms and family advice into legends. There are those boys who secretly worship to his cousins, who drink from his lips the imagination that was not granted to them, who allow themselves to be carried away into adventures and chimeras by those close relatives, more dreamy than they, more daring, capable of conceiving worlds and planning feats. Francisco Diaz de Alz was one of them. He was born in Ariscan, like Urshua, he also descended from those legendary queens of the Pyrenees and the lands of France. He was beautiful and kind like Urshua, though less conspicuous, and could seem made only to be part of her courtship. He had been dazzled by the dreams of the Indies, by the thirst for treasures, and when Urshua sounded the hunting horn of the great conquests in the lots of Ariscan, he rode out with him, 
and with Balanza, and with Cabanas and the others. And they crossed the kingdom of Spain, resounding of exploits against the infidels, tattooed by thousands of thousands of blows of the horseshoes of Celts and Iberians, Goths and Merovingians, Jews and Moors, horsemen with black beards and golden and saffron and garnet turbans, with silver quilted cloaks. And after leaving that territory blinded by the golden Christs and the brilliance of the scimitars, she had had the devotion of angels for him, she had shared her dreams of conquering a world. When Urshua came to drink legends in the docks of San Juan, there was Francisco Diaz de Alls getting drunk with him with great visions, and when Urshua arrived in Peru for the first time, there was Diaz de Alls, talking with him through the alleys, sharing the hardship, comforting him. And when Urshua was called by his uncle Armendariz to Cartagena, there was Diaz de Alls among the troop of Navarresa boys who entered with the young captain and went up to the cold Santafe and benefited from the luck that made him governor at the age of seventeen and that launched him into a chain of increasingly cruel and bestial wars. Perhaps those are the true protagonists of the story, who leave neither brilliant phrases nor dazzling acts but the certainty of their patience, the secret of their confidence, a few hours that nobody questioned, that nobody deciphered, thoughts on the bow of the vessels that they went up the Magdalena, explanations that they gave to themselves about the origin of the stone monsters of the region of the Panchas, the love for the song of some birds on any given morning, the love for a dark. Skinned girl who suddenly gave a peace, a bliss, that they had not dreamed existed. And although we have hardly seen it, it is no less. True that Diaz de Alls was with Urshua. Wherever he arrived, he was his companion in the War of the Panchas and in the War of the Chitareros, in the War of the Musos and in the War of Banda, in the shadow of the stone cities of Tirana. The years also wrought their ravages on him, battles traced their scars, wars and betrayals past darkening the soul. And something more serious must have happened to him as the years wore on the golden dream that they dreamed together in Navarra and that they guessed together on the Borinquan docks the gradual realization that the promise of the Indies is a reality for the kings, a river of gold for bankers and princes, a source of prosperity for captains and great bureaucrats, but it is a mirage for the little soldiers who only come to feed the hydra of conquest. The captains walk on the bones of the soldiers, and although these Navarresa boys always looked at themselves in Urshua's mirror, sharing their prosperous and cruel years, the truth is that as Urshua got older, he became selfish and selfish. Absent, and the fidelity of his men was losing luster in his eyes, it ceased to be a passion of adolescence to become a custom of his adult years, and no one knew when Diaz de Alls discovered himself seeing Urshua as an insensitive and arrogant captain that he no longer recognized himself in his cousins or his old friends. It was then that the Pedro Ramiro affair occurred. Urshua had met him at the site where the embarkation was being prepared and she felt so much confidence in him from the first moment that she made the decision to name him her lieutenant. The fact was daring, because other men who had been with him long before expected that position, and in these lands a position of responsibility and importance could be the justification of a lifetime. There are many who never get wealth. That the new world promised, and for them the only consolation is having achieved some title, being discoverers of some region, governors, chiefs of mission first or second officers on board a ship. Something that they can show one day to their relatives and neighbors in Spain, and that in the absence of fortune gives them even the privilege of being admired, of being envied. Urshua appointed Pedro Ramiro his lieutenant. General and, like other times but with more pain now, Diaz de Alls felt that his cousin was putting it off again. Would his time never come? Would Urshua have all the opportunities and all the titles? all the campaigns and all the luck, and his faithful companions only the burden of difficult days, the wear and tear of time that neither stops nor forgives? The truth is that Diaz de Alls came into conflict with Pedro Ramiro, Ramiro treated him harshly, demanding that he acknowledge his authority and his primacy before the captain, and on a bad night the arguments turned into quarrels, and the quarrel turned into rancor. Urshua sent his cousin and Diego de Frias a servant of the viceroy who had received a license to go on the campaign, to look for provisions in the province of Tabolozos, and had the bad idea of ordering Pedro Ramiro to accompany and direct them, as he was well acquainted with those regions. 
Already on the bank of a river where the soldiers were crossing in canoes, Frias and Diaz de Alls conceived the evil idea of getting rid of Pedro Ramiro, accusing him of treason and trusting that Urshua would believe his cousin his version of events. But one of Ramiro's servants witnessed the way he was arrested, and without any justification they made him hit with a club and beheaded him. Having seen that, the servant escaped and went to look for Urshua in a hurry to tell him the facts before the traitors arrived. Urshua thus knew without a doubt that a conspiracy of which his cousin Diaz de Alls was a part had risen up against the authority of his lieutenant. He reacted furiously, blood hit his brain, his eyes were clouded with rage, and already well aware of who were responsible, and of the falsehoods that were coming to tell him about Pedro Ramiro, he went to look for them himself, and pretending that he believed them, he told them gently that he understood the reason for his conduct, and asked them to go to Santa Cruz and wait for him there. Rumors were running through the troop. Someone told Urshua that his lack of authority was the cause of these bloody events beginning to occur, and that the expedition would soon become unmanageable. This perhaps compounded their outrage, so that when the traitors thought Urshua would be lenient, the captain arrived, and without further ado sentenced them to death to lecture the others. The news spread through the camp like a fire. Urshua had just sentenced two soldiers of his troop to death. More serious is that he condemned his own cousin, one of his most faithful friends, who had come with him to the Indies, who had been by his side for half his life, the last vestige that remained of his childhood in the golden hills of Ariscan. I myself dared to ask him to reconsider that decision that while it might be fair due to the seriousness of the fault, it was an inhuman gesture, and a break with his own past. He did not want to listen to me, he was furious, he was blind, he felt that his cousin had committed the worst of betrayals, that he had dishonored his blood in the most difficult moment of the campaign, and he must also feel that if he was soft in that decision, he would not have an authority over the troops. I could have forced him to return to Lima and put it in the hands of the viceroy, who knew how to be both severe and indulgent as he had already shown when his own nephew left the beautiful Ines a widow. But he ordered that the sentence be carried out that same day, and I saw the face of Francisco Diaz de Alls when he learned that his sole cousin had ordered his death without even agreeing to listen to him. Suddenly he understood the black paths of luck, and without a doubt he saw his tremendous story as in a mirror, that he had come from his land following in the footsteps of his beloved relative, assisting him in battles, comforting him in adversity, spending his entire life in his service, to discover in the last moment that he had only obtained his own death, that he had served his own executioner with loyalty and love. Diaz de Alls was speechless, and I know that when the final blow came, something in him had already died. The long journey through unknown lands and grueling wars was crowned not by a fantastic treasure but by an infamous death. And while that fact among some reinforced the authority of the governor, because he showed him as a severe and righteous chief who did not admit exceptions in the fulfillment of the law, I am not sure that that was what many soldiers were waiting for on the shores of an implacable jungle, where you had to see the companions and bosses as the last holds against the unknown, as the allies from whom help and understanding should be expected. Urshua did justice to his cousin and his accomplices and this caused a first distress in a good part of the troop because Ramiro was almost unknown to everyone but Francisco Diaz had been a friend of many for some time, and it would seem that they saw him as a link between the chief and the troop, between the veterans of Urshua and the newcomers. Urshua pretended not to have suffered from that impulsive decision, but when the waters descended again he could not ignore that the blow had struck against himself, that to kill Diaz de Alls was to cut the last tie of his blood, to sacrifice in himself the most precious thing he had left the breath of an age of illusions, an ancient refuge of legend and fable, the hill of voices where he was detained his childhood. From that day on a shadow fell over his face, and he was never again the Pedro de Urshua that I had known in the endless gatherings of Panama and in the first trips along the Peruvian coast. I, who had also abandoned many things to follow him, understood that we no longer knew under the power of what terrible forces we were falling through the jungle and I began to suspect that it was not Urshua but the coiled serpent of our destiny that was dragging us towards a border of madness and despair. Bye. They left on the boat of the Luma. 
The screams of children. They left on the wings of the luma. The fish and the birds. They left in the flames of the luma. The houses that sang in the hills. 2-3. While Urshua traveled river. Below to inspect the. Boats. As Urshua traveled downstream to. Inspect the vessels and prepare the. Leaving, Dona Ines arrived at the camp with her ladies. And the one who received it in the name of Urshua was Captain Lorenzo de Salduendo. They had given him the news from the day before, he knew of Ines' fame in Trujillo, he had seen her at mass at some point and he had agreed with others that she was the greatest beauty in the kingdom. And when the emissary arrived saying that she was approaching, he arranged for a gentleman's tournament to be held to receive her. It was, he told himself, a good opportunity to have a military parade and put the soldiers' discipline to the test. By now everyone knew that she was going to be part of the campaign, so they took her on as one of their bosses, and made the parade. They carried flags and banners with the colors of Castile, Aragon, the Church, and the Viceroyalty. High above the tents were the banners of Urshua. Ines, behind a veil that only allowed her eyes to be seen, arrived on a specially well-dressed horse, her ladies also came on horseback, and with them the guard of soldiers that Urshua had arranged to escort them. The black carpenters had worked all night on a kind of makeshift balcony so that when they arrived they would settle there, and the parade of helmets with thick ostrich feathers began, and the long feathered helmets of black and white egrets, the squadrons crossed, fired at the arquebus, which startled the jungle in the distance, and as they passed in front of the ladies they all stopped and bowed. They smiled in gratitude with their handkerchiefs, so that the soldiers suddenly felt far from there, in the luxurious tournaments of Spain, and did their best to forget the monkeys that looked at them from the branches, not to watch for any snake. He nodded in the branches, ignoring the squawking of the birds with great beaks and the mid-flight cry of the blue macaws. Many rumors had spread about Ines' beauty and everyone was eager to see for themselves. She strutted before the soldiers. Heeding someone's plea, he took off his shawl and let them see his beautiful face. We all wonder if the mysterious absence of Urshua was foreseen, if the governor had preferred that the soldiers did not see them together in the first moment, that they establish a relationship of familiarity with her before getting used to seeing them side by side in the vicissitudes of the bell. For a few days there was talk of nothing but the court of Agnes, its tents, its costumes, its provisions its servants. Memories or rumors returned, because there were no longer soldiers from those times, from the court of Atahualpa, because if it was true that she was the Inca's niece, they said, that luxury was not entirely Spanish, it was rather the luxury of the court that had been dismantled in Cajamarca. Now I must say that that tournament in homage to Ines de Atienza gave our expedition a glow of ancient history for a moment. Everything seemed to smile at us, and although Urshua was not present, his spirit was breathed in everything, in the gallantry, in the color, in that touch at the same time gallant and violent of the crosses of lances, the waving of the banners, the martial trumpets. But sometimes I wonder to myself that perhaps what gave it its splendor was precisely the absence of Urshua. That moment in which the forces were concentrated for the advance was the last moment in which the captain shone as a victor, as a spoiled son of the gods. What filled the air in that boastful and brilliant ceremony, before the black wall of the unfathomable forest, was the spirit that the governor had breathed into the expedition, the stories with which he had dazzled the encomenderos, the promises with which he had attracted to the soldiers, the energy and the slightly delirious confidence with which I had convinced myself, and of course the spell I had worked on Ines. Everything suddenly converged, and the mighty spirit of Pedro de Urshua, advance of the Indies, victorious of five wars, the bird that was reborn from its ashes, the most bewitched man that I ever knew because of the delirium of riches that ignited the new world, the Spaniard who came to believe the most, but in an ambitious and rapacious way, in the legends of the Indians, in their golden tombs and in their flows more elusive than the wind, that afternoon filled the company with brilliance and intoxication, and no one could have a presentiment that what we were living was not a dawn but the last flash of light thrown by the foliage before surrendering to the night. From when she arrived at the camp, Ines did feel its power, 
and administered it with false innocence, she pretended not to realize that everyone was looking at her, that everyone wanted her. He supposed that belonging to the head of the expedition would put her above all greed, that he could afford liberties and flirtations, and that everyone had an obligation to accept them as undeserved gifts, that cinnamon slow liquor that Providence added to their travel ration, but that they had to learn to drink in moderation. Urshua was going to impose the rude but expected labors of adventure, deprivation, and war, she, on the other hand, came to impose tasks on them that no one had told them about, desire followed by deprivation, temptation tempered by respect, a complacent smile suddenly frustrated by severity. So there were the soldiers and the captains, a multitude of faces, each one relating an unknown story, French Efid Navaresa such as Urshua, strong Basques full of secrets in their language, Jews and Moors camouflaged in the cloud of Andalusians and Portuguese, hard and long-suffering Extremadurans, Castilian nobles without fortune, mestizo men quieter than the rest, scarce women, the loyal mulattoes running errands, always fulfilling some order, solving some problem, the blacks and the Indians. More than 800 faces hiding or revealing their souls, and that initial anxiety of not guessing which ones will end up being our brothers and which ones our enemies, which ones were born to be leaves of oblivion and which ones to become an indelible part of our destiny. Urshua left for the last time to resolve urgent matters, and finally he came with his chosen troop of thirty faithful men who had procured for him the Marquis Ignacio Mendocino. On my trip to the camp I had journey more full of concerns than of hopes the path that separated us from Inca cities. I lived again that strange sensation of detaching myself from everything known. The calcined fence of the stones of Cusico, the city of my dreams as a child, the new cities of the mountain range with their Spanish palaces, the house where the conspirators killed Pizarro, the cold but solemn house of the Marquis near the ravines of Lima, the house of delights of Ines de Atenza in Trujillo where lutes were played and delicacies were served by the light of the torches on the drums, everything represented to me the deciphered world that we were abandoned. We were heading to the country of the great serpent and the water tree, and I lived more than others the strangeness of adventure because, unlike them, I was not looking for riches. Why had he come back? Still on the journey in search of the cinnamon I cradled some hope of obtaining my lost inheritance, what my father had left me, what Amini recommended that I recover. Now I came back so stripped of ambitions, that perhaps only I was crazy amid so much intention and so much calculation. Where greed led others, gratitude barely led me, and I had little to understand that not even the object of that gratitude realized what I was giving them. Let's say then that I abandoned myself. Fate with the docility with which the canoe. Delivery to the stream. It was no longer more than a bird that does not wonder why it flies but follows the impulse of its wings, a mute fish without eyelids that lets itself be carried away by the river. Roads. Now the trees go on a journey. Decomposed leaves turn. Roads. Between black branches the day forms. Stars. Now a sun needle sticks into him. Shoulder of the day. And the weapons weave the story. The vines will come to explain the evening. The jungle is the jaguar, the leaves are its stains. The light hides claws. The moss feels the weight of the shadow. The jungle feels now reaching the travelers. They came to shores and worlds, and they return. Night up. Green inside. So many rivers later. So many fears later. Heaven below. Time around. Towards the day. 24. The day finally came when. Company was ready and. Complete at camp. The day finally arrived when the company was ready and complete in the camp to begin the adventure, and there the problems due to the delay in starting the trip began to be noticed. What was the use of Urshua in different. Moments would have achieved large sums if what he was collecting was spent almost at the same rate, not only on weapons, arquebuses, dogs and crossbows, gunpowder and lead, saltpeter and sulfur, as well as on tools, nails for woods and tars for cock the boats, 
but in victuals for the campers, in fish, in pigs, and in poultry? Many of these resources were consumed over the months, and here you must always take into account the pests and the climate. The sun and humidity penetrate the woods, the the bug gnaws at hooves, horses get sick, pigs are consumed in continuous supper, dogs need food, not to mention that gunpowder gets wet, irons rust, and keeping tanks clean and dry is demanding work. I still remember those early days of impatience and confusion. It turned out that of the eleven large and small ships that Urshua had commissioned, and that were still for a long time waiting for his arrival, once they were put to the test, six made water because the humidity and the weather had eaten them away. Urshua was astonished to see that some boats, which had not been used, were already broken and rotten. It is not possible, he said furiously, a brig cannot fall apart in three months or six or a year, and even less if it has not even begun navigation. Perhaps the woods were not ripe, they replied, or perhaps the assembly was not rigorous enough. A cavernous voice in the tumult managed to say, it is that when the leaders do not exercise permanent control, neither the officers nor the troops know how to demand everything they should. And the officer Corso himself declared, it is clear that we are not in the shipyards of Barcelona or in the port of Cadiz, where the climate is favorable and the responsibility of the officers is indisputable. Here everything was improvised, things cannot be expected to turn out the same. Three hundred warriors had been recruited. The main ones, in addition to the blacks and mulattoes, who numbered about thirty, and the Indians, who numbered more than five hundred. Urshua, in one of his outbursts of enthusiasm, had spent part of the resources buying a party of one hundred and eighty horses recently brought from the stables of the Antilles. He was insensitive to my news that the horses had not been able to advance through the jungle on the first trip, for us, the only reasonable path had been the river. Because they were on the run, he said, but now our intention is to penetrate the jungle, dominate the towns, conquer the cities, and we cannot do that on foot through the tangle. Not on foot, not on horseback, not with dogs, not with swords, not with spears, not with words, I replied but he no longer heard me. Faced with the disaster of the ships, the discussion about how to carry the more than three hundred horses that the expedition had assembled, there were only two good brigs left. Urshua approved to reinforce what was there with the construction of new flat, wide and balanced barges, in each one of which it was thought that they would fit from thirty to forty horses, the impossibility of the horsemen riding along the tangled banks of the river was already seen. The rivers. Soon a scouting company brought news of new inconveniences. Leagues below the port where the ships were armed, the river, very mighty from the source, is obstructed by rocks and jumps that make navigation difficult. But we already know that the canoes from the Brazilians arrived there. The Indians know how to go up the rivers with skill in small boats, maybe up to two brigs with people will be able to pass, and the rest can descend in canoes but flat beds full of horses will never be able to overcome those gorges. There is no way to carry a great weight in them. When Urshua finally understood what was happening, he suffered the second great setback of the trip. With almost all the brigs spoiled, which had better be scrapped at once, there was no time to start building others. Forced by the facts, he made a decision that left almost everyone dissatisfied, Embark only 27 horses on the sturdiest flat and leave 273 practically abandoned in the mountains, since we did not even have time to take them back to Lima to try sell them there. It is already known what a horse means to a soldier, there were men who cried when they left their horses in the mountains, at the mercy of the jungle, and someone said that those beasts were the first tribute that the expedition was offering to the gods unknown. I still seem to see the 47 horses, several of them white Arabian colts with long manes, which we carried to a spacious and fertile island, thinking that we might one day return and rescue them. We were not unaware that they would die, that they would jump desperately into the current trying to reach less cruel shores, but there are times when all decisions are desperate. And now I remember that weeks later, Pasqual de Urbina surprised me one afternoon in the jungle reciting in romance the names of many of those horses that we had left abandoned. 
I have seen men cry more for their horses than for their absent girlfriends, I have seen someone die pronouncing the name of a horse between effusions of blood. Also a pack of mastiffs was freed to their fate in the Sierra de los Modilones, and we all tried to forget that those dogs that with us were meek as doves and with the warrior Indians were savage as hawks, loose in the grove without someone to provide them with food would be victims of famine and plagues. We all had to abandon some of the luggage, clothes, and provisions and now the governor was spending his verbal resources not announcing as before virgin lands and new skies but justifying the limitations of the trip and promising better days in exchange for lightening the weight of the company. Captain Garciars came out first with 50 men to explore the shores. Later we learned that he found a people of warrior Indians against whom he had to fight for three days, and that the first men of the expedition were killed by arrows. Also commissioned to explore certain islands, at the beginning of July of that year 1560, Don Joan de Vargas, a personal friend of Urshua and one of his most trusted men, left at the head of another hundred soldiers. Both captains had to go ahead and wait, away from each other, a few more weeks, because when Urshua was ready to leave, one of Pedro Ramiro's subordinates, Juan de Montoya, angrily refused to participate in the trip, claiming that due to death they were owed a reward from their chief and that none of his men would move from the Modilones region. Urshua had those soldiers, who were more than a hundred, and to force them to fulfill their commitment, and perhaps also to avoid. Disbanded from all the others, she took Montoya prisoner. Now many complained about the shipment, no one could bring even half of what they felt necessary, and I felt the contrast between the fervor with which we undertook the trip to Cinnamon years ago and the continuous lamentations and annoyances that here replaced that enthusiasm. However, most of the soldiers remained ready to undertake the campaign because the hopes that Urshua had awakened were great. So the expedition had two faces, a fascinating and magical one, in the shadow of Urshua and his lady, a luxurious and powerful campaign in which the trumpets sounded, the packs barked, the finest colts whinnied and they prepared almost like kings of fable to descend those solemn rivers into the heart of the jungle, and another resentful under a flutter of bad omens, with brutal soldiers looking suspiciously at their leaders, entire companies of frustrated horsemen who would have to advance on foot through the jungle, and officials dissatisfied with their provisions and full of demands. To handle this swinging crowd, Urshua, who was forced to alternate his jovial and gallant spirit with a new severity, was beginning to feel impatient. Every time he had to deal with another setback, a new anger invaded him, he dispatched complaints with more rudeness, he resolved conflicts more rigorously, he only wanted to do something else. I felt it early on, Urshua had started not seeing Dona Ines, and soon he would end up not seeing her but her. Before, the two of them lived proud of the kindness they showed to everyone but the least attentions of Ines were interpreted in a tortuous way by the soldiers, and his gestures, strong and just, which would have been seen in other circumstances as the natural way of command of a military commander, received perverse interpretations because they came from a chief devoted to pleasure and subject to the whims of that cat in heat. Never forget the river. So you appear in my dreams. You ask me not to forget the river. When I tell the story. It was the river that did it, you tell me. The river knows what you need. The river can see at night. Offers you its poisons and offers you its fruits. The water is soft but it works the stones. Spin the grass, push the mountains. Knows how to quench death in the throat. 25. They came from everywhere and each had a past. They came from everywhere and each one had a past. I never asked them about their origins, Urshua told me at the shipyard, I can presume that they all have a murky history, but here they come looking for the opportunity to be brave, to be heroes. And to be rich. The truth is that you could almost see on their faces that they were not only looking for a future but also fleeing tortuous memories, devising the best way to take revenge on their own past. It was the governor's rule to always trust them even when they gave him reason to doubt. Faced with the disaster of the ships, 
he did not stop blaming the officers, the carpenters, and the cockers, but that accusation was not entirely fair because one had to consider the poor quality of the wood, the power of humidity, the little experience of all in the art of assembling ships in unhealthy climates and in precarious conditions. The wind brought voices. I heard in passing, without knowing who said it, that certain chiefs were worth less than one of the horses that were left in the mountains. Another replied, You see, we came to get wealth and the first thing we do is lose what little we brought. A month had passed since one day. Vargas left with thirty men in the first brig, and with seventy more men, distributed in canoes and rafts, to collect all the food that the river banks offered, and Urshua still lingered resolving conflicts, taking advantage of the time to build new rafts and make carve a large canoe in the sun. For his part, the other captain sent to explore, Garciars, did what Orellana did, as the first days he did not find provisions, he continued on, rode in front of the jungles for three hundred leagues, and no longer stopped with his men until reaching an island on the Maranyan. It is not that we camped on the bank of a river. We were in a water star of the mountains. From the Sierra ravines, streams and flow rates, they were joining and twisting under the branches, and the captains went mad trying to know the names of those streams, streams and rivers that rushed from one slope to the other. The Kokoma River, the Brak Amaras, the Apurama, the Oenxa. Indian voices told us that this was perhaps the Vilcos, that the Zoxas ran further on. Like a cobweb of cold waters, this river was born behind the Chinchakacha region, that other one was born in Guanaco, several channels emerged from Tamara, many others flowed from the Pacartambo and Guacambamba mountains, and in the midst of so much confusion of waters and we did not know if the names of Ruburapa, Porama, Van K corresponded to rivers, mountains, or indigenous peoples. But beyond our ignorance and our astray, what radiance of waters was descending and gathering, as if subject to a conscious command, as if some voice were leading them, as if invisible hands forged with patience from the height what later becomes the lightning that splits the jungle and it does not stop growing and growing, which is populated with birds and turtles and is filled with the brightness of the skies and the agitation of the storms. Only on September 26 did we finally embark under the governor's command, with the beautiful Ines and her court, and with the majority of the navy. Urshua had had to subdue several outbreaks of mutinies first, and he was taking some chiefs prisoner. The brig that was left was full of troops and weapons, behind were three strong flats, two of which would later carry the chosen horses, which in the initial section would go down the shore, and in which we put equipment and tools. In the other, specially worked and furnished, with a well-carved roof to protect itself from the rain and veils to prevent the passage of insects, the governor would go with his wife and his body of guards. In the first outposts I was part of that company. The first three days, as we had been announced, they were of waterfalls and eddies, navigation was difficult as we left the mountains behind and drifted through larger streams, and thus we reached the point where the men carrying the horses caught up with us. There we shipped them, sure that the stony rapids had ended, and we soon saw from above the great jungle plain with the mirror of water snaking through it into the green darkness pierced by streams of light. There were also, further away, under the sun, spaced and mysterious curtains of rain. We descended between strident flocks and very soon we felt the vicinity of the plain, the vegetation became more dense and tangled, the boxed mountain ranges widened, wide beaches appeared, and I relived one of the powerful initial experiences of my first navigation through the jungle, the joyous impression of freedom and almost lost, of entering with a whole river in the bed of a larger river, of an immense river, with the confusion of trunks, foams, branches, and eddies that form in that confluence. And as if it were a fateful law of the jungle, exactly as happened in the previous expedition when we reached a larger river, the brig struck, and a piece of the keel was blown to pieces. Ines saw the brig crash against something, saw the confusion up on the deck and screamed, but Urshua continued on with the flats, the rafts, the canoes and the rest of the navy undoubtedly confident in the expertise of the pilots. And we advanced in search of the troops of Lorenzo de Salduendo, whom the governor had dispatched three days before, 
to prepare the way and, if possible, gather food. Two days later the brig caught up with us, half repaired with logs and blankets, and sailing like a drunk suddenly tossed by the waves. Urshua tried to keep me close because for him. It was important to know when, although. Now we came from another direction and by another road, we reached the Amazon River. He recalled that our brig had also broken down when it emptied into a larger river, and he did not forget the story of Orellana, so he feared that Juan de Vargas, who had been waiting for us for more than two months, would decide to go ahead and let himself be carried away by the river. He chose Pedro Gales, a great rower, faithful soldier, repairman of arrows and spears, and sent him to notify Juan de Vargas that the governor was already on his way, and that the army had reached the Marañón River. Gales reached the island where Don Juan was waiting at a crucial moment. Part of the troop was already mutinying, although it was divided into two groups that debated whether to go ahead with new leaders or return to Peru. And in that riot the quarrelsome and cavernous voice of Lope de Aguirre stood out. It was possible to warn men more. Dissatisfied. Several had even been accomplices of Urshua in some reprehensible maneuver, such as the case of Juan Alonso de la Bandera, Pero Alonso Casco, Miguel Serrano and Fernando de Guzman. To these four, who were part of the first troop that camped next to the shipyard, Urshua asked one day to be his assistants to force Canon Pedro Portillo to fulfill the commitment of lending him 2,000 pesos against the results of the expedition. Portillo was the vicar of Moyobamba, I know. He said that he had saved a fortune by depriving himself even of snacks, and at first he was as enthusiastic as everyone with the stories of the governor. But finally his thrifty spirit was stronger, and after committing himself to Urshua, when he had already allocated those resources, he regretted the deal and refused to give them to him. Urshua did not care that he was a clergyman, he sent the mulatto Pedro de Miranda almost naked at midnight to ask Portillo to go urgently to the church to confess to Don Juan de Vargas, that he was wounded by two stab wounds for a reason that I do not know, and when the vicar went to do this charity work, Urshua's henchmen, Pero Casco, La Bandera, Serrano, and Guzman, seized him, in the church itself they pointed at him with arquebuses, intimidated him by the light of the lighters, and they forced him to sign an authorization so that the next morning a merchant who had these monies in deposit would deliver them to the governor. But Urshua took his assault further, he forced Portillo to hand over all the rest of his fortune, which was 3,000 pesos more, and took him by force as chaplain of the expedition, because his reverence would not want to lose the money that he has saved his whole life. The truth is that he never got them back, and along the way he lost more than the money that Urshua's felony had taken from him. At the hands of the tyrant he lost his tonsured head, and his only salvation consisted in being surprised by death with the creed on his lips. I cannot deny that Urshua got on well with the scoundrel, and no wonder it was those same men, who no longer saw him as a respectable captain but as a dating partner, who began to murmur against him when they felt that the trip splendid that he had promised them was turning into a hazardous and uncomfortable adventure. Urshua trusted everyone as long as they were loyal, he continued to trust when the rumor grew that some were envious and even hated him, and he always laughed at the suspicions of those who sought him out for warning, just as he had scorned the recommendations of old Pedro de Anisco, in those two letters so loyal that today more than letters seem oracles. By happily trusting his ruffians, he neglected the warnings, and refused to understand the meaning of the dreams of the beautiful Ines, who begged him in every tone to take care of the troops. Now that everyone is dead I can too. Confess that there were a few days when Ines filled my thoughts. Later I warned with resentment that this had happened to many, that during the expedition each one not only felt attracted to her but also had the conviction that she corresponded to him. It was a savage campaign, where men alone and full of energy faced chance and death every day, it is not difficult to understand the disorders that the proximity of a woman can unleash in the bodies and especially a woman like that. She was not, I have already said, the only woman on the expedition, but we all reacted as if she were. Her mestizo maidens and her Indian women went with her, no other soldier officially had a woman, but there were servants who helped with the daily tasks, and some of the men had even managed to bring their daughter. 
we know that Lorenzo de Salduendo talked with Ines upon arrival and since then he has not been able to sleep. His care for her betrayed him, he was always attentive to her requests, he never concealed his interest, and only Urshua seemed not to notice, as if it seemed natural to him that his wife exerted a kind of fascination on the captains. Perhaps he was sure that no matter how much they desired her, they would not dare to woo her, or the consciousness of their authority placed him above the risk of being jealous of his subordinates. Little by little he saw the indifference that had made him lethargic in his breaks in Trujillo Reborn, he began to feel astonished at his own obligation to be a boss. At the gates of the jungle, with a wavering expedition in his hands, he realized that the world was closing in on him, and he only found refuge in the tents of his bewitched love. It was said that it was good that the soldiers did not feel too much the weight of his authority. But if the soldiers needed something, it was a boss and the gradual abandonment of his duties had to be seen as a betrayal. They had all embarked, seduced by his eloquence, dazzled by the fascinating world that he invented with his speeches and proclamations, and suddenly Urshua did not want to speak any more. The jungle, which aroused his eloquence so much when he was far away, when he hardly dreamed of it, silenced him as he approached, and it was nothing like the web of fierce cities and pagan villages that he had been weaving in his travels. The unrest that aroused among the troops grew larger and more unpredictable than the jungle itself. It was like the magician who awakens the powers of darkness and is suddenly distracted, seduced by some spectacle of the world, and forgets the demon he has just conjured. Something was using that resource to stop him, slowly and effectively the hope that he himself had sown in those men whom he now abandoned was being frustrated. And for evil to be perfect, destiny. He had placed in her hands a comforting refuge, with all the appearance of happiness. We heard again about Inesta Atienza's cries of pleasure, which Urshua had told me about in Trujillo, because now he didn't need to tell them, they spent a lot of time together in that shop guarded by black slaves, from the neighboring tents, Inesta's anxious cries, her gasps, and her amorous blasphemies could be heard at times in the midst of those tireless copulations that separated Urshua from his duties and that discharged the responsibilities of command on others. Listens. I could tell you many things. The song of a tongue devouring a world. Hammering the treasure of names. Of trees that dream and birds that they think. Of mountains that leap like deer. Of rivers like trees that have their roots in the sky. He would paint in the caverns of the jungle the scream of the monkeys. I would name the snout of the storms, the rain on the grass of so many dead men, and the quiet voices of the trout that heard the flutes, of the fire, the throng of the great invasions, and how they rose up against them, darts with feathers, arrows like snakes, black chinta souls with their prayers, shark teeth to the subsidiary of arrows. I would say in your ear what the wars, the clash of men and dogs, the song and the spell, the irons that they sewed in the bare breasts, avalanches and shadows, and the god returning screams to the jungle and the river. 26. Some say that he was born in a Ramayona, in the shade of the church of San Esteban. Some say that he was born in Aramayona, in the shadow of the church of San Esteban. That the principality is called Anaria, that the place is called Gabaria, that the house was that of Estabilizda Aguirre, his stepfather. Not even he knew anything about his father. And some say that he was born in the year 10, when Balboa founded Santa Maria la Antigua del Darien, and others that in the year 19, when Cortes demolished the effigies of Tenochtitlan. And they say that after a childhood as hard as that of any poor Biscayan in Onate, he became a shoemaker in Viteria. Perhaps from its earliest times it was violent, cruel, and seditious, but maybe it was life that was making him that way. If he had rebelled against his stepfather, what we do know is that he never renounced his name. And Urshua was right when he told me that many of his soldiers had been fleeing from some murky past, he had raped a maiden in Vitoria and, 
caught by the bailiffs, was condemned to be hanged and dismembered. He was in a jail in the year 33, awaiting death, when the announcements of the great golden overseas kingdoms arrived in Spain. With the glow of that fabulous gold in his eyes, he managed to distract the jailer, fled the prison, ran to Seville, and managed to embark for the Indies under the command of Rodrigo Buran. He did not know that he had left the six-year-old Urshua near his land playing with the geese on the Elizondo Road, he did not know that he had left eleven-year-old Juan de Castellanos in Seville studying oratory in the study of Don Miguel de Heredia. He passed before them through the docks of Hispaniola, where I was waiting for my father and where I received in a letter the story of the death of a city, he passed through the island of Borinquen, where fantastic stories flew, and they tell me that he was in Cartagena with Pedro de Heredia's troops, advancing through plains where the trees have golden voices, where men can disappear into forests of giant herbs. He learned to tame foals, he was in Panama in. In the year 35, he arrived in Peru in the 36. In the Battle of Salinas they saw him on the side of Vaca de Castro, and in the 44 he was riding in the troops of the old Viceroy Blanco Núñez de Vila. In Trujillo or in Lima he had a daughter, and he sometimes visited her on his travels through the desert coastlines. It is not difficult that she met Blasta Atenza in Trujillo, it is not difficult that she knew of Ines since she was a child. He was 30 years old and he already knew very well what he hated, the bosses, the rich, the jailers and the winners. For 12 years he had been trained not to let himself die and he was persistent in his grudges. He saw Urshua for the first time in his brief passage through the Peruvian land, and as he learned everything, he could not ignore that the inexperienced boy, the son of a Navarresa fortress, had been called to higher destinies. Gonzalo Pizarro and the demon of the Andes had risen up against the viceroy. He joined the royal side, gathered troops for his cause, and one day even tried to free the captive viceroy. But the old viceroy did not have the opportunity to thank him for his good intention, and the men of the king's cause did not recognize his effort. For helping the viceroy he was wounded in the right foot, and no one came to offer his support. Since then he became an even better writer. Because it is hard to have a weak foot when you go on campaigns of conquest. He grew more and more angry and one day, to top it all, seriously burned his hands when he fired a damaged arquebus. He tamed horses in Trujillo in the year 46, he lived on quarrels and intrigues, he made friends, but when they knew he was a fugitive from justice, they turned their backs on him. In those he was when he crossed the mountain range. Like a trumpet blast the news that Bishop La Gosca, the vigilante, was coming, invested with all imperial power, to subdue the rebels and punish the fugitives. He preferred not to tempt the devil, he fled with Melcher Verdugo to Nicaragua, and only in 1551 did he return to Peru, attracted by the legend of the Silver of Potosí, perhaps in those holes was the fortune he had been pursuing for almost twenty years. Since then he has dedicated his life to. I take advantage of the work of others to obtain. Quickly fortune, but Judge Francisco. Esquivel learned that he was tormenting the Indians and arrested him. He shouted in his face that, being a Spanish nobleman, he could treat these beasts as he pleased, and the judge, faced with this raucous rebellion, condemned him to receive public flogging. Since then, Lope de Aguirre had a reason to live, to take revenge on the judge who had subjected him to that derision. Waiting for his term to expire, he pursued the judge from city to city, province to province, became his silent and furtive shadow for six years from 1553 to 1559, limping at times and sometimes riding the path of his revenge for more than 6,000 kilometers. He went after him to Quito, he returned through the saltpeter deserts, through the parched mountains, through the cities on the coast. He stalked, intrigued, ruminated his rage, returned in his footsteps through the city of the kings of Lima, where the Marquis of Canet already ruled reached the judge in Cusico, and killed him there. Now he needed to hide in hell, and then he knew that a gallant and lucky captain, rich and successful, was putting together an expedition into the impenetrable jungle, and he ran to get hooked on it. Urshua, of course, 
did not ask him about his life or his past, but it seemed to him that this deformed man with a large head, suspicious eyes, violent gestures, a cavernous voice and rude language would be useful for the expedition. Pedro de Anasco surely knew his antecedents, because it was the first one he mentioned in his letter, recommending to Urshua not to take him, not him, not Juan Alonso de la Banda or de la Bandera, not Perez, Lorenzo de Salduendo, or Diego de Torres, neither Vargas, nor Miranda, nor Cristobal Fernandez, nor Miguel Serrano nor Anton Lamoso. This Lamoso had come with a gear to the interview and, at the same dark moment, Urshua hooked them both. Aguirre told him that he could only go on the expedition if he could take his daughter, an 18-year-old girl, and Urshua accepted because in those days it was already being resolved that Ines de Atenza and her maidens would go with him to the jungle. Aguirre was one of the first two. Concentrated in Santa Cruz, because he was dodging justice. He knew that he could not return to Peru, where he would be executed for the death of the judge. He knew he could not return to Spain, where he would be dismembered for an ancient crime. Then he began to hear the complaints of the soldiers who were waiting for the gallant governor who never came. He saw how brigs were made, how it rained on the jungles, how leisure invented nightmares before a horizon of blind trees, he heard from other fugitives and convicts stories of daggers, tripping and stolen keys, he saw how the humidity and the bug gnawed at the ships, how impatience grew in the troops how the delay seemed the omen or the warning that the chief was reluctant to set out on the road. Later Urshua arrived and began to exercise his authority over a troop eaten away by the impatience. I decided as always, because he was used to being a boss, but he was incapable of realizing that these decisions, made with righteousness, consulting only the merits of men, left furrows of hatred in the souls of others. And there were the claims of Fernando de Guzman, a man of high birth trapped by the wars in the Indies, who once blurted out the statement that he felt more worthy of governing that campaign, more full of decision and merit than Pedro de Urshua. With the arrival of Urshua and Ines, soon. The rumors started. If Urshua sent a squad to explore, someone found an evil meaning in that decision, if he decided to bring the Brazilian Indians, there were obscure comments about it. And when the first cry of Agnes was heard in the night, a lot of things were said in that camp. Lope de Aguirre was weaving its plot. From The first time I saw him, I had the impression of something not entirely human, he had enormous strength, he was capable of lifting his own weight several times, he moved with astonishing agility, he combined the abruptness of a mountain beast with surprising mental quickness. And a powerful and evil language. It made Fernando de Guzman feel that he should assert his blood and his titles, it was not clear why Urshua was the boss. One day, for some infraction, Urshua reduced the flag to prison. Aguirre befriended the flag since then. Ines had brought a mysterious Trujillo dog, a Viringo, to the expedition, and since those dark dogs seemed to be burning with fever, to the point that the Indians used their contact to heal from the cold in their bones. Aguirre did not stop suggesting to the more credulous that he was an infernal dog and that Agnes was evidently a witch who had dominated the governor. The truth is that long before we set out on the road, Lope de Aguirre was already moving like a demon among the troops, insinuating something perverse here, throwing something crooked there, making some to distrust the others, and all to distrust Urshua and poor Ines, who according to he gave his opinion, one day he favored them and another day he betrayed them by offering them his favors. I did not frequent the groups of soldiers, but I was noticing that a climate of murmuring and danger was growing in the camp. What happened in the canoe? Back then there was no night. You always had to travel in the light. He had given each one a gift. Hidden things that should not be looked at. But one of them opened the dark bag. And the ants sprang up from it. They covered the hands, the arms, the body. Covered the neighbors, the canoe, the water. Covered all the walls of heaven. And so the night came. Pamiri Max gave each one a coquillo. And in that faint clarity they advanced. The ants were more and more with each. 
instant. They were filling everything. Then came the yellow man. The sun came with its crown of feathers. The ants no longer covered him. With a stick he pushed back the dark spot. Put the ants back in the bag. Filled the bag with millions of ants. But they no longer fit in it and were watered by the jungle. Although the light returned, since then, the night exists. But no night will be so closed. As thick and dark as the night of the ant. They reached the rock, the great rock. Pierced. Believing they had reached the end of your trip. They came out through a gap at the top of the canoe. They scattered around the world before weather. Each carrying his gift. Bow and arrow. The fishing rod, the cassava grated. The blowgun and the basket. The bark cloth mask. The men chose where to live. On the shores, in the jungle, in the headwaters of rivers. In the clouds, above. 27. For its enormity, for its color and by the strength of its flow. Because of its enormity, its color, and the strength of its flow, I was beginning to recognize the river that we reached on my previous trip after the Aparia region, but I had the feeling that now the Indians did not want to appear. We saw the villages along the river, and we sometimes found sufficient supplies in them, but the Indians were absent or invisible and they did not beat the drums that years ago were always the harbinger of great attacks. I told myself that if the first time we had besieged in some sections of the river was because they thought we were coming to stay. Perhaps now they hoped that what had happened with the first expedition would happen with this expedition, that it would vanish downstream and not return for a long time. If the brigantine of the troops had suffered a breakdown when leaving the great river, the one carried by Juan de Vargas practically fell apart when we reached the first island where we found ourselves. When it was already making water, the men managed to row to the beach and from that moment the navigation was done with only one brig, and with the rest of the troops in the flat, rafts and canoes. We would stop every day at six in the afternoon on the right bank of the river for some soldiers to fish, others to cook, all to eat, and many took advantage of the stop to rest while a part of the troop watched the expressionless jungle and the extensive waters of the river. In an undoubtedly little abandoned Indian village. Previously by its inhabitants, we found more than a hundred large turtles and many eggs. And it was after that that we finally found Garciars, the one who had left first with thirty men. The experience of his journey had been one of anxiety and scarcity. The Indians had waged war on him every day since his arrival at the Maranyan River and some men had killed him. The group had to feed only on water lizards, which the chief hunted with his arquebus because he was the best arquebusier in the army. One day a large group of natives came to. Wanted with peaceful intentions, but Garciars and his men thought they were going to be victims of an enormous assault, so they received the visitors in a large hut, or Maloka somewhat away from the river, and when the Indians thought they were going to arrange with them some deal and celebrate an alliance, the men of the company, full of fear, launched the attack and, out of sheer fright, carried out an atrocious carnage. They fell by sword and knife on the unarmed Indians and killed more than forty before they could react, so that the other Indians fled, bringing such alarmed news about the reaction of the invaders that for many leagues we always find the villages abandoned on the shore. From the river. Reunited at last the expedition, we stopped. Eight days on the island of Garciars, and there they were appointed Lieutenant General Don Juan de Vargas and Lieutenant General Don Fernando de Guzman, whom Urshua considered his great friend. But we already know that Guzman was secretly envious of the governor's titles and believed that he was much more worthy of being the head of the campaign, especially from the moment that Aguirre began to exalt the garments of his lineage and celebrate his merits. One of the two flats was lost in the next game, in the first region of the jungle where we saw a flock of white parrots pass overhead. There was nothing left but the governor's luxurious flat, and the rest of the expedition went in numerous rafts and canoes, until they reached a town called Kareri, a name that we have since given to the entire province. We managed to be there for more than a month, reinforcing the batting, 
and already talking about the need for a safe shore where to build new ships. The few Indians we saw were helpful and cordial, but Urshua was so eager to reach the Amazon country that no town tempted him. Nothing that announced cities was allowed to be guessed on the shores, the towns were rustic, their ornaments were feathers, inks, and seeds, gold was scarce in their bodies, and the best evidence of their industry were the slender canoes, the finely woven hammocks, the malocas facing the sun and the moon, the pitchers, the spears, the darts and the blowguns. But the governor was not interested in knowing what the twisted vegetable fiber cylinders, the pointed and flexible rods, the yucca grating, the baskets where the natives keep invisible things, or the bark cloth masks were for. Nor did he appreciate the rumor of the walking sticks. Healing with bells and seeds, nor the sound of prayers, nor the music of flutes, nor the beating of drums. In the vastness of the jungle it did not seem. Reciprocate great wealth, the Indians only spoke with exaltation as if it were pure gold of the knowledge of things. Here it is only wealth to know was the incomprehensible translation that an Indian language made of the words of a king who had a necklace of fangs and a diadem of blue feathers. Urshua smiled suspiciously, but felt nostalgic for the campaigns of the new kingdom of Granada, where from each region came a multitude full of pectorals and nose rings, bracelets and paparos, necklaces of frogs or birds, helmets or diadems, where they were crowd the grass hoppers, the tusks, the bats and the golden bees. But the governor told himself that without a doubt. Here too the treasures were hidden, perhaps behind each tree there was a warrior lurking, under each feather a watchful head, in each war song a war song, in each monkey howl a message that was traveling from region to region, on each crest a warning, on each immobile iguana a sentinel of hidden kingdoms, all arranged like a flower of cautious fences protecting the secret. It was during those days when I tried to make friends with Ines to make everyone feel that there were people faithful to Urshua and her environment, and to learn old things about the kingdom that she, daughter of the palaces and granddaughter of the mountains, could relate better than many. There, next to the jungle, I got to know Trujillo's house through his words as if he had ever lived in it. As Ines spoke of her arches and baths, of gardens and water channels, I saw how much she missed this world that she had given up for an impulsive love. He had practically never been out of those walls where her old Indian women spoiled her, where servants pampered her, and where her husband and her lover went to love her. I was really happy to go on an adventure with Urshua and he preferred this destination to any other, but he could not help but feel the helplessness of the weather, the vertigo of unknown jungles and rivers without memory. A ceiling of ragged skies and nights with patches of stars did not protect enough his life thrown at random from the untamed regions, and in that state of fragility and fear, he had eyes to see many things that Urshua's pride would never see. Montoya, the man from Santa Cruz, had been one of the first unwell with Urshua's authority. He openly declared himself in rebellion and was again reduced to captivity, which only consisted of wearing a collar for a few days. All the men made robberies in the villages, and the captain prohibited such abuses trying to put order in the relations with the native towns. He did not want us to be seen by the jungle as thugs, but he was not able to prevent the abuses from being repeated at each contact. Alonso de Montoya excited the others. Prisoners, Juan Alonso de la Bandera did not. He forgot his humiliation, Fernando de Guzman. Encouraged secret thoughts. Lorenzo de Salduendo felt more jealous of Urshua every day, Miguel Serrano de Caceres detested the disorder of the expedition, Cristobal Fernandez and Diego de Torres were continually offended and mistreated, Alonso de Valena was a friend of Portillo, the clergyman, Martin Perez felt that he had been deceived and that he had left Peru, where he had a good future, to enlist in an expedition that was increasingly confused and more disoriented and one had to add to all this the persistent work of Lope de Aguirre, who made one's vanity grow. And the resentment of another, the resentment of the third and the jealousy of the fourth, the indignation of the latter and the contempt of the former. Food was scarce and many began to feel that the advance would be suicidal. Anything seemed preferable to moving on along the river where new streams flowed endlessly. These torrents came so murky on both banks that it was easy to conclude that the rainy season was beginning upstream. 
One afternoon, when we had camped in an abandoned village, and in which Urshua and Ines, as always, were locked in their tent, a storm so terrible broke over the jungle that for hours and hours the members of the expedition could not see each other. Each other. The men secured the flat and the rafts on the shore, managed to tie almost all the canoes, and managed to protect themselves, some in Indian huts, others in tents, others under makeshift sheds of leaves, but for a long time it could be felt that this did not it was a vigorous and fearsome expedition if not the spoils of a rare adventure. Urshua awoke in the arms of Ines with the feeling of being in the last reaches of the world, he felt that there was no land beyond, that from now on only storm and desolation awaited them. From that moment on he had an aftertaste of loneliness, he did not want to leave the store, he reacted rudely to requests, the demands of the soldiery filled him with impatience, each of his functions as chief annoyed him somewhere in the body, it caused an annoying reaction in his bones and muscles. The entire army seemed to blend in with his body and everything filled him with anger or indifference. The memory. As I walked away from the mountains he returned to. Me the memory of a pain of these men, the memory of the sacrificed king. I experienced the strangeness of knowing that there were still, so many years later, Indians dressed in black and white for him, and I made fun of those who were waiting for his return. Melancholic Incas believing that the blood spilled in Kajarnarka would mix with the earth in the rain. And he would raise the king from the mist of the mountains. Stranger was that if you think that. On the dried blood a city of ours was already growing, that there were churches lit like lamps in the stony mountains, and that the metal of the bells sang at dusk the praise of a world very different from that which the ghostly reeds of the mountain range deplore. But here the mountains have the shape of a sleeping body, here the wind in the abyss sometimes dreams of the voice of an absent person, here the jungles speak of the mystery that is in each rib and in each leaf, here each ray of the sky has a refuge asleep at the bottom of the lagoons. 28. And so we come to the region of Maki Pharaoh. And so we arrived at the Maki Pharaoh region. A. Land of naked Indians who paint their bodies in bright colors, and wear only necklaces of red seeds and ornaments of plumage. I remembered this region but I was not sure why, I had the feeling that something precise had happened to me there. I spoke to Ines again and felt that she was increasingly concerned with Urshua's situation. She feared things, dreamed of blood, assaults, deaths. He told me that Urshua was not paying attention to his hunches, and that it was necessary for him to be more cautious. I spoke to her about something else, I took the conversation back to other topics, and she calmed down by telling me about her father, Blasta Atinza, the Trujillo Aqueduct, her mother, the Koya, who had died when she was still a child. Then I promised him that I would speak with Urshua, taking advantage of the fact that we were in the last days of the year and that we planned to delay for a few days in that region. I know that others had tried to warn Urshua of the growing danger in the camp, and I sought him out again to discuss those rumors. The last afternoon we saw each other, I told him how little I knew, since I was not very aware of the conspiracies moving in the shadows either. I only noticed the dissatisfaction of the troops everywhere, I heard conversations that were suddenly interrupted when they saw me appear, groups that whispered in the light of the fires in which so many things are going to die with wings that wake up at night. I was surprised to find him more willing than other times to talk and I even think he was relieved to see me, to have someone to talk to for a while alone, while in the distance the sound of crews preparing to leave at dawn could be heard. The Incas who went on the expedition celebrated that night Capac Rami, the festival of the rebirth of the sun, so that in the camp there were songs, and since for us it was Christmas night, I wanted to remind Urshua of my friendship, despite of his estrangement, to make him feel that there were faithful men who did not follow him for the gold or for the hope of a glory already difficult to imagine, but for loyalty or gratitude, as in my case, because in definitive moments he had exposed his life for saving me, and had assisted me when there was no one else who could care about me in danger or reach out to me. He told me that others had come to bring him reports of alleged rebellions and conspiracies, to warn him of rare threats, and that Ines herself in recent times was agitated and nervous, she slept badly, she distrusted almost all the soldiers, 
she was awakened by horrible nightmares. But he attributed that concern to the jungle itself. Ines was too used to the luxuries of her stately home, the safety of its stone walls, and the protection of her servants, being now sleeping on the banks of immense rivers, in the night of whistles and crickets and cries of beasts, or of the thunder in the clouds in the distance, filled her with visions. Fortunately he knew how to reassure her. When she insisted on her anguish, it was enough to tell her that he had warned her that the life of the conquest expeditions is not for weak and fearful women, then she was filled with courage and promised to show him that she would be worthy of the difficulties, that she would not allow herself to be overcome by fear or by the voices of the jungle and the river. But his security did not last, the next night he would dream again of blood and betrayals. This is how I remember the last words that Urshua said to me, I am not afraid of men. I have arms like them and I can wield their daggers and swords with equal skill, I have legs to chase and to escape, I have eyes to spy on their movements and to warn their progress, I have a mouth that prays and insults, and my insults can be better modulated than theirs and to have more effect, because of the command that the viceroys will give me and because of the majesty that the representation of the great powers of the world in these jungles gives to words. I have a mind that encompasses kingdoms and seas, bloodlines and legends. I know the tales of the jungle but also the true story of the god who was suspended from a tree to purify the blood of its curses, and I have a heart in which irons or frowns, evil thoughts or threatening words do not work its influence. I remember sometimes being afraid. But it was not arrows and daggers but inexplicable things. In the land of stone beasts, because I felt the presence of beings that do not resemble us, in Catatumbo, before the lightning that does not go out because the sky seemed to be governed by other forces and there was a light that instead of clarity seemed to bring confusion and omens, later, in front of the Sierra Nevada, because I heard people say that the stones feel and listen, that the roads have a will, that the stairs surround the visitors, and that level after level there are things that think, trees that watch, eagles that carry messages about the forests. And finally when uncontrollable rages attack me, the desire to abandon everything, because I know that there are pleasures that soften the will, delights that intoxicate and end up making one hate what one's whole life has accepted. Those things that it is not possible to bend or subdue, that cannot be destroyed because they are not made of flesh or blood, that do not listen to orders and do not heed pleas, nor do they obey the authority of kings, the order of armies or the reasons of the masters, are the the only ones that baffle me. In this world even iron obeys, even stone allows itself to be molded, the violent can be subdued and the poison itself is docile to intentions, but everything that escapes command, authority and torment belongs to a dark kingdom of diabolical things and monstrous powers. You will never see me waver before armies of Indians, magnificent with spears and arrows, faced with the challenge of the mountains or the risk of navigations, neither before the claw nor before the tusk and not even before the back of the thousand-headed beast, which are these armies to whom that I know how to command and protect. But I can dig my nails into my palms when fangs emerge from the stones, when the sky punishes me with lightning without thunder, when even the horses feel that the road is haunted, when the body is free and seems tied, it is alone and it seems surrounded by thousands of shadows. When one wants to advance on a course and the feet go in another direction, and the one who is the master of visible things becomes the slave of a thousand things that cannot be seen. As long as the dangers are visible and the enemies be human I swear I'll know how. Face them and beat them, and I can't fear. Who are under my command, obliged to obey me and paid for my money. I know. Prevent rebellions and punish disorder and submitting crimes with the same power with which the light clears the world. And everything else is in the hands of God, who knows who he protects and who he abandons. I left the hut he occupied and went to the place where my store was. I told myself that if Urshua had spoken those words, pretending to have everything under control, it was to give himself strength, because the truth is that we were entering the realm of everything that he admitted to fear, the stones in which fangs sprout, the haunted roads, the invisible bonds and the tropes of shadows. Why did he insist on advancing towards the country of the Amazons, 
if in his imagination it was full of spells and monstrous powers. What unsettling enjoyment did he get from defying what disturbed him, moving toward what made a cold sweat break out under his armor? It was almost midnight and there were some men still by the campfires. Later I learned that it was at that time when the old commander Juan Nunez de Guevara, a great friend of Urshua, saw a dark mass pass behind the place where the governor was, and that I had left a while before, and heard him exclaim to that shadow. Pedro de Urshua, governor of El Dorado and Omegua, God forgive you. In the camp it was later learned that the commander followed the shadow trying to know who it was, but that an instant later, before his eyes, the bundle vanished as if it were a form of smoke or mist. I didn't hear about it that night, but something noteworthy did happen to me. Returning to my place, I finally remembered why the Maki Pharaoh region had a meaning for me, it was the place where twenty years ago I had seen a canoe of Indian children that sailed after our brig, children carrying monkeys and macaws, and a snake meek that they played to drop in the water. While you browse, you will draw the song of the birds. You will decipher the rain. Father of the water, grandson of the squirrel. You come from chewing sacred fruits. You drink the juice, you hear the flute in the background. Of the pond. Red claw of the living boats. For you the moon moves its plumage. Wings move the air. And there is a long hour without colors. And there is a sad stone. Flexible jungle frame. When the trees jump. When the rainbow burns. When you hear the thunder of the. Deer. You are the gold dust that covers them. Living jaguar skin lining the world. 29. At one time, the only one. Entered the store of. Urshua unannounced. At one time, the only one who entered Urshua's store unannounced was his cousin Francisco Diaz de Alls. The governor could believe, in the confusion of awakening that his cousin was coming to see him, but that, alas, was not possible. Now no one was authorized to enter the room. As he pushed the mosquito net aside with the intention of getting a good look at the visitor, he noticed that others were coming after him. Perhaps they were coming to say goodbye, that morning of January 1st, the parties had planned to march in different directions. Urshua was not presentable to attend visits or in the mood to attend speeches, but in the weak light of dawn he tried a strange greeting. Gentlemen, he said, to what do I owe this early visit? No one answered him, in the tense silence, Urshua saw the faces of Serrano and Salduendo, Fernando de Guzman and de la Bandera, Torres, Vargas, Lamoso, and Aguirre appear one after another, and he was startled by something more serious. He returned to look for Ines to ask her to give him his clothes, but it was precisely the time that Ines went down to the river with her maids. When he realized that it was not the clothes that he had to look for, if not the sword, already between him and his weapons were the others, armed. The impossible was happening. The impossible, the inconceivable, the abominable, the devil's sulfur, already permeated all things. He jumped out of bed with the agility of a cat. He did not find a speech or whom to captivate with him, nor a shout of majesty that could stop them, he reacted like a cornered boy, and his lips only found in the void the Latin creed as they recited it in Ariskin when arrows hit the walls. Then his friend the flag gave him the first thrust in the center of the chest. Urshua tried to defend himself, to reach, naked, his weapons. When Ines entered almost immediately, already Salduendo and Guzman, Aguirre, and Lamoso, Serrano and Vargas had pierced the governor with their irons, three more men were preparing to do so, and Urshua was struggling bleeding, sustained on his feet less by his strength than by his arms. Opposing swords mowing down him. The conspirators numbered more than ten, but the ten who decided to enter to kill him had sworn the night before that they would all thrust their swords into him, so that no one could later repent and blame the others. There were short, long swords, sharp as foils, sharp as cutlasses. All had already been tested on Indian bellies, backs, arms, and necks, all had been made to kill. The room was full of screams, and from the number of bodies and weapons it would seem that there was a fight, but all that ferocity rained down on a single body, 
which, in addition to hurting, the murderers cursed. They called him tyrant, ruthless, and traitor. Ines, with terrified eyes, looked at the scene and could not take a step towards the wounded man, from whom the swords were already withdrawing, dripping blood. None of the murderers sheathed theirs, but they came out showing the bloody sheets, as if on display it absolved them of their guilt and gave a meaning to the crime. When Ines pounced on the body, Urshua was already dying. Pale and terrified, she kissed him on the mouth, hugged him, trying to scream but barely a small voice came from her lips, a rattle. The steels had pierced the body in all directions. With hatred, with envy, with resentment, with despair, with jealousy, with greed, with indignation, with wounded pride, with ambition, with evil. For a moment, Pedrarias de Almesto told me, who arrived immediately or was already present, the body looked like a sacrificial bull, pierced with iron. The blood was a pool under the embrace, and around the screams of the murderers grew. They yelled, swords raised as if they were performing in a public square and calling for mutiny. Then Aguirre's squawk was heard, saying that Enes had to be killed too. That which, he said, has been the cause of many evils. They ripped her from their embrace of blood, and when someone was about to cut her throat, a strong and determined man stepped in, with the bleeding sword still in one hand and a dagger in the other. It was Lorenzo de Salduendo, who had not killed Urshua out of ambition or resentment but for her, because always imagining Ines in Urshua's arms had taken away his sleep and tranquility, and now he was willing to have his partners killed alone for saving her. At that moment the voices shouted that Don Joan de Vargas, lieutenant general of the governor, was coming down the road, and the murderous fury changed course. Ines's situation was desperate, besides. From the horror of Urshua's death, he had to feel gratitude for the man who saved his life, even if that savior was one of the murderers. Salduendo protected her by opposing his chest to the irons, then put it in the hands of his maidens, he swore he would not touch her, promised to take care of her, cried with red hands for the death of the governor placed a group of faithful servants at the doors of her shop. It all happened at dawn, but for me it would be always the memory of a night of swords. The other conspirators were already awakening to the camp. They shouted for freedom, shouted long live the king. To attract the bewildered and the undecided, they congratulated them on the grace obtained, called them free men and fortunate soldiers. They had been avenged, they were free from the cruel tyrant, from the traitor, from the source of all their misfortunes. Of course they were not going to mistreat those who mourned for Urshua, they were going to show everyone that this death was the end of all evils. I had foreseen this, but it was hard for me. Believe it was happening. I ran to the tent when the news spread through the camp, and I found Urshua's corpse still on the ground, naked, full of flesh wounds, and more helpless than a bird. In that macerated body that was erased by tears I could see my own failure, the night that fell on my thoughts, the madness of my destiny always lost in someone else's war, and I also knew that Urshua had sharpened the swords of that dawn night and day. Where already were the beauty and eloquence, energy and courage, laughter and audacity, language bewitching souls, history in gushes, ambition that was turning into stories, the smoke of dreams that sprouted from that bonfire. As with every death that hurts us. Soul, I felt the world had ended. All the things that I knew about Urshua passed through my mind, everything that I have told in this long story, and her desecrated and undone relic taught me more about her destiny than all her words. He knew well that each sword tells a story. He loved swords since he was a child, since when he saw an ancient sword erected as an object of worship in his old house in Ariscan, the instrument with which Hugo de Auxiliary, his great-grandfather, had cut off many heads of Moors, which the boy imagined as dark-skinned and red lips and big dark circles and beards closed like shadows. It is true that the murderers had a pact. But I think that if they all plunged their swords into Urshua's body, it is because each one of the executioners had a particular reason for killing him. In the heart of the jungle, and believing himself at the gates of his dream kingdom, that lord of five wars had been assassinated ten times. One wanted his position, 
another his wife, another the benefits of the expedition, another his titles, another revenge, another justice, and from that moment they began to distribute everything that seemed to be theirs. Not only did they declare themselves saviors of the expedition, liberators, redeemers, and vigilantes, they assumed command, the administration of resources, the decision of the course. But from the beginning Agir was the secret impulse of that rebellion, and more cunningly he pretended not to be. The first thing he did was to persuade everyone that Fernando de Guzman should be appointed, not a governor or head of the expedition as might be expected, but a prince, and Guzman meekly accepted this farce. Agir had spoken to him without end of his prosopia and his merits, and he soon made him king, but in this world no king has ruled a more uncertain and more evanescent kingdom. The deformed Agir pretended to obey him, bowed the knee before him, agreed to be upset when Guzman rejected some execution, some evil deed, but it was all a masked ball. Then we knew how they shadows across the camp the night before. One of Alonso de la Bandera's servants, a black man named Juan, had heard the conspiracy in the shadows, and as he felt gratitude for Urshua, for some gesture that the governor had made with him, he went to the store where he was locked up with Ines and he waited a long time to notice it. He went back and forth, nervous and desperate. But seeing that Urshua never went out, and fearful that his master would realize what he was doing, he made the decision, which almost cost him his life to leave Urshua the warning with his servant Hernando, who was guarding the store. Due to a mysterious fatality, he forgot to tell him, or he already knew that Urshua ignored rumors and said nothing to him. The truth is that that afternoon, in order to ingratiate himself with the new masters, Hernando told them that the Black Juan had come to betray them, and the loyal servant was only saved from death by being one of the indispensable carpenters for the construction of new brigs. Before the silent forest and before the accomplice troops, they gave the loyalty five hundred lashes. The next day Urshua's burial in the jungle, on the river bank, in the haunted region of Maki Pharaoh, with Ines sobbing amid the embrace of women, orphan, and widow again but now stripped of wealth and property, an eclipse of moon by pools of fever, it was the saddest parade. There was no coffin, no honor, no ceremony. Under whispered prayers his body entered the jungle to become moss and water, and the soul did not find angels among the giant trees but wings of macaws, whistles of birds. And not many days had passed when Ines began to live with Salduendo. It was known in danger and he realized that only he had sufficient influence over the conspirators to prevent their death, but in the midst of the fights of love he would angrily dig his nails into his chest and back. They say that you can love and hate at the same time, but it should not have been easy for her to separate gratitude for her savior from hatred for her executioner. And fortunately, Urshua never knew that one of those swords had physically taken away her love. We did not stay much longer in that overwhelming region. As we resumed our march, although many pretended to believe that we were still going to conquer a fabulous kingdom, the faces revealed that we were rather heading towards the most horrible part of the journey. I had lost something irreparable. I preferred not to look at the face of Ines at the time of departure, already deprived of the luxurious boat in which she had traveled until then, suddenly turned into a woman more than a campaign without direction, as she had been worn so much, lost among the tumult of a raft down a violent river. And what could I reproach that woman who? Out of love she had lost everything perhaps even more beautiful in her misery, already totally helpless and alien. No one could demand that he die for his friend, that he go down with him to a nameless grave. But echoes of an old song heard somewhere in the mountains came to mind. The echo. Look at me now locked in darkness. Although there seems to be light in the stuff. Look at me already lost because I don't have your hands on my shoulders. Look at me already kissing one of your executioners. 30. What happened next? I also wanted to erase myself. Memory. What happened next I also wanted erased from my memory. Prince Fernando de Guzman did not keep his ghost kingdom for many days. When he was fed up with him, Aguirre had him executed without pretexts. With each dawn, 
the suspicion of a new betrayal became a habit and we got used to waiting when the sentence fell on whom. How long was it before Salduendo? Received his share? I couldn't tell. But. When Lorenzo de Salduendo lost the favor of Aguirre, the despot full of swords and knives, who controlled the camps out of terror, always surrounded by his sinister guard and with Anton Lamoso turned into his shadow, the fate of the beautiful Ines was decided. Someone must have brought him the news that Salduendo had been executed, and the only thing she managed to do was crazier than stab a dagger in the chest, go out with her maidens on the run through the thick jungles. The tyrant could let her abandon her at the mercy of the Knight of the Ant, but he preferred to quench her evil and claim the last piece of virtuous treasure. She ordered the horrendous Lamoso to pursue her and that useless escape through the jungle, of which the other members of the expedition, who were outside the circle of the conspirators and their henchmen, found out late, was the most evil and useless crime in history. Already too useless and wicked. Like a hunting dog, the executioner let the hares run for a long time before pursuing. He knew that fatigue would come to them soon, he knew that they would most likely go round and round thinking they were fleeing, because escaping in a straight line was impossible. She wanted to allow herself the luxury of looking for them, of creating the terror of being lost, of being cornered, and of getting closer. In the end, her blood stained the mosses and fed the trees, and that was how neither Urshua nor Ines could reach the kingdom of the Amazons, nor did they step on the gates of the city of gold they had dreamed of, and left waiting in the heart of the jungle the stone knives of the warrior women and the altars of the city of the serpent. But what the city had foreseen was fulfilled, each one of them was left alone in the Maki Pharaoh region, and large trees grew over their great love and birds flew. We find it later on. The ground with decomposing leaves and among the fence of silent trees, we saw his pallor and his resignation to death. I saw in his face that he would not know how to meet Urshua in the night of the moss, after having clung to his murderer, but I know that love solves things differently, and that in the solitude of death the lovers who were together for even a moment they will know how to accompany each other forever. The news of Urshua's death took a long time. Time to arrive at the house of Ariskan, where Tristan his father had already anticipated him, where in vain the home of the elders had become his inheritance, and where Leonor Diaz de Armendariz, who kept as talismans small relics of childhood she had grown accustomed to the absence of her son, some cloth sheep and a tiny wooden cart, as a way to prepare herself for the news that her heart sensed. Uncle Armendariz who was his protector and chief in the wars of the new kingdom of Granada, was also unaware that he had already seen Urshua for the last time, and after taking the habit he alternated memories and prayers with the also retired Bishop La Gosca in a Palencia monastery. I don't know if someone told relatives in Navarra that the worst fruit of that trip had been the death of one of the boys at the hands of the other. No one was moved in their land by the titles that Urshua obtained in these overseas provinces. Fame was still for the greats. Achievers and for those who returned. Loaded with gold to the peninsula. The eldest of them was Hernando Pizarro, who upon leaving the Castillo de la Mota, where he paid twenty years in prison while in Peru his brothers killed and died, married his own niece, Francisca, cousin of Inés de Atienza and daughter of Francisco Pizarro, and enjoyed with her his copious inheritance for eighteen years. The Marquis of Canet did not manage to deplore the fate of an expedition in which he had placed so much hope and so many resources. Urshua took longer to leave Santa Cruz than the Viceroy to die of bad air in front of the mountain range with silver foundations, and what he received, Urshua would certainly not envy, a magnificent funeral with seven bishops dressed in purple, a luxurious dream on the soft velvet bed of a gold-plated sarcophagus. We still continue for many months under Aguirre's dark madness, each day more infamous and cruel, but when we finally went out to sea and turned back to the island of pearls, we found that his crimes were just beginning, things that filled the coastline and the kingdoms of terror, and of indignation and alarm to the court. Not because Aguirre was more evil than others, but because his victims were not as always thousands of Indians but dozens of Spaniards because knowing he was damned and lost he could lose nothing by rebelling, and he dared to send a sacrilegious letter to Felipe too, calling himself a traitor. With pride, to himself, pretending to be king of the Indies, 
announcing his intention to return to Peru to seize the Viceroyalty, and claiming to have become the wrath of God. Years have passed and now I can talk about these things with a serene voice and almost with my spirit. After the tyrant was overthrown at the last moment, more out of the fear of his own men than because of the royal parties that tried to stop him, his cruel henchman Anton Lamoso, murderer of Urshua like the others and the executioner alone of the beautiful Ines, fled. From Barcasamato where the tyrant, as a last feat, stabbed his own daughter before being killed by two shots from an arquebus. Lamoso passed through El Tokio, where it would be. Dismembered his boss and where they were going to exhibit his head, he crossed the mountain range, entered the territory of the new kingdom of Granada, fled through Merida, in the province of Tunja, trying to be more and more secure, he passed through the forests of Bacalma and Chinacota, and entered Pamplona one night, where without identifying himself he requested asylum from the rulers of the town. He did not know where he was arriving but without a doubt it was Urshua and Ines who guided his steps. The city governor had received news of the rebellion, with the alarmed proclamation of the names and the history of the rebels, and since everything is known in these lands, they understood that the newcomer was Lope de Aguirre's most bloodthirsty dagger. Lamoso arrived precisely in the city that it had been founded by Urshua, still governed by the governor's most faithful friend in the new kingdom, the old and serene Orton Velasco. Like Ines threw the jungle running towards him. Knife Lamoso unknowingly ran through the forests of Catatumbo, and through the solar forests, to reach the scaffold on time. As I have never believed that blood erases. Blood, freedom was my only revenge, and life was my reward. I also came to Pamplona and heard from Orton Velasco an old part of this story, Urshua's advance through the country of the Chitareros and the year he was hidden in the town. Later I spoke with the beneficiary Juan de Castellanos in Tunja, and I fed his verses telling him in detail the adventures of his friend, from when the two of them separated in Santa Marta, and he and I met in Panama, until when the snake closed its rings. About our destiny. He was already beginning to write his verses, and Urshua's memory was already in them, but I also told him what I did not know about the trip on which we went in search of cinnamon. So I came to this region of Santa Agueda. Del Guali, from where you can see dry mountains that seem to hide Indian temples, and I finally met the lawyer Jimenez de Quesada, who told me late to late about his trip through the Magdalena and the discovery of the kingdom of the Muiscas in the savanna. Now he writes a book about the wars in Italy, so as not to think so much about the spotted leprosy that is taking over his body. But one must not believe that with Urshua and Aguirre the follies of this outrageous conquest came to an end. Jimenez de Quesada has just returned from a defeat almost more gruesome than ours. And here I could begin to tell the story of a man who led the third most successful expedition on the continent thirty years ago, the man who discovered with his real troops El Dorado, there, in the endless savannah, at 2,600 meters high a kingdom that gave them in a few days 200,000 pesos of pure gold and a pitcher full of emeralds, the story of that man who, after getting rich, returned to Spain and was the first advance of conquest that could really be spent on the peninsula. In boastful costumes and Vitellian banquets, in gaming tables and in scandalous tips, an immense fortune, of that man who, impoverished again by the crapulous life of the sentry boxes, by the deck and the dice, the mountain, the bank, the bispus, the real tables, the chunk, the chueca, the taba, and the flower, already spent the gold, the legend, and the glory, he returned to the Indies when he was older to begin again, and in his old age he was once again blinded by legends. I knew from his own lips that, having heard of the story of Urshua, who was said to have lost everything at the very gates of paradise, put together another delirious expedition to reach what Urshua had not found, and left Santafe in the Bogota savanna in April 1569 with 400 Spaniards, 1,500 natives, 1,100 horses, with dogs, pigs, chickens, slaves, servants, cooks and eight chaplains to conquer the infinite plains, to fall from the north on the jungle city of Manoa, and was detained for many months later by the unexpected winter. And by the wall of water from the rivers of the jungle, and he lost 333 Spaniards, 
1,496 Indians, 1,082 horses and six priests. But it is not with a chronicle of these times. Last with which I will end my long story of the two trips to the river that my strange destiny imposed on me. But with these pages that I have rescued from the end of my adventure, when in Barcasamato his soldiers suddenly killed Lope de Aguirre, and his head was exhibited in a cage to the consternation of the kingdoms. Because it was there that I finally discovered the reason for my trip, the teaching that the serpent without eyes, as the people of the jungle call the river, stored in its scales. The dream. We had sailed from a shore behind which. The boats were piling up, and we saw a flock of white herons pass through the sky, followed by a single black cormorant, which was cawing. I remember that, that the herons were silent but the cormorant croaked in a sad way. We advanced along the river and suddenly, without having disembarked, we were already at the gates of a city. But although in the dream it was said that they were the gates, what we saw were large rocks and in the middle of them a stream that descended and that had carved caverns in the stone. We rode through the jungle on horseback, first over litter, then over mossy soils, and finally over mud roads where the horses' feet sank deeply. Then the city appeared, but its walls were completely covered with green silt, and shone in the sun, but behind it the city was dark, and the temples were barely hinted at it. I had the certainty, without having seen them, that in those temples the skulls of dead men abounded, and that there are altars for the sacrifice, and then I saw Urshua enter the city, followed by his officers, and I was with Zibali, with Araman, and with Anuma, and behind was the legion of the Indians of the mountain range, who did not mix with the Indians of the jungle, although they understood his words. When I finally entered, I heard the drums, and I saw the waterfalls that fell from the rocks, the huge canyon next to the city where a river was meandering, and I saw Urshua and Ines sitting at the banquet with the Amazons. A stone man was crouched in the center of a room in the moonlight, watching two snakes crawl across the floor. Suddenly a woman crossed him as a fish crosses a reflection in the water, the woman had a beastly face. Urshua pointed out in the distance, at the bottom of the mirror, the king's ships, and there were many, and they filled the horizon, but they did not float on the water but on the grass, and the cries of Dona Ines could be heard calling Urshua on the fence. I saw the statue now dead and broken, still glaring from the flint, and his beard was not stone, it was a real beard, so long that it went overboard and tangled the course of the ship. There the dream became more confused. There were huts in flames, there were wheels of fire like sliced pine cones that rolled towards the bottom of a cavern. 31. They inform me that tomorrow. They will take ten directions. Different. They inform me that tomorrow they will take the body of the tyrant in ten different directions whose head is still fierce in the cage where it is kept. I must now continue with this story, to which I dedicated so many days of fever from the moment the tyrant Aguirre was shot down with the arquebus for the tranquility of the kingdoms. I filled out many pages without crossing out anything, so as not to give time to forgetting to erase the stories that Urshua told me on the eve of our adventure. It is hard to believe that in such a short time we have fed and lost so many dreams that so many nights of wakefulness and fear have surrounded us. And above all I find it difficult to believe that Urshua, who seemed more alive than anyone, no longer has more than words, elusive phrases as if he wanted to retain them in the wind, words that perhaps can explain the past but that cannot tell me my luck, what is a man to do with his life who twice descended the river, first by chance, abandoned to the love of the waters, and then by loyalty following someone who very soon gave up all loyalties. Now my fatigue and my amazement are great. But in these empty hours, while the terrible head is blackened in the cage, more worthy of compassion than of hatred, only this devoted river of memories manages to be my consolation and my star. After a week in its cage, the head looks parched and dark, a bird of rage that people come to see from far away, still not believing that the danger has passed. The man divided into ten parts recomposes himself in dreams, once again tyrannizes people under the merciless moon. Only three months ago the rumor that the tyrant was advancing with his troops towards Santafe moved people from all over to arm expeditions against him. In Tunha, 
the poet Juan de Castellanos himself abandoned his desk and his letters to go and punish the murderer of his best friend. Men from Panama have said that another punitive expedition was organized in the Isthmus and that Alonso de Ursula, who was already beginning to write his poem about the Araca Wars, recovered from the fevers that held him back and ready to travel to Spain, postponed his journey to participate in the advance against the tyrant. A third campaign was being prepared from Santo Domingo, called by the friends of my teacher Oviedo. Incredibly, the false news that Lope de Aguirre had died demobilized all three expeditions at the same time, just when the tyrant was more alive and more rampant than ever. What hope could be left, if the opportune armies capable of stopping him dissolved like a dream due to that unfounded news that the devil undoubtedly took flight, no one knows where, and that ran through lands and seas with more haste than the wines. What are they roaring? The threatened kingdoms lowered their guard, and everything seemed to be at the mercy of the tyrant, each day more insane, with his sleepless eyes more wild and his blasphemous tongue more cursing each day. And, as a result of infinite fear, it was his own men who stopped him at the last moment. The fact that the head is displayed in a cage shows that, dead, it is still scary, but few will know what it was like to see it alive. Those eyes that watched everything and never faded, the sarmentous, pensive, offensive face that seemed to always be in front of us even when the man had his back turned. And the extensive path of cruelties that was filled with his name, people now speak of the cove of the tyrant, the bend of the dead, the islands of the devil, the camp of the ten swords, the river of the rebel and the beach of the traitor, but those tracks resemble man as little as the tiger's plush footprints. Even a blue flower dotted with red was called by one of the crew Seguire's eye. No one will know how to name this other flower, this fragment of rebel, the severed head, which can no longer rule or monitor the fate of its own arms that have left for Barcasamato, nor of the legs that walk through Valencia, nor of the quartered trunk that is traveling towards Merida, nor of the heart that will throw the beasts. The one who thus shattered the territories cannot now feel his body and his shadow disintegrated by defeat. I would have preferred that they buried him whole, face down, in a lead box, I fear that that body and that blood that return to the ground, will spread their horrible disintegration to things and make the jungle hate the plain, that the rivers hate the sea they seek. Someone who in such a way knew how to be a curse in life can also be a curse in death. Now, we need to unload the terror of the days, disperse the evil shadows and triumph over their specter, we cannot give him as a final alms the opportunity for something of his to continue sowing the earth with evils. The memory of Urshua comes back to my mind. I returned to his lips the story he told me one night while we were traveling by the river. Through the plains of Venezuela, more than twenty. Years ago, when the Germans were here, a young man named Pedro de Aranda leaned back one day on a log while he descended the ravine looking for the water of a pond. The log moved under his hand. Aranda jumped up and realized that it was not a log but the body of a huge snake. The head was the size of a bull's head, and a black forked tongue protruded from it. Aranda felt a shock that made him lose control, and it would seem that it was not him but his fear that fired the crossbow against the head of the serpent, and drove the first arrow into its eye. This unleashed such brutal contortions of pain and fury in the animal that, whipping the trees with its tail, it snapped branches and threw the foliage. Those who watched from afar saw that as the huge jaws opened and closed, it split logs and stones with them. They were all fleeing and only Aranda, more out of terror than courage, continued shooting arrows at the head of the snake, which after a while lost strength and began to die. When they saw her weak and dying, the soldiers, who had been hiding in the woods, were finally encouraged to approach. And a despicable thing happened, because then yes, when they saw her immobile and defeated, they all began to be beaten with branches and to drive their swords into her limp body, the same ones who fled when she was alive, seeing her dead, attacked her and destroyed her. Cowards take out weakness. I still seem to see him, speaking of courage and honor, arrogance before the enemies, and I turn to look at the black head of the tyrant delacerated by those who feared him, I contemplate thoughtfully the ridiculous head of the madman, one object among others, but loaded with passions and stories, and condensing the fears of a world. If I had made that trip many times, 
the images would end up being replaced and I would no longer know when the arrow flew towards the eye or where we saw the smoke, but two intense occasions, far apart in time, can preserve their integrity, and even more so if different faces and voices give meaning to the events. Now I know that the first time I was terrified and dazzled by the outside world, each moment was the beginning of a story, we were going towards the night of the trees, towards a land that no one had seen, perhaps towards the cliff of the worlds, and the trip was full of supernatural voices, of fantastic creatures, of hidden crowds that watched us, the second time we suffered the world almost without looking at it, the fear of the jungles had given way to fear of men, the night was in the soul. The unknown was the hearts, and the awareness of being watched night and day was not born of the glances of the monkeys and the birds but the moving eyes of Lope de Aguirre, which warned everything. The nightmare that we were for the Indians is the same nightmare that Aguirre became for the members of the expedition. As I have already said, he was not called a tyrant for being so bloody, since spilling blood was the job of those expeditions, what has given him his legend and his shadow is having been the murderer of seventy-two Spaniards and having dared to raise his voice against the crown. Because in the world it takes courage and madness to deny the king and challenge his armies. And for this reason it is also a source of amazement for me that fate has allowed me to meet, day after day, two men so similar and so different as Gonzalo Pizarro and Lope de Aguirre, who in a span of twenty years dared to raise the same cry of rebellion, which advanced without a king and without God through these vertiginous lands, and in whose feverish temples madness was slowly taking the form of a golden crown. I say courage and madness, and those words describe both well, although in Pizarro courage prevailed, dementia in a gear. And perhaps my memories of the river are hopelessly altered, distorted by those two savage captains. In any case, Pizarro's was a waning memory, every day there was a little less and therefore the jungle and the river existed every day a little more, on the second trip, Lope's presence worsened day after day, the river and the jungle seemed to fade or fade from the intensity of his gaze. And a cavern opened in the late. And a cave was opened in the afternoon. Each creature spoke in its tongue. There were tales of feathers and tales of scales. And the children who shiver in the torrent learning to guard it. Memory. They were already the guardians of the secrets. Of language. Because the jungle is not silence, it is the more abundant language. That's where all the words are and where they are most alive. Are roads and bridges, medicine and incantation. Networks that do not allow penetration. Enemies. And gates that open on the rocks are the countless ways, and the poison and the remedy in the shapes. 32. Everything just happened, but I sit talking about days old. Everything just happened, but I feel like talking about old days, about times that seem to be lost in legend. And among those mists I still hear the tireless murmur of the water. It is amazing how we saw more of the Jungle when we were fleeing from it than when we wanted to go to meet it. Under Orellana's expedition the jungle existed, the beings of the river showed themselves, the populations on the shore made us feel their drums, their prayers, their smoke, and their songs. Also his arrows, his spells, his gifts. In Aguirre's desperate campaign the travelers only saw one another, they watched each other with anguish, full of suspicion and hatred. Each felt that the greatest danger was the others, and Aguirre woke up every day with the need to get rid of someone else. As his madness grew, his power. It was getting bigger and at the mere brightness of his eyes the men trembled. Suddenly the tyrant was on the decks of all ships, as if multiplying himself, and he was also spying on us in dreams. It was a strange way of not seeing the jungle, of not hearing its song, of not feeling the powerful voice of the river which speaks of the mysteries of the earth, of the purpose that lives in the seeds, in the flowers that attract the blowflies. In the darkness of the foliage where the sunset suddenly lights up some unknown bird red. Now I know that it was the jungle that abruptly. He seized the destiny of Lope de Aguirre, closed his eyes to the mystery of the world, and no longer allowed him to see more than what was in his soul. Perhaps the gods protect the world by driving men mad 
making their stings turn against themselves in the end, and in this there is no evil, because the forest does not think or conspire, but the dark law of life protecting its secrets. That is why I am not interested in telling how the adventure of the trip was under Aguirre's wild eyes. Others will tell it and it will be known that it was nothing more than the small combustion of a troop devoured by its own fear, incapable of loving a world that it could not understand. As they spied on their hearts, on the eyes of others, and they conspired and destroyed themselves, I tried to make myself invisible, I tried to see the jungle through Amini's eyes, I tried to feel his stories again. And the Brazilian Indians taught me to disappear from the eyes of the captains through the magical device of not contesting their power, of not coveting their wealth. I looked for consolation in the trees, in the song of the birds, in the certainty of the parasites on the trunks, and the jungle seemed to me untouched by that brutal nightmare. They always said that the jungle was more cruel than man, that it is a mortal hell, but the opposite truth is that everything is life in it, the jungle is rather life taken to its extreme and what intimidates in it is not death but rather that overwhelming profusion of births, that moisture that opens up into lichens, those pools that boil with creatures, those twined branches of worm colonies, those sloths that are exasperated by the torment of their parasites. Life is the overwhelming thing. And nowhere in the jungle can anyone claim to have seen hatred, because no creature feels hatred but us. I felt that I had lived my life as in a dream locked in the memory of a world. Far away, and caught in a gaze that distorted things, the river was nothing more than a drain, the trees were lurking beings, the animals poisons and irritating drool, stings and deadly pincers. Rather, I felt the loyalty of the trees, those creatures that do not ask for anything and instead give everything, and the waters advancing to their dissolution, and the eyes that look out from the foliage. There is no evil there. There is nothing diabolical, its swarm has no evil intentions, only necessity, elemental violence, insatiable and greedy life. I only saw evil in that prey that. He bloodied the ships day by day, writhing in madness. But I told myself that this hell was not mine, if I had to continue with the expedition, it would not be fighting for any power, but trying to learn, listening to the voice of that jungle to which I had inevitably returned. There must be a reason why I have repeated this trip, he thought, and that reason was not the eloquence of Urshua. This jungle has something to tell me. I promised myself that I would survive, even if I had to suffer the vileness of others. It was not worth even rebelling, I had to save my freedom in the heart of a hell without light. And the sky was no longer an immensely distant thing but a foliage that can be climbed and learned. I applied myself to question the reason for that. Trib. While the tyrant was seizing the wills and sowing death, I learned to reject that impulse that has dominated everything, has desecrated everything. And stripped of my hard skin as a conqueror, the love of that Indian woman who I left abandoned on the island suddenly reached me, my dark-skinned mother, who undoubtedly died thinking of me, I recognized the lament of a postponed world, of a life that has not been said. That was the other half of the story, the Spring of sleep, the reason why living in the world requires loving it, protecting it, and being cured, preventing greed from profaning and destroying it, because the only thing that allows us to understand the jungle is the language of respect and gratitude. Then Amini, my lost Indian mother. He began to speak to me as he had never done before, and I felt that his lonely grave, there in the hills of Hispaniola, was also beginning to converse with the clouds and with the gannets. What the water told him. That the dream is the heaven within, the door to the true world. That the trees are made of flesh and the rivers are made of blood, that the birds are thoughts and the rains are memories and the sky is full of awakened ancestors. That the most powerful sounds are those that are saved, the quiet sound that protects you, like flutes under water, and that the body has to fight all night with the river. That there is a being of music made of thousands of wings, and there are stars that burrow among the nests. That when the full moon of jungle spears passes, everyone knows that the arrow is a deadly word, sometimes painted with fever and sleep. That nobody really dies, that nobody knows. Move away, that in the jungle there are all the voices, of the one who is a fish again and the one that becomes a bird again, 
and of the one who becomes a jaguar again, who has in his body the tree and the water, the wind, and the things of the heaven. That the ants come out at sunset and they return the night. That all things are night, but that another sun comes under the earth, feeding on the roots, and comes to fill the world with hunger and fatigue, and that we can only look at it when old and sick, it leaves all its blood in the river. That nothing is as beautiful as the sunset. Because the tales of the night are already being prepared in the throat of the jungle. That while there are songs and stories the jungle does not move. That only with songs are things governed, that prayers make the jungle safe like a cave. That an order is never a shout, that every order is truly silent. That the bird never breaks the silence, but always knows how to glimpse the song in the fabric of the jungle. That a bed is dead and a hammock is. Live. That words have to weave the house of life every day, keep moisture away, make the beams firm, maintain the fabric of the trees so that the sky does not fall. That the only thing that cannot be said is how. How words act, how they hold the sky in place, how they keep the parents of long ago alive, and how they extract the secrets of the tree, the salts of the earth, the evil hosts of the bodies, the poison of the blood. That you don't have to walk with fire at night, that you have to let the light that is in things illuminate the path, that there is a clarity that comes from things, that the eyes drink darkness better than light. 33. Then the jungle told me. Otherwise history. Then the jungle told me in another way the. History of Urshua. A man daring with men but full of fear with the world, fragile like all those creatures that cannot walk on the ground without iron thorns, without armor, and without tongues of fire. He was the truly dangerous thing, not the scorpion or the stingray, not the sentient worm or the innocent jaguar like an orchid. Who are we but those beings? Unable to truly be in the world because in everything we find danger, because everything threatens, because in our suspicion the rivers drown and the snakes strangle, the wasp injects fire and the butterfly names death, the spider is its poison and the fish in the water a row of ravenous teeth? We go through the world desecrating everything hour after hour and always dreaming of a better world, more full of tributes and slaves. We do not understand the house they gave us, we believe that we came to command executors of a law as blind as ourselves. And what, then, was Urshua? Someone bent on. Feel more beautiful than the world, more valuable than the world, to whom the world should pay night and day. The one who always ate wheat but never sowed an ear, because he who sows has to befriend the earth and an accomplice of the rain, make alliances with fungi and ants. One to whom the rivers should give their fish without ever thanking for them to whom the tombs should deliver their treasures but threw the relics into the trash can. And that sun began to experience its eclipse when the moon stretched out over him, because only with it did he know a little peace, the unthinkable delight of living without anxiety, without suffering any other tyranny than naked flesh. Poor Urshua, how he was disconcerted when he learned in Trujillo to be the child he had never been, to suck the milk of a loving breast when he realized with horror that he did not want to talk about wars or expeditions because he had suddenly found his garden in the earth. He would have stayed there forever, at shore of that river of legends, in the shadow of that bare land that scented like grass and that tasted of cinnamon and fruits, that whispered secrets and laughed and gasped and moaned and laughed again, but forced by duty, he had to rise from the bed of love and once again take on the war on his shoulders, shoulder an increasingly hateful army, dragging through the jungles a heavy mantle of boats and navigations, mountains, and slaves. Of horses, and of betrayals. The only thing that had ever saved him was the. He was surrounded by his grateful friends, those who were capable of shedding their blood for him and for whom he had shed his blood, and that friendly fence was disappearing as Urshua was cloistered in his new madness because he no longer wanted to save anyone but himself and his insatiable mongrel, he no longer wanted to die for anyone else, and that uneasy happiness was doing it every more and more fragile. This was what the others felt, that he had brought them to the frontier of the greatest risks and suddenly abandoned them aimlessly, he no longer infected the enthusiasm with which he dragged them into the adventure, and he managed to promise them nothing, neither riches, nor feats. As he was becoming convinced that the country through which they were entering would not give them one or the other, 
neither the laurel of fierce battles nor the gold of high empires, so that his feet and his prize were only already in the embrace of Enes, and that stormy love on the edge of an infinite question manufactured the fence of hostile iron that would give them their only answer. If I get out of here, I said to myself, I'm going to tell the life of Urshua, how insistently I tried to dissuade him from the trip, how in the end I only travelled with him not to leave him alone with his destination. I am going to tell the death of Urshua, murdered ten times in the heart of the jungle, and the way in which something more savage than the jungle and the river was born in these confines. And I am going to talk about the secret treasure that is found at the bottom of the groves, in the studded skin of the river, in what the water constantly tells the trees, that ancient mystery that the serpent whispers in the silt. And it is that as he travelled down the river he went, talking to him in my mind, not measuring my strength with yours as in the first trip, but by learning my strength and my measure, seeing in a fierce mirror how the spider that tries to become more powerful than the world devours itself, and only what accepts to pass as they pass the wind and the river. I know that if the blind river has saved me, it will only be for a few years. Urshua could not save himself, because the destiny he invoked never took into account the will of the water, the beautiful Enes looked little at the world, did not understand what the night and things teach us. And the deranged Agir, the cold trainer, believed that he could ride the water serpent, subjected to his command, as if the serpent did not know his way better than any man. When I finally got out of that vortex of cruelty and madness, I swear I did not recognize myself in the mirror, as if I were someone else, as if the features of someone very old had taken over my face. Now the river spoke in my memories, and with my voice it wove its own story. Because there is no great difference between a man and a river, both are born in the hidden and die in the immense, they follow a course that the accidents hardly change, each one is alone with his gods, and full of unknown beings. And it does not stop fleeing for an instant, and it feeds on the lives of others, and it hardly ceases to be what runs away to be diluted in what remains. The river will not feel on its back the weight of tyrants, of the horsemen of war, it cannot wonder how long those who play to be masters of the world will navigate through it. Because only they can believe that they are masters of the world, the manatee yawns, the taper laughs, the boa shrinks indifferently. The day the river realizes that the matter has gone too far, it will stop showing its back of luminous scales, it will stop offering its whistle of water, it will stop attending to its palpitations and it will turn its enraged jaws towards the world. It will not be like the serpent of Pedro de Aranda, it will not die stung by arrows, nor fingered by the sword, nor macerated by sharp stone. Because this great serpent is the bed on which our lives depend, the life of warriors in their tents before the night fires, the life of cardinals in their solemn chambers, the poor life of kings on their blood thrones, and even the life of the scrawny pope burdened by his gold tiara with stars. And when the day of the tearing comes, we will all sink like the stain of ants collected by the current sinks. It is the river who breathes in us, who it beats in the blood, who slips in time, who resounds in the storm, and is prior to the sap of the trunks and the blood of the veins, before men and gods, brother of the stone and the star. It is the music that endlessly declines towards its white death, the serpent without eyes, the tree of fruits, the shape of destiny, the canoe that sows the shores of men, and in its slipping skin we will see again every night, until the end of life or the world, the unfolding map of the stars. And The Serpent Without Eyes William Ospina